Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs> I'm here on behalf of uh, our rector, Professor Cristina Messa, uh, to fetch her greetings and her thanks to Professor Enzo Mingione. However, this conference originates is the outcome of the publication of an important book <laughs> by Albert Andreotti and David Benass and Yuri Kazepov. <laughs> And the Western rates title is Western Capitalism in Transition. It, is, it has a contribution of any, many important uh, sociologists from the European landscape <coughs> of uh, social studies. <coughs> However, this conference uh, is also the occasion for us, <coughs> speaking for the University of Milan Bicocca, to celebrate and thanks Professor Enzo Mingione, in occasion of his retirement that occurred on the 1st of November 2017. Professor Enzo Mingione is an internationally renowned sociologist. Uh, he was the, among the main actors on the foundation of our university, so we count him as a co-founder of the University of Milan Bicocca 20 years ago. He, was, he had important roles in our universities. He, university. He was the head of the Faculty of Sociology for a lot of years, for six years. He contributed a lot to the PhD courses of the former faculty and now Department of Sociology, both for the Urbeu PhD course, for the Sociology PhD course, and now for the PhD course in uh, Human Sustainable Development. Professor Enzo Mingione <coughs> did a lot of important uh, uh, scientific work in the, into the labor market, unemployment, uh, the cities, urban and regional problems, welfare systems, and social policies and poverty. He had a lot of international collaboration with uh, being a visiting researcher and a visiting professor in important international universities, <clears throat> just to cite some of them, the University College of London, the University of California at Santa Cruz and Los Angeles, the National Australian University at Canberra, and the Science Pro University at Paris. So, <clears throat> to conclude, we thank Professor Enzo Mingione for the his help to the University of Milan Bicocca, both for contributing to its birth 20 years ago and to its development in these 20 years. Thank you, Professor Enzo Mingione, and enjoy your retirement. Good morning to everyone. My name is Gianpaolo Nuvolati, and I am the director of the Department of Sociology and Social Research of the University of Milano Bicocca, and I am very glad to host this conference titled Western Capitalism in Transition, Global Forces and Local Challenges. Despite the Department of Sociology and Social Research is only 20 years old, I can say that we have uh, a strong tradition in urban studies, as well as in studies concerning the processes of globalization all over the world. Many scholars of the department work on these topics. We also have an international PhD program named Urbeo, focusing on urban transformation, looking at different actors, individuals, associations, companies, and institutions, involved in the processes at different scale, local municipalities, regions, nations, city networks. Many research together with national and international partners has been carried on in these 20 years concerning urban morphological transformation, concerning urban poverty, urban regime, urban living style, and so on. Another important characteristic of our department is the multidisciplinarity. Even if, we, even if the sociological approach is, of course, the prevalent one, 
we always try to merge different disciplines and different points of view in the analysis of our societies. As a matter of fact, in our department, we have history, economy, geography, demography, and other uh, specific issues that we try to develop. In this conference, for example, we have urban and economic sociologists, as well as anthropologists, urban planners, discussing a set of relevant issues. Let me say that it's quite difficult to have together here such a list of very eminent and important colleagues working on these topics. But I know that this was possible because this is a special day for celebrating Enzo Mingione and his fundamental studies on the society fermentation, welfare and urban poverty. Of course, I will not read here the curriculum vitae of uh, Enzo Mingione. I just want to thank him for his impressive work and his generosity in sharing his research with other colleagues and scholars. I would also like to thank the presenters, all the presenters, the organizer, and in particular Albert Andreotti, David Benassi, Yuri Katsipu. I hope I do not forget anyone. And I will, and of course, I want to also thank you all for being here. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to open the works of this conference. Uh, it's also an honor, I think, uh, to open uh, this conference. Uh, to us, it's the accomplishment of two and a half years of work to, uh, and of many of the present who contributed to this book. And we are here to celebrate a friend and a mentor, as we wrote in our book, his work has been of, um, inspiring uh, for many of us, uh, both at national and international level. I think Enzo is one of the few academics uh, who can be defined as true intellectuals, meaning that he, was able to co he is able to combine social theory and empirical research, which, is not, which, which was not common in the previous generation, I think. And these scholars were able to grasp what was happening or what is still happening in our societies, informing their ideas with different readings, different disciplines, different approaches, different methodologies. But they were able to reorganize, reframe, and interpret what was going on and these different stimuli with the lens of sociology and the sociological imag imagination. And I think this is, uh, this is a bit less the case nowadays uh, for my generation, for the younger generations, who are maybe much more rigorous on the methodological point of view, but sometimes uh, are less able to use the sociological imagination. And I think this is a very big legacy that that generation and Enzo in particular leave us. Maybe this is also due to the fact that Enzo, from the very beginning of his career, and it again was not so common at that time, in the 70s, he was inserted in a transnational, really in a transnational network. He was really a transnational scholar, uh, meaning that he would traveled a lot, not only in the western part of the world, but also in the Far East and the Eastern part in China, in the 70s, not now, in China, in Latin America, in Cuba. And this is maybe also the reason why in his works uh, there's always a comparative dimension. And this is another legacy, I think, that he left us uh, and is leaving us, uh, being comparative, uh, uh, always trying to be comparative. But, um, well, I'm not going to do a biography or an essay on Enzo's career. It's too difficult, so we left uh, aside. But, well, I will introduce the, co the conference and the sessions we have today through Enzo's work. So th today we have three sessions and one lecture that will open uh, the, the, the work, the real works, uh, by Michael Harlow on urban, uh, on urban studies. And, and three sessions. I will start from the last one, uh, all the new challenges within city uh, in the afternoon, because the city and the conflict within cities uh, is probably the first interest uh, in chronological order of Enzo's work, because 
we go back to the 1972 with the first research published by Enzo and some colleagues who are here on the transformation of a neighborhood in Milan, the neighborhood Isola, the Quartiere Isola, which is also one of the most investigated today. And uh, um, the one with the, with, for the ones who are not Milan, the skyscraper, the new skyscrapers and the vertical wood. And, uh, and that book, that research was, I think, the first tone of a book, Social Conflict and the City, that was published in, in 1981 in, in English and then translated into Japanese. That book is a child of his time, as Michael Harlow will tell us, uh, because it's, uh, it's uh, the, the, the child of the political and social climate uh, of, of that time. But I think that in that book there are already many of the interests that Enzo developed later on. And I will mention just three of them. Uh, the book was published in 82, but it's uh, mainly thought during the 70s. Uh, the first one is the importance to look beyond the production sphere, to go beyond employment and the organization of unemployment, and to look at the reproduction sphere. Both production and reproduction uh, should be looked at to understand social classes, to understand the cleavages and what is going on. Uh, this means looking at the importance of family in the economic development, in the local social economic development, but also the family obligations, uh, so the relations within the family and the gender inequalities that Enzo was always very uh, careful in his, in his works. The second point is that, that was already in that book is there's no one best way or shortcut to understand social and economic arrangement in cities. But one has to go case by case. Uh, this means that no, no one model fits all. And that's a bit what is going on now with the neoliberal policies explaining everything. But we have to go case by case to see if this is, if this is true. And the third point that was read in that book, and this is more typical of uh, the Italian situation to understand the Italian situation, is, is the north-south divide. We do not understand the Italian case if we do not look at north and south. And in the background, there was already the comparison with, between the cities of Naples and Milan. And, and today, we will also have Naples uh, as a lesson uh, from um, uh, as a cities. And in that decade, he developed the book in. Um, he had some uh, intellectual, many intellectual exchanges. This was commuting between Milan. Messina, London, and different states in the United States, uh, where he met uh, many of the present Michael Harlow. Uh, I will forget someone, so I apologize. Michael Harlow, Edmond, Licia, uh, Ray Pal, Chris Pickens, and it is with many of these people that in, those peri in that period, he was very engaged in the International Sociological Association, and he founded the RC21, the Research Committee on Regional and Urban Research, and the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research, where we are still very much involved in. And um, during the 80s and early 90s, mainly through comparative national and international uh, projects, uh, Enzo deepens his interest for the informal economy, unemployment, urban poverty, and I think this is by this way that he arrives at his interest for um, social rights, citizenship, and welfare state, which is the second session we have today in, uh, in the afternoon, in the early afternoon. And here we can recall his work on fragmented citizenship, where David and Yuri were already involved in. I was not. I'm too young for being involved in that one. Uh, or his work with Alain Supio uh, for the European Commission, Au-delà de l'emploi, a claim for citizenship beyond employment again. And so insisted very much on the features of welfare state, or the Italian welfare state, and the familistic feature, but David will tell more about that. To me, what is more original of dealing with welfare state is the fact that Enzo frames his interest for the welfare state within a broader picture, 
which is the transformation of capitalism and the understanding of the very nature of capitalism and welfare capitalism. And this is his major work. This is a, a deepening his major work, Fragmented Societies, uh, which has been pub published in 1991, in which he draws a picture of the origin of welfare capitalism, relying very much on the historical accounts of Wallerstein and Rigi he met during his stays in the, in the United States and in New York in particular. And it is also in that book in Fragmented Societies that he developed his theoretical framework based on Karl Polanyi. And in particular, the idea that the market regulation is unable to guarantee to provide the reproduction of society, rather the opposite, and social institutions are needed to um, oppose the destructive effects of market, uh, uh, of market relation. And this is the contemporary movement of embeddedness and disembeddedness, the tensions between the two, uh, these two movements. And this is what he wrote and uh, he developed in the last chapter of the book he wrote for us uh, without knowing that he was writing uh, for the book in his honor uh, and probably will tell us uh, more in, uh, in the first session this morning. So I stop here and uh, thank you and enjoy the conference. Thank you, Alberta. Uh, it's very complicated now for me. It's a very stressful situation. Anyway, I will try to say something uh, more on a personal uh, side of my relationship with Enzo. First of all, I was too young as well for contributing to uh, fragmented societies. Maybe Yuri, which is much older than me, was involved, but I was too young anyway. It was 91, Enzo? Yes. I, was, I graduated in 92, so it, it was impossible as a student to help such an important uh, scholar <laughs> to write uh, an important book. So just a few words on my personal uh, experience with Enzo. Um, of course, thank you all for coming. Thank you to the contributors to the book uh, for their enthusiastic uh, acceptance to contribute to the book. Thank you to the discussant of this conference. Uh, so my, my experience, I met Enzo in uh, 1989 at the University of Milano, of Milan, as professor of uh, sociology of organization, um, a course that actually he developed as uh, economic sociology. So uh, this is interesting because he, he always crossed the borders uh, and create contaminations between different, uh, um, different uh, discourses so, uh, about society. Uh, so the, the, the debate uh, in those years was focused on the Reagan and Thatcher administrations, the, the strong changes in, in the political uh, spectrum, um, and the increasing uh, inequality and poverty and the retrenchment of welfare state that this change in, in, uh, in politics was uh, bringing, but uh, I remember that uh, our uh, training uh, in, in sociology uh, in those years was focused on classical theories, very long courses, many, many hours in classes, uh, studying Marx, Weber, and so on, and very few about the real changes, the real uh, phenomena that were occurring around the world. So what shocked me, let me use this, this term, when I started to follow the, the lessons of Enzo, was that he was so international. He was bringing us all this debate in, uh, uh, in our uh, lessons, and, and this opened our mind to a different uh, uh, way to look at was, uh, what was uh, going on. Uh, in, those, um, in those years. I was in particular uh, you know, impressed by the discourse about poverty and the welfare state, which were very, very not, not at the core of the debate in Italy in, uh, in those years. Um, so um, I remember, for instance, that uh, in, 1990, in 1990 was published the famous book by Esping Andersen, The Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism, which is now a classic uh, of, uh, and uh, uh, I remember that we had a long discussions with Enzo in that same year 
about the, the, the impact and the, you know, the, the, possibility, the possibility to uh, make uh, um, studies starting from the contribute of uh, Esping Andersen. Um, so um, this, this experience was very, you know, had a strong influence on my decisions about the future. So I graduated with ENSO with a thesis about the welfare state. I'm still working on the welfare state and on poverty and inequality. And so let me say that this really means to have an influence on people. So ENSO uh, was very influent in my, in my life after all. Um, for, uh, for what concerns my personal experience uh, and my formation as you know, a scholar, as an intellectual, I, I want to um, underline um, or, or to mention um, three, um, three aspects mainly. Um, first of all, a, a bias for empirical research, as already Alberta said. Second, a constant uh, reference to the historical roots of social phenomena, which is very important. And third, comparison. So, um, even if uh, Enzo is not an expert in, in, uh, of methodology or statistical methods, he always insisted with his uh, students um, about the importance of grounding uh, theoretical uh, discourse or, um, you know, um, theoretical interpretation on empirical evidence and on the necessity to test theories with evidence. So this is the first lesson we received. He did an incredible amount of research on several topics um, at the national and international level, for instance, uh, uh, the informal economy, welfare regimes, poverty and social exclusion, social innovation, employment regimes, and so on, breeding an, in, a, a, an entire generation of scholars that now are employed in many universities, both in Italy and uh, abroad. Um, second, the, import, the importance of history. It's quite evident, we all know that it is important to have a good knowledge of how social phenomena develop uh, in historical terms, but not always uh, we, we, we give the, the real importance to these aspects. Um, and uh, I think that here from me, so there is a, an influence of being Italian where everything is, has a so long history uh, behind, uh, but also the, the, the importance, the, pre, the theoretical preference of Enzo for Polani and the concept of embeddedness, which means to uh, eradicate discourse on the historical evidence. Um, so, for instance, the, the work of Enzo on the north-south divide in Italy is clearly an application of these aspects but also the book, uh, uh, the, the, his seminal book, uh, Fragmented Societies, go, uh, goes in this uh, direction. Finally, comparison. Uh, we know that comparison is very important. It's very complicated. You need a lot of uh, uh, commitment to do, to do comparison. I, I remember that I, I, I was involved in several research projects uh, led by Enzo, so both at national and international level. I, I just want to say that this is this experience had probably the strongest influence of my formation. So to open your mind and look in, you know, uh, yes, you look at your case in a comparative term. Uh, so uh, I, I finished my very, very short uh, speech. Thank you, Enzo, really. We are very grateful for, uh, to you for everything. And of course, we will try to go on on the same way that you uh, show us. Thank you. So good morning everybody. Uh, being third, a lot of things have been already said and uh, it's becoming always more personal. So I won't go too much into the, the science and the intellectual aspects which I shared with them already. Um, but I will go uh, personal. And actually, yesterday evening, I had dinner with uh, Luis Moreno, who is a research director at the National Research Council in Spain. 
And uh, I told him tomorrow I was going to Milan, and he said, ah, yes, uh, Enzo, of course, I know him since a very long time. Uh, he was very young, and he was already an executive of the ISA, the International Sociological Association, and we met there, I don't know, 30 years ago, which is more or less the time I also met Enzo. And, um, and what he said, yes, Enzo struck me because he was a cosmopolitan intellectual, and actually this is what, what he is. And, uh, and he impressed me from the first time I met him, precisely of that. Uh, I was still struggling 30 years ago, should I go to the academic career, what should I do in the future? And uh, I bought a word processing program, which was called Nota Bene. I don't know if word was still a word for DOS. I don't know if the younger here in this room know DOS, the DOS system, but most of you know, probably not. But the average age, I think you probably know. And um, the manual, the instruction manual of this thing, had also a section on bibliography, how to deal with bibliographic entries. And uh, they provided also examples of these bibliographic entries. And within these bibliographic entries, there was an entry on Enzo. So I was extremely surprised because it was an American manual of a very nerd software used by very few people around the world. And actually, it was precisely on what Alberta said before. It was on the territorial social problems in socialist China. And this was considered to be a path-breaking article showing a new development in analytical and theoretical terms. So this impressed me really very much because, um, so, okay. <laughs> Next uh, personal step, um, so the intellectual cosmopolitanism. Uh, I have to thank, actually, Francesca Zajic because it's thanks to her that I met Enzo. She introduced me to Enzo. She said, uh, uh, you have elective affinities with Enzo. He's comparatively working internationally, and you might fit very well in a comparative project you're he's carrying out now for the commission, precisely on Milan and Naples with Jean Allegre, I don't know if you remember, quite a long time ago. And this was a path-breaking experience for me because it opened, like for, for everybody, for, for us, our mind and a new world of opportunities. And it forged actually the way in which I started looking at social change, at social phenomena, contrasting contexts, identifying differences, and being inspired by the Polanyan interpretative framework he was developing in fragmented societies. So this helped me not only becoming aware of differences, which is banal when you compare stuff, but also on how to understand them, both in their constitutive analytical elements and in their consequences in real life, so both at macro and micro level. And this was what I thought was particularly interesting, to combining these dimensions, not being only at the structural level, not only at the micro, but combining them and try to understand the interplay between the two. And this was, was fantastic. So I decided to stay in academia. All that ties very much with what uh, we are presenting here with the book, etc. And um, as you know, the sessions are quite informal, are more a round table like arrangement. So you will have debates, not really paper presentation. For, for the papers, you have to buy the book if you don't have a PDF. And, um, and okay, I stop here giving the floor actually to Michael Harlow, which I will ask to, to join us here. Um, Michael Harlow is the founding editor of the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research. He's an emeritus of the University of Salford, uh, where he was served for vice, as a vice chancellor. He's now visiting at the LSE. And he will frame uh, the importance of these themes, uh, which are addressed in the book, um, within urban studies. He will briefly reconstruct the debate about capitalism and its transformations within the urban tradition, making reference also to Enzo's contribution in this debate. So thank you very much also to Enzo and to everybody for being here, and enjoy. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a tremendous pleasure to be here with so many old friends and colleagues to celebrate 
uh, not so much to celebrate the retirement, that doesn't sound right, does it? But to celebrate the life's work and achievement of our colleague and dear friend, Enzo Mingione. Now, most of today's meeting and the forthcoming book on which it's based focuses on the current transitions in capitalism, transitions in the economy, in citizenship, and in welfare, and in the urban sphere. Uh, these, of course, have been, as we've already heard, abiding themes in Enzo's work since the 1970s. But um, in inviting me to contribute to the book, its editors asked me to say something about how this journey began, and specifically about how what was once called the new urban sociology, and more broadly, critical urban and regional studies emerged from the late 1960s onwards. The title of my paper in the book refers to new urban sociology as a child of its times, and some understanding of the times in which it grew up also helps to explain its childlike limitations. So I want to briefly summarize the context to its emergence and some of the limitations, but also say something about the quite distinctive and enduringly relevant, in my view, contribution that Enzo and others in Italy made to these early years of critical urban and regional research. I also touch on a key part of the story, which has already been mentioned, the emergence of the two institutions, RC21 and IJURR, uh, which have sustained a dynamic research network over these decades. But I just want to add one caveat, and I particularly put this in because I was hoping that David Harvey would be here today, and he's not, but what I describe is only part of a wider transformation in the field at least as important as the new urban sociology was the concurrent rise of the new urban geography. So first then, let me just summarize why the times we lived in then led to a revolution in the previously rather moribund field of urban and regional research. Because time's short today, all I want to do is list what seemed to me to have been some fundamental changes in cities, in social science and in politics, which act, acting together laid the foundations for this evolution, what used to be called in the jargon of the times a particular conjuncture. So the first factor was of course the rapid and unprecedented state-initiated growth of Western European and United States economies after 1945. And there were parallel processes in the state socialist countries Two. This was a so-called period of modernization, which entailed a period of intense urban growth, the mass migration to cities of a new urban workforce, and new patterns of urban and regional inequality under the hegemony of what has been called by one uh, analyst, coordinated capitalism. Second factor, by the 1960s, the pressure on governments to respond to the consequences of urbanization, low wages, poor housing, inadequate education and urban services, and so on, this pressure had become intense, and programs of subsidized housing, investment in transport, education, in closer, right, education, including higher education, uh, and so on, were initiated by governments of the center left, and more commonly of the center right. Rising conflict in and about the city demanded some political response. Third fact, in consequence, many governments began to look to the social sciences to understand urban conditions and to evaluate urban policies. There was a growth of funding for such research, much of it carried out by young social science graduates, such as myself and many here, who were working outside the universities. Concurrently with the rise of demands and funding for urban research, this is the fourth factor, there were some major changes in the social sciences too. First, there was the enormous expansion of higher education from the 1950s onwards, seen as essential to the development of skills in innovation-based economies. And this entailed inter alia a very rapid expansion 
of the social sciences. A fifth factor, the new social science graduates were also a politically active generation, shaped by an international wave of student activism. We were looking for ways to understand repression and inequality, and none of the conventional social science of the times could explain this or wanted to explain it. And the point was not just to understand the world, but to use theory to illuminate and underpin practice too. In the search for all this, it was, of course, a renewed and revitalized Marxism that appeared to have the most to offer. So those are the factors that came together out of which new urban sociology arose. As far as urban research was concerned, conventional work didn't even penetrate the surface of capitalist urbanization. Indeed, as Castells and others argued, and in geography, David Harvey too, much of this work was more ideological than scientific. But the new critical research can be seen in retrospect at least to have had its own sciences and limitations too. And I'll just mention one or two of these. Under the influence most notably of Castell's early work, and more widely of the new urban research arising first in France and then in the UK and elsewhere, there was a paradigm which linked the supposed domination of large-scale monopoly capitalism, state investment in the reproduction of the labor force through collective consumption, and the growth of oppositional urban movements. But to a considerable extent, all this ignored the real and varied evolution of the organization of capitalist production, its differential impact on cities and regions, and the decline and fragmentation of the relatively solidaristic organized working class, which was then occurring. It saw the state as a handmaiden of advanced capital and invested too much faith in the radical possibilities of urban social movements. While it achieved a great deal to overturn old paradigms, many of its own propositions were both narrow and ahistorical. But here in Italy, things were rather different in my view. In my paper, I describe some of the reasons why this is so. But starting perhaps with Franco Ferrarotti's classic study of the Roman shanty towns, published in 1970, and subsequent work of Enzo, Enrico Pugliese, Arnaldo Bagnasco, and other Italian colleagues, a radically different and I think more enduringly useful body of work emerged, laying the foundations, indeed, for a research agenda that includes the three main areas of capitalist transition which today's meeting will discuss. This work analyzed the historical evolution of Italian urbanization, hyper-urbanization in the industrial cities of the north, a form of non-industrial urbanization in the south based on building speculation and state employment with poverty, marginality, and underemployment, and the distinctive forms of production, patterns of familiar and precarious work, and so on, in the third Italy as well. In my paper, I conclude that this distinctively Italian version of new urban sociology, with its emphasis on understanding the range and variety of capitalist development and its impact on cities and regions and its emphasis on class fragmentation, poverty, marginality, and other forms of work on the fringes of the organized economy or outside it altogether, prefigured themes that were taken up more widely in, by critical urban and regional studies in the subsequent decades and set a more useful basis for understanding the changes brought about by globalization and neoliberalism, changes that were unimaginable in the early 70s. Ironically, though, it was just when the new urban sociology emerged that the conditions, which I summarized earlier, under which it was born began to disintegrate. As coordinated capitalism and state engagement became seen as a fetter rather than an aid to economic growth and profitability. That critical urban studies continue to develop nonetheless owes a good deal to its success, not just as an intellectual project, 
if not sadly as a political project, but also as a project to create an international network to support and sustain continued research and debate. In the past 30 years, there's been a more rapid and radical change in some basic aspects of academic work and exchange than at any time in the past. Some of these changes have been for the worse, but innovations such as the web, email, social networking, and online access to libraries have been transformative, enormously facilitating research, its dissemination, and its critical discussion on a global basis. But none of this existed when a small group came together in the late 1960s to argue for a new approach to urban sociology and established RC21 as the heart of an attempt to build a new urban research network. When we started, there were basically only two ways of doing this, by publications and conferences. And these are what the RC and later IJURR were founded to promote. As I show in the paper, there were many limitations to this effort. The Research Council membership stayed at under 100 for many years. And IJURR circulation was also pretty modest. And there were many cultural, linguistic, and other barriers as too. Knowledge of and communication with work in Latin America and in the USA at the start was relatively limited in Europe and vice versa. And that makes Enzo's cosmopolitan contribution, which has been outlined earlier, it was particularly crucial. But even less was known about other parts of the world. And while there was some contact with a few who were studying the inequalities of state socialism, their freedom to work and travel was, of course, very restricted. In my paper, I analyzed the first decade of IJURR's output, which illustrates some of these limitations, geographically and thematically. However, the International Journal and the Research Committee did provide a forum for the gradual transcendence of some early limitations and a growing focus on emergent features of the urban question in an era of neoliberal and globalizing capitalism. So in its first decade, the International Journal published seminal papers on some of the emergent features of the urban question, for example, on deindustrialization, regional underdevelopment, and restructuring on world cities, on urbanization in Eastern Europe and Latin America, on the informal economy and survival strategies, on employment work and the domestic division of labor, and on early aspects of global, the globalization of production and the neoliberal project. <clears throat> Today, the network which began in the 1960s and 1970s now goes far beyond its limited thematic, geographical, and disciplinary origins. As I illustrate in my paper, this has been aided immeasurably by the changes in the means of academic production, which I've just mentioned. Just to give some illustration of this, <clears throat> when the International Journal started, its readership was largely confined to the few universities that subscribed to the journal and those who had access to their libraries. But in the decade from 2002, in a 10-year period, full-text downloads of articles grew from a handful to a quarter of a million a year and it's running far above that by now. And in the 2016 conference of RC21 in Mexico City, there were 21 thematic streams with over 200 papers delivered. So in many ways, the child <coughs> has grown up and transcended <coughs> its early limitations, or at least some of them. Having got to that point in my remarks for this morning, I thought this was perhaps a somewhat optimistic or even complacent conclusion. So I just want to pose um, a few questions which may provoke some discussion. First, it seems clear that critical urban and regional research has become part of mainstream social sciences and to a considerable extent has been institutionalized within higher education. Question, has it lost anything in the process? Second, is it worth paying some attention to the context of how these times we live in 
are now shaping and determining what research gets done and how it's conceived. Is there still, for example, any attempted link between research and praxis? Thirdly, and this is perhaps a question for our Italian colleagues, how do the still distinctive histories of Italian cities and regions shape their research? Does it have a special contribution to make to critical urban and regional research as it did, in my view, a generation ago? Finally, and this is probably a more general question for the social sciences, as well as one specific to our field in its context, how do we see the current balance between the forces which facilitate the spaces for academic work in its networks and those which seek to control and reduce the scope for innovative work? Could another equally lively child emerge in these times too? Thank you very much. I'm here. I, uh, the, uh, the speaker, this is the, the, the beginning of the first session, Capitalism in Transition. So the speakers are uh, invited to, to right here. We are a bit late, and uh, I don't know whether it is so important to keep this uh, Davide. Because we are. No, 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 not so much. It's only for uh, 15 minutes later. That's not so much. Okay. So, here, Professor And Simone gets his turn. Yes. Yes. Here. All of us are here. No, no, so, and also, so Professor, I'm very, it's a very great, uh, great honor for me to chair this first session on the conference uh, on capitalism. This, the first session is on capitalism transition, which means uh, uh, how capitalism change is changing with globalization. And here we have very distinguished speakers. A great uh, uh, and also friend, some a great friend of mine, which is uh, Enzo Mingione. The, the speakers are Professor Saskia Sassen, Robert Lind, Professor of Sociology, and uh, co chairs in the Committee of Global Thought at Columbia University. Then we have Simone Gezzi, Assistant Professor in Economic Anthropology in the University of Milan Bicocca, Enzo Mingione. He is not necessary to introduce him any longer. And so, um, as it has been asked me by the organizers, I just introduce it very briefly the session. Then the speakers will have about five, ten minutes to illustrate their the, uh, contribution. And then there will be two discussions, uh, Professor Francesco Ramella from the University of Turin and uh, Professor Serafino Negrelli from University of Bicocca. They'll have about 10, 15 minutes to uh, comment, to make their comments. And there will be a second round where you can uh, um, uh, answer and uh, illustrate better your argument if it is necessary. Um, now, I think that the, the interpretative key, which more or less openly lies behind the different contribution that uh, will be presented now is a Polanyan perspective, especially the theory of the double movement and the shift in dynamics through which social and economic relations are embedded, disembedded, re-embedded. Uh, all, all, all the three movements are, well, at least, uh, the first, how they were embedded, how now are they uh, disembedded and how they can be re-embedded will be discussed here for you. 
uh, Sakya Sassen focuses on the growth of employment based insecurity and poverty that has been dramatically qualifying the organization of economic activity in the vast uh, service economies over the last 20 years. Um, her starting point is very is a question, very clear question. We see, of course, she will explain this. But to what extent are employment-based economic insecurity and poverty intrinsic to advanced economies, rather than devi deviation, as so much policy discussion seems to suggest? This is a very, 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 very important point, starting point. And uh, so, rather than on narratives of individuals' feelings. Um, she focuses on the outcomes, she, she um, 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 uh, discusses the, uh, this, this insecurity and poverty as outcomes of the growth of new sectors, specialized services and finance, allowing on the one side super profits and, and fostering on the other side the development uh, of labor intensive low wage sector, which means uh, Sharp, sharp increase in socioeconomics and spatial inequalities. And uh, uh, these tendencies are related to the mutual reinforcing dynamic emerging from the decline of citizenship systems that had developed in, in the so-called 30 glorious or in the 40 stage. In other terms, in Polanyan terms, is a clear dynamic of disembeddedness. While uh, Simone Getzi which is, who is an economic anthropologist, openly focuses on the reconceptualization of the term embeddedness as a social uh, um, disembedding of the economy. But he draws, and he will explain to us, uh, during his fieldwork on micro-entrepreneurial settings and informal work in a local context, he shows how the market, because of its own logical competitiveness, uh, is a dis disorganizer of social life. So the current disembedding processes produce chronically unstable arrangements. And while, while in the past there was, we can say, a, a situation of embeddedness, which means the informal social protection beneficially matches the paternalistic exploitation, now weakening reciprocity plus the lack of institutional safety, safety nets results in a new form of precariousness. While finally, uh, Enzo Mingione, uh, in his contribution, uh, whose title is clearly The Double Movement and the Perspective of Contemporary Capitalism, uh, uses Polanyi's framework to interpret contemporary social change. His focus is on the double movement and the dialectic between the destruction of social relations by the disembedding forces of the market and the creation of new social relations and institutions through re embedding processes. He also complements uh, in an original way Polanyi with Marshall. And uh, from what is very important from my point of view personally, I must say, is that he identifies emancipatory tendencies to construct new forms of solidarity and protection in an increasingly heterogeneous and destandardized, fragmented and unstable society, which means a process of uh, re-embeddedness. Of course, he's, I'm, he will explain better, but uh, his uh, analysis at the end is a bit pessimistic. But uh, from my point of view, the, 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 it is very important that he focuses also on these attempts to, uh, for the, from the new uh, actors, new agencies, uh, new institutions to become to uh, counter the, 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 the evident, the patent uh, tendencies toward disembeddedness in, 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 in an attempt which is not very, is not very perhaps you know, they're successful, but anyway, in an attempt to uh, open new perspectives. Anyway, now, I, have, I, I spoke too much. I better I give the floor now to Professor Saskia Sassen, and uh, she will say much better than what I Well, uh, è un grande piacere per me essere qui, parlerò in inglese, no? devo parlare in inglese, ma non resisto, diciamo, con questo accento argentino che ho in italiano, allora come non si fa? Ma è veramente bellissimo essere qui tutti per celebrare a Mingione. I think that in my, in my career, if we use that term, I don't know what other term to use, um, I can't quite say in my life. 
So in my career, Enzo Mignoni, also in my life eventually, you know, the good food and all of that. But Enzo Mignoni was actually one of the first uh, sort of professors who sort of recognized my, Ian and, and Martinotti, of course. Eh? So Italy was actually very important to me. Now, I have very little time, and so I want to talk about what I see as an emergent trend, and I really appreciate your introduction, a trend that is sort of embedded. It doesn't stand out there saying, I'm new. No, it is actually embedded in the system. It's quite invisible. And one way of formulating it is to say that we are really dealing with an epoch when extractive logics are becoming very influential. They have major impacts, no matter their invisibility. So for instance, and just to give an, a, a simple example, uh, the traditional bank sell, is commerce. It sells something it has, money. It's commerce. It's okay. Finance, high finance, sells something it does not have. And in selling what it does not have, it has to actually extract values that it then packages in its own mode, scales up the values, and sells. So when you begin to look at our current period, and you try to, it's, it's like a process of discovering. It's like being a detective. Where do I actually see extractive logics? Think Google, or even better example, Facebook. They never lose. They are never fined. They may publish data that is not prop, that is that is false. Doesn't matter. They make the money. Once they have the platform, the platforms are brilliant, brilliant forms of knowledge. Once they have the platform, they just sit and receive. You know, when you compare that to what it takes to set up a little small business, you know, like a family business. You know, I'm just putting those, those two contrasts. Now, I must say that I also have found myself, this now is a, you know, I've been at it for, I feel like a century, not quite, but anyhow, close. Uh, and um, I now, I see that in retrospective, you know, the last 30 years, I've been a bit of a rebel. I just like to mention the fact that my first book got rejected by 12 publishers, and I kept sending it out, kept sending it out. I said, finally, somebody will publish it. Well, they did. But that just gives you a sense of how I was off the mode. I really am in the zone of before method. And before method is the space where you can discover. And part of the discovering, of course, means that you're free to read an extraordinary breadth of materials, some of which might not be pertinent. But in that process, also, I got to read a lot of, uh, my family was living in Italy at the time, a lot of sort of the Italian scholarship. So I think in many ways I was shaped uh, by Italy. I also tried university in Italy. That didn't work out very well, uh, you know, for various reasons. And so some of these analytic tactics, I find myself thinking the need to actively destabilize stabilized meanings. What is the economy today? What is the middle classes today? What is the national government today? It is something that doesn't quite fit in what it was, you know, 30 years ago. Really, before the 1980s is one clear way of putting The 1980s, a time when we globalized in a certain way. We have had globalization for a very long time. When we, um, when we privatize, when we give firms a lot of power. The United States is a very extreme case. It's not the only extreme case, though. And so, uh, and, and part of that, then, is powerful explanation, very important. I want to see what the stronger that powerful explanation is, what don't I see? It's like circle of light in a dark night. The stronger that light, the more you see everything inside the zone, in this case, standard issue, whatever, and the less you can see what is in the penumbra around it. Uh, territory, as some of you might know, to me is an extraordinarily significant category because, you know, when you look at the territorial, uh, which to me is not just simply land, terrain, ground, the territorial has embedded logics of, of, uh, of power, of of enablement, et cetera, et cetera. And when you look at how the territorial has shifted, you actually, it's like one way of understanding a lot of histories, huh? histories across centuries. Expulsions is something that I want to briefly touch on. I think that is one of the markers uh, of this very current period. And what I mean by expulsions is the fact of a sort of 
set of systemic edges inside national territories. When those edges are crossed, our conceptual categories do not allow us to capture what is happening. Very simple examples, long-term unemployment. Uh, after a bit, certainly in a country like the United States, maybe Italy is much better than, than, than the US is. <laughs> not too much. After a certain point, you become invisible, not to the eyes, your body is still there, but you become invisible to the categories through which we measure and establish, you know, us. Hello. <laughs> um, and, and the other one for me is dead land. In its full physicality, like the body of the unemployed, in its full physicality, it becomes invisible to our conceptual categories. Same thing with dead land. Now, Europe is much better about land than Russia or the United States and such countries are. But once land is dead, it is as if it didn't exist. And the question then also becomes, what do governments like the US government, like the Russia government, actually govern in terms of their actual territorial condition in the simplest term of that sense territory? So, and then finally, just very, very briefly, I want to emphasize in, in what I say next, the making of something. The making of something is very partial because clearly there are many other factors that are involved in an outcome, not just the making of it, right? But this is just, and so I like this, we make, I'm not talking about the makers movement, huh? but we make, so I'm very impressed. We managed to destroy in 20 years one of the biggest internal seas, you know, the Aral Sea. That's an accomplishment. We tend to think of capabilities, you know, as 100% positive. I really think we need to expand that variable and say, you know, it goes from bad to good. And this is even more impressive. It also took us very little time to destroy a billion years. When you begin to look at us this way, then you begin to say, wow, we have power. We misused it. And so it's like a way of, you know, of, of expanding the notion of we make. Huh? It's not just whatever some abstract powers that make. It's also we. And I mean it, actually, I want to get at some positive here in that sense. Now, here is something I'm not going to dwell on. But um, so, so just a, a third little element here, the first being the question of method, the second one being this capacity of making disastrous outcomes, uh, is where are we at right now? And so I want to get at this notion of an extractive logic. Um, and, and one framing that we can use, I love this framing, is what is the steam engine of our epoch? The steam engine didn't change everything, but it changed enough to make a difference. And frankly, I think that is how we need to think about change in the significant and consequential way in which change can happen. It's not that it changes everything. Once I've said, it's not about what changes everything. You know, you can really move into these deeper logics that might be quite invisible and that might be very partial in their effects, but by God, they can make a difference because change, foundational change, does not require that everything changes. And one very simple way of putting it is what is in and what is out. Now, in, in a way, um, I like to mention an example that, that sort of comes from our old England, you know, in England. So if you had a little plane at the time when the factories were already in the big cities in Manchester, if you could have gone with a little plane over that part of England, there was no plane at that point, eh? uh, you would have said, what a nice rural economy. And on top of the hill, there were the sheep. Well, those sheep were no longer in that circuit they were already in a completely different circle that didn't have anything to do with the rural if we separate the rural as a specific condition. So again, profound change may be happening. Do we see it? You know, What is it that we can actually see? Um, I think I'm going to skip this, but just one very quick example. So one of the things that I'm looking at under extractive logics is high finance, which I... I describe, and I, I hope I don't offend any of the high-level financiers in the audience. Hi, where are you, actually? Can I? Yeah. I assume there is nobody like that here. But uh, 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 
So finance to me, as I said, is an extractive sector. And this is just one little bit of finance, and I just want to point out a curve of growth. So that was less than a trillion in 2001, and five years later, 62 trillion. Think of anything that can have that rate of growth. I checked it out, nothing. Now those 62 trillion at that point uh, was quite a bit actually. Huh? Uh, global GDP was much lower than that. Uh, it, it's, it's quite interesting to see that value of finance, which tells you also immediately it's not about money. Finance is not about money. The total value of finance in that same year, 2007, that's the, the, when the crash happens, huh? was something like 600 trillion. That was much more than global GDP. And when you look at the value today of finance, it's over a quadrillion. That's more zeros. You know, we're talking lots of zeros. They're all working, zeros, huh? they are. <laughs> but it's a lot of zeros. So over a quadrillion, global GDP in the world, as you all know, is well under 100 trillion. Now, global GDP is a specific kind of measure, but it tells you that finance is something that we cannot think of in terms of money. If you look at the currencies issued by all the central banks in the world, it's about 400 trillion. It's a very wobbly measure, huh? because currencies go up and down, certainly in most countries in the world, wildly up and down. But so, so it just gives you a sense, and so I argue finance has to be thought as a capability. And again, capability, you know, as a spectrum. In this case, a very negative one, a very dangerous one. Now, I want you to get very quickly, this is all kinds of incredibly interesting stuff, but um, I'm going to skip. Now, I want to mention the case. Some of you are familiar, so I can speak in shorthand. I'm looking at my clock. Yes. When I look like that, it's because I have the clock. I'm terrorized by clocks. I don't function well with clocks. But um, so, so, um, so we had a case where in a period of seven years, uh, over uh, 16 million contracts to buy houses, basically, I exaggerate a bit, it was also some other kinds of buildings, were, were executed, mostly with people who were fairly low income. 14.5 uh, million of those households, which could be up to 30 million people, uh, lost their homes in a very short period of time. When you look at it that way, finance is brilliant, brilliant people. They are not about to develop an instrument that is going to mean that most of the buyers of the instrument go broke. That doesn't work, right? This was not about housing. This was about getting materialities. Like a va one should really think about it, a vast field where you throw in those 16 million houses in order to generate asset, asset, materiality, it could be a toilet, it could be a wall, it could be, no, no, it wasn't about the house. Generate an instrument, asset-backed security for the high-level financial circuit. Because the high-level financial circuit had had it with derivatives. A derivative is a value derived from another value, for another value, that's good for us. But that's not good for the high level. They wanted asset-backed securities. So suddenly, in a few years, 14.5 million households lost their homes. That's right. That could be, I repeat, 30 million people, 40 million people. This story was invisible. It was invisible. Can you imagine? My country, I'm Dutch, 16 million people is a total population of that country. If we add the tourists, maybe we have twice as much, but still, you know. So what is it? What is it that we see and what is it that we do not see? And the way in which the material actually is not always speech. You know, speech in the sense that here I am, this is what it is, because it so often is invisible. Um, this instrument has entered Europe, and the biggest numbers are in Germany, a, a country where over half the population actually rents. And this is something else I'm going to skip. I just want to, uh, this and then one more, do I have two more minutes? So extractive, sectors such as high finance can extract even from modest households. That is different from what it used to be. It used to be that you only dealt with today when you stop thinking about it like individual little houses. 
and the deceit, huh? the misrepresentation, this is a mortgage. It was not a mortgage. It was a way of putting it all in together. Now, here is yet another extracted mode, and this is something that I have written about under the title, Who Owns the City? And I'm just looking at the top 100 cities in the world as measured, top as measured by the amount of buying of property. We're talking big buy, minimum $5 million, something like that, uh, uh, both national and foreign. So this is yearly. This is just one little slice, one little case, this particular set of issues that I'm going to talk about now, of a much broader spectrum of buying, acquisitions, investments. So it's just one thing, but it's one thing that has popped up very strongly and is a bit disastrous for notions of the city as urbanity rather than the city simply as a collection of buildings. So, so again, this is one year just buying existing property, 55 billion for New York, London, you can see, et cetera, right? And if you look at foreign, uh, foreign investment, London is definitely number one. Uh, I love Amsterdam there. And, and the, the, the figures, the growth rates, they are, they are basically all positive even when they show negative. Th that number is what it is compared to the year before. So London and New York already so much had been bought that compared to the prior year, it was not that much of a difference. Look at Amsterdam, 248%. I don't know what they're buying. I mean, Amsterdam is not very big, but anyhow, there it is. So that had one of the biggest. If you look at the top 100, you know, you have cities like some cities in China, like Shenzhen, there is Shenzhen, 426. Why? Because Beijing and Shanghai and Nanjing already are very highly bought, and so uh, uh, Shenzhen appears as a big deal. Oh, this is in Spanish, not in Italian. I'm sorry. So, so here, the total value of these acquisitions from 2014 to 2015 was 600 billions. From 2015 to 2016, that's the latest figures we have, more than a trillion. It's going up. <laughs> um, I have to conclude. So the top 100 cities in the world by property investment and notice investment account for 10% of the world's population, 30% of the world GDP, and 76% of property investment. Investment here means it's been financialized. I finish with a last figure and a last comment. According to Seville, who takes all the, the buildings that have been sort of financialized, that is 217 uh, uh, trillion. That is more than global GDP, I repeat. That's just buildings. Now here, one image that I want to leave you with. When you see, uh, in lower Manhattan especially, that's the most extreme case, big towers, newly built or old towers, but high level, high price, uh, half completely empty or half empty. This is very common now in Manhattan. People think, oh my God, poor investors. They, uh, they lost all that value. Nobody's renting, nobody's buying. No. And this is very significant for the future of urbanity, I would say. They're making more money by using those towers to construct an asset-backed security. It started with the little homes, they've done that, and now they're into the towers. So, because when that's a financialized building, they can buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell in the high-level financial circuit. You know, every day they can do it 15 times. That is what explains 217 trillion. That has nothing to do with the value of the property, that has to do with the financializing of the property, that then moves, 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 moves. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much for your um, exercise in trying to destabilize this received wisdom <laughs> and the stable. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I give uh, the floor to uh, Simone Ghezzi, who, uh, well, he will say what he will speak about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, and thanks for the organizers for having invited me and 
having asked me to contribute to this very interesting um, publication. Uh, it was a very honor for me to, to do this. Um, well, I would like to bring you back to a, a smaller scale uh, situation. Um, I, was, uh, I was one of the uh, students uh, of Enzo that in the early 1990s uh, graduated with him and uh, here, and David Benassi, Alberta, Andreot, and Yuri Katva have already explained, give us an idea of what was that period like. Um, to a certain extent, I represent the, um, the uh, anthropological side of of, uh, of Enzo, because Enzo in his books uh, was always open to many in, in, uh, disciplines in, in sociology and anthropology and social anthropology was one of uh, those disciplines. And uh, I, I was uh, very much interested in, uh, in fragmented societies uh, I just want to tell you a little anecdote about that because when I went to Enzo's office and asked for uh, and asked him to if he was available to have a to to cherish my work uh, and my thesis he he was he, he, we discussed about the topic and uh, we ended up talking about the informal economy and uh, he said that you know I have a, a recent book that is going to be published and uh, maybe you want to start with this book and it was fragmented societies and it was a very bulky volume and those of you who have read the book knows that it was 500 page long and I don't know if it was the first student to read the book before engaging on the thesis, and uh, and that's where my, basically my my research, uh, my interest in anthropology started. Um, by the way, Enzo was um, had, had dialogues with uh, many anthropologists uh, along his career. I could mention Larry Salomnitz, uh, uh, Gavin Smith, who could not be today, but he was uh, one of the uh, long friends of Enzo, Jonathan Friedman, uh, Susanna Narotsky, uh, to name but a few. Um, so I, I see how, and I want to come back to my, my contribution to this book, I, I want to see how there could be a potentially collaborative approach, um, both methodological and empirical, with uh, uh, the sociological thought that Enzo has developed uh, throughout his years. And uh, to a certain extent, to all the new economic sociology which he contributed to develop. And um, in, in particular, the, uh, the idea of deconstructing the, the, uh, the market uh, and, uh, and produced a non econocentric interpretation of it. Um, for example, as was mentioned earlier, Mark as a disorganizer of social life uh, um, and not self-regulating mechanism and uh, uh, some, uh, it's some um, institution that cannot be populated by atomized individuals and, uh, and uh, basically a source of social tensions. So, and I think this was, now that we think, we tend to take for granted these conceptualizations right now, but 30 years ago, they were not uh, part of a current uh, debate uh, in, uh, in sociology. Uh, it was the new economic sociology that brought, brought up these issues more, uh, more uh, permanently and you know, forward. Um, so, at that time, uh, I also got in touch with Polanyi's uh, um, uh, um, thought, and uh, uh, because it was actually very important in, in Enzo's uh, work in fragmented societies, and uh, I mean, Enzo's revisiting of of Polanyi analytical approach, as uh, to me, it, it was it became. Uh, um, I mean, 
it was a way to, to see how there could be a methodological compatibility between a sociology and anthropology uh, and, uh, and to develop also a theoretical base for, for uh, critical thinking about uh, Western capitalism, for example. Uh, and uh, he's uh, interested in um, informal economy, in um, household labor, in people's strategies of survival, who are uh, seen as institutionalized forms of society, so, uh, sociality uh, based on the reciprocity and redistributions uh, has given consistency to the Polanyan notion of embeddedness. So, and that's the other major uh, category that uh, I described in my contribution. And I, I, I use the um, term uh, metaphor, you know, metaphor in, in terms of a um, way of, um, of seeing how uh, you know the uh, how the, the theorization of the self-regulated market could be uh, could be uh, used to understand better uh, the uh, to understand and to interpret the uh, the complexity of the market. So my argument in in the article is that there's a new renewed interest in the concept of embeddedness. And, uh, and, and scholars like Mingione, uh, Zelizer, Laville, Swedberg, and many others you know, uh, contribute to, to uh, create this um, possibility of, of creating in common grounds between uh, uh, certain, uh, certain uh, between social anthropology and, uh, and, um, and sociology, and especially among certain kind of cultural aspects of economic institution that were very interesting uh, and could be easily debated between these two disciplines. So this new interest in, in, uh, in, in, in the market uh, became also important for, um, uh, for me through ethnographic investigation. So that's basically what I was trying to do. So this convergence of interest uh, between you know, the market uh, among the economic sociologists and the economic anthropologists uh, allowed me to, to, uh, to develop this, this research in a micro setting. Area. In particular, uh, try to provide a thick description of the social embeddedness in the economy in areas where sociology normally cannot reach because it normally ethnography is, is a method that is dear to anthropologists more than uh, in sociology. So uh, it, it is true that this argument uh, was a reminiscence of the old debate between substantivists and formalists you know, in, in anthropology, uh, which is which faded away without resolving any moot points that they had raised in, in the past, in the late, uh, uh, late 60s and early 70s. Uh, yet, in retrospect, the uh, new economic sociology renewed interest in Polanyi's category, proved with hindsight that substantivist and economic sociologists of the new generation had methodological and theological affinities. So, and uh, the, this, in the second part of my, of my contribution, try to put into practice these, uh, uh, these ideas. So we have uh, the concept of market. Uh, we have uh, uh, some mm, tools to interpret the market, like embeddedness or disembeddedness. We have the uh, double movements of those polynomial categories. And the second part of my of my chapter, I try to to show how we could use these tools, analytical tools, to understand, to interpret the, what has been changing in uh, in a small settings. In my case, in the uh, situation where small enterprises are are working in a society, in a fixed society, in a, in a, in, a, in a small urban centers, and are. Um, uh, creating social relationships uh, uh, with uh, uh, with the suppliers, uh, with the workers, and with the uh, institutions and lo at the local level. 
And so in my second part of my contribution is basically ethnographic, and I provide some examples of embeddedness and disembeddedness. And maybe during the discussion, I could go through into details about these aspects. Um, what I would like to conclude, uh, well, I would like to conclude by saying that um, doing uh, doing research, at, uh, at like a small scale research, um, is in it's. Could, could create some difficulties because you lose you know, the uh, overall uh, aspect of uh, you know, the dynamics between the small the uh, small scale uh, dynamics uh, and the larger scales uh, uh, relationships the global and the local for example uh, but uh, work uh, the work that Enzo has uh, produced has helped me to to uh, place my work into a global context very easily. And, uh, and the second thing I would like to say is that uh, by doing research at this such a small scale, uh, you also notice uh, uh, another thing, how fast things change and um, how it is very uh, different from uh, from when I started field work in the early 1990s, uh, things are changing much faster now, and these dynamics of disembeddedment and embeddedment uh, in society are uh, quite uh, uh, frequent. I mean, it, it, the, the the system is so highly dynamic that. Uh, it, it is very difficult to keep track of everything. If you, for example, uh, lose the ground of this kind of uh, methodology, and you don't try to you know, to uh, to develop uh, to, to continue with this research, and that's what I'm doing. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff about the um, uh, my findings in, in the small uh, in, in uh, small scales, uh, but I think I might bring up all these uh, findings uh, later on when we have the discussion with the, uh, with the discussant. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much uh, uh, to Monigetti. I like very much in his chapter because I read it. I had the, the possibility of reading it. I, read, I like very much uh, the second part on, on the uh, small case analysis because, uh, especially because now I am working on what, how uh, employment relations are regulated within small firms. And what you said uh, about the, the changes in regarding this is really very enlightening. Now I give the floor to Enzo Mingione. Uh, thank you. Allow me to begin by thanking everybody, uh, the, the participants, uh, uh, particularly the, uh, the one that uh, contributed to the book uh, and uh, the organizers of the book. Uh, they, they did uh, a surprise uh, gift, uh, which is uh, uh, very important uh, for every some sort of scholar and intellectual. So I'm very grateful uh, to them. So I, I will try to, uh, to fulfill your expectation, perhaps, but uh, this is very difficult, and, uh, uh, but mainly to uh, uh, open a ground for discussion, uh, because this is, uh, this is important. I think uh, I, uh, I have uh, adopted uh, some sort of uh, a Polanian approach, uh, which is uh, I, I, I have uh, always some sort of refused to discuss with a true Polanian because I, they would raise a lot of uh, objections. And uh, I thought it is uh, this Polanian approach is open and it is uh, uh, some sort of it, it has some signals uh, in order to understand uh, some sort of uh, what Polanyi called market society and that we call capitalism. Uh, 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 I think that uh, the idea that uh, uh, the, 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 the new some sort of market occasion, so the, the commodification process which uh, concerns the modern world, uh, modernity, the industrialization, and concerns 
all the global world today, and this is important to say, there is uh, there are very few areas so remote and abandoned that don't have uh, some sort of are not exposed to commodification process. The idea that the commodification process uh, is a disorganizer of social life uh, is very powerful and give you some sort of a means of understanding the dynamic of social change and not some sort of a, a, a only uh, some sort of a static analysis of a small, uh, uh, a, a small case, which is we have to uh, work empirically on a, a small case, but we have to put it in a frame which is dynamic and global. And this is what make is, is uh, according to me, is possible through the double movement. And uh, I, I have recently some sort of revived the idea that, uh, yes, you have the double movement, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful to Ida to have uh, raised this point, and we have to think at uh, the, the, uh, the double movement as also has a possible emancipation process, because this is very important. It does not disorganize only, it also opens the necessity to reorganize, and this uh, uh, disorganization and reorganizations are leading to some sort of uh, new social bonds, which are uh, always some sort of a little bit oppressive, but less oppressive or differently oppressive than the, the past, and this means that the, the, so some sort of the, the, the double market is uh, uh, some sort of uh, producing some sort of emancipation. More so because the, the, double, uh, 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 the double movement opens uh, some sort of an individualization uh, process which means that people uh, are become agent of uh, some sort of uh, building uh, the, the new society and building some sort of uh, opposition to, uh, 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 to oppression. So this is, uh, this is the other part. Uh, this happens in different contexts, in different ways. This may not happen. This may not happen because commodification can be imposed and can be violently imposed on some population, and these population are not at all emancipated. And this is what happened to the majority of the world, which are eradicated from their oppressive traditional societies, like Marx already thought that, uh, but uh, they are not put into a better situation or a good situation or a livable situation. They are, they are put into uh, new plantations, uh, new uh, uh, shanty towns, uh, 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 impossible uh, condition of life, uh, and a very hard way of having some sort of a, a new identity on a new uh, 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 free identity. So this is uh, th this process is is uh, uh, is a good tool. This the idea of taking uh, uh, this is a good tool to understand what is happening in societies uh, in dynamic and global terms. And this is why I, I, I would like to uh, uh, you to think about uh, adopting uh, uh, this uh, uh, this frame. Then I'll come briefly to uh, the, the, the analysis of uh, what is happening now to Western capitalism, which is the title of the book, and how you, you, you can uh, uh, use this tool to understand the perspectives, which are some sort of uh, to understand what may happen, but it may happen in a different way, because it is the, the action of people is always unpredictable. 
uh, we don't know if somebody will make a war, if uh, some uh, 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 financer will uh, destroy uh, the money, if uh, some investment will go uh, very badly, and all these kind of things, and what will happen in the very powerful financial uh, process. So I, I'm saying two things in order to go toward the conclusion. One thing is uh, uh, we, are, uh, uh, we are accustomed to, to, to start thinking a little bit non-dynamic and heterocentric from what has been the great experience uh, of uh, the democratic welfare capitalist uh, age uh, in the afterward periods. Uh, the democratic welfare capitalist age, where uh, some, as Marshall is uh, reminding us, but he has been totally forgotten in that, was built uh, by some sort of uh, the use of abundant resources uh, due to the fact that the Western world had a control and a government of capitalism while the decolonizing countries were left to this non-emancipatory uh, 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 commodification process. Uh, they had resources to combine some sort of uh, welfare, democracy, and capitalism that are not combinable. Huh? That in, in, a, in a normal a time with normal resources are not combinable. And uh, they did this by some sort of uh, what Marshall says, legitimizing uh, uh, inequalities. Uh, they, they did this by legitimizing inequalities, but Marshall says, look, they, 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 they don't take a point. What is the level of, of, of inequalities that can be legitimized? And if it raises this level, uh, what happens when it is no longer legitimizable? And here we are. Here we are. Uh, we, this is the article by Marshall. It's 1972. Uh, but, uh, so a very long time passed, and now it is clear that there are, in the Western countries, there, are, there is no longer enough emancipation. Uh, people are fragmented and uh, uh, abandoned, and uh, they have a lot of difficulties in building new social bonds. And at the same time, uh, some sort of inequalities are widening, and uh, it is, uh, there is no possibility to govern this process and to legitimize the level of uh, of inequalities. This is why I may sound uh, pessimistic and other uh, sound pessimistic because I, 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 at the end of the chapter I quote Wolfgang Streck who is very pessimistic and our, our colleagues here, no, the, the, he, he may correct himself sometimes but he is usually very pessimistic. Uh, well, I think we have to be a little bit pessimistic because this is the reality, but at the same time, we have to be a little bit optimistic because uh, in a way, uh, it is up to us to build a response uh, to what is uh, some sort of uh, a society which is more fragmented, more, uh, 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 more e uh, unequal, uh, less uh, uh, social, and it is up to us to build some sort of forms of the uh, commodification that are some sort of sociable, and uh, it is up to us, and that is my last point, at the urban and local point. The, the most of the population of the world is living in cities, and it is in cities that the agency produces something new, and it is there that we have to look uh, if we want to be a little bit optimistic. And, uh, and this is not, uh, and I think this is not too much, because 
if you think uh, at the bourgeois revolution and the industrial revolution, at the commodification revolution, this started in cities. And it was what, uh, what Bolfa Strike would call a very limited phenomenon. And from this very limited phenomenon, the motor of the double movement built up uh, the modern societies. Thanks. Thank you very much, Enzo. And now let's uh, the floor to our uh, discussant. I don't know. Do you want Francesco Ramella want, wants to be the first or Serino Negrelli, as you prefer? Okay. Yeah. I okay. Will start. You yes. Okay. Thank you very much for having invited me. It is a pleasure. I have always uh, read with the immenso piacere the books of uh, Enzo Mingione. I have. Uh, found him, him uh, always uh, stimulating and uh, to a certain extent also provoking. Um, I would say that I had also an emotional feelings with uh, reading the chapter of uh, Simone Ghezzi because I jumped back uh, in time uh, when I was uh, 20 years younger and I was working more or less on the same topic in a small district of Tuscany and already then you could see this, this embedding process with ambivalent uh, effect. I would say that uh, there is a shared uh, common as assumption behind the three authors. Let me, let me say that I will, meet, I, I will be basing my remarks on what I have read inside the chapters more than uh, what you told uh, to, tomorrow, um, this morning. Um, the shared assumption is that uh, the strength of the disembedding process uh, is uh, increasing over the time. There is a clearly a trend toward uh, a destabilize, destabilizing effect of the, in the development of capitalism. Maybe the drivers can be a little bit different. In some chapters, uh, there has been the mention of a service society, the financialization of the capitalism. In others, uh, there is... Uh, a stronger emphasis on the neoliberal policies, but uh, the tendency is quite clear. There is a clearly a trend toward uh, this uh, disembedding uh, and uh, a, a cr an increasing uh, uh, instability of the capitalism. In the Simone Gezzi chapters, uh, the mechanism is more related to the formalization of the job market. I would say that reading Simone Gates, you can understand that uh, the process of standardization, the process of uh, uh, increasing uh, uh, the level of uh, formalization of a job market uh, relationship tend to disembed uh, the local economy. Because in the past, of course, uh, the social construction of local economy was, uh, in a certain sense, a mix based on market relationship, but also a lot of reciprocity and, I would say, also redistributive policies at the local level. So in this case, the disembedding driver is the process of formalization. In Saskia Sassen, on, on the contrary, uh, there is a different uh, underlining. Uh, the mechanism is a little bit different. It's more related uh, to adve the advent of a service economy, of the financialization of the capitalism, that is accompanied by a process of uh, informalization of a job market uh, that tend to create a polarization in social stratification. And also there is the underlining of a downsizing, of a downgrading of the manufacturing sectors. Uh, finally, going to Enzo Mingione's suggestive uh, cha chapters, I would say that uh, one aspect that Enzo has uh, particularly un underlined in his, in his chapter is uh, this lack, especially in advanced economies, of uh, this decline of the emancipatory side of the process of, com of commodifi commodification. In the past, the market played, uh, in a certain sense, uh, a positive role, not only because uh, stimulated uh, the process of re-embedding, but to a certain extent also the market had uh, this emancipatory uh, side in the job market. Um, 
I found uh, not only interesting the reading of the chapters, but also useful and uh, to a certain extent convincing uh, the thesis advanced by the authors. But I have been asked uh, to do the dirt, dirt works, and so I will try to, to ask uh, a few questions. And uh, the first one is, uh, is uh, about the analytical model uh, that you use. Uh, I am quite fond of uh, Polanian categories, but as you know, the economic sociologists have been a little bit criticizing the approach of Polanyi. For example, uh, we have uh, a little bit criticized uh, uh, too much uh, what we, c we can say uh, an under-socialized under vision of the market. Uh, to a certain extent, I would say that uh, both uh, the tradition coming, uh, the schools coming from the United States, especially the new economic sociology, but also the more European tradition, the comparative political economy, have always uh, underlined the fact that uh, there is a so process of social construction of economy, social construction of the market. So inside the logic of the market, you have uh, to take into consideration the importance of social networks, of embeddedness, and so on and so on. I would say also that all uh, the economy at different geographical, geographical level are a sort of variable mix of the principle of regulation. And all the comparison we tend to say is uh, try to understand which mix is more or less viable, which mix is more or less capable to keep together competitiveness, economic growth, and social cohesion. Um, let me ask you the first question. Don't you see any process of re-embedding in the recent dynamic of capitalism? Because I would, see the, I would say the opposite, that sometimes, especially in this period, there is a sort of a rediscovery eh, of the social construction of the market, even in the epoch of uh, financialization of the capitalism, of globalization, and so on. And I found the traces of this uh, fact also in different, uh, uh, in different, uh, in different uh, scientific disciplines. Let me, for example, uh, mention economics. In economics, you find a lot of reflection nowadays on the social construction of innovation, on the national, local, and regional system of innovation. These economists are rediscovering the importance of the regulation of the state. Think, for example, at the influential books by Marianna Mazzuccato. She didn't introduce anything new from the analytical point of view, but he got an incredible a success in his thesis because nowadays also the economists are recognizing the role and the importance of institutional and regulatory context in order to understand the economic dynamics, the innovative dynamics of the firms. Or think about the recent institutional turns in the economics of development. Strangely enough, we are rediscovering as a sociologist the market and the disembedding aspect. Instead, the economist seems to, to be nowadays more aware of the importance of the quality of the institution, the quality of the governance, the long-lasting effect of the regulatory frame and so on. Even uh, in some papers on the International Monetary Fund, you will start to see that they are taking into consideration that in order to support and to make sustainable in, in the long run the development, you need to address the problem of uh, redistribution of the wealth, especially in third world countries. Uh, they are recognizing that if you don't address the problem of increasing inequalities, uh, the economic growth is not sustainable. And uh, shifting a little bit in uh, the political economy uh, field, for example, the rediscovery of a new developmental state, the importance of a state in constructing the process of development, not only in advanced countries, but also in third, third world countries. And this kind of literature is quite interesting because, for example, they tend to underline the importance of the embeddedness of these regulatory uh, processes. For example, Danny, Bre Bre Danny Brenitz, who 
has been working on the development of, of countries like Taiwan, Korea, Israel, has underlined how the strategic approach of the state to the development was very different, also in terms of a strategy of constructing social alliance and embedding the action of the state. And let me conclude this uh, uh, overview of uh, streams of, uh, and schools of thinking that are rediscovering the importance of the, of the regulatory aspect and the mix that uh, are constructing the market. The research on uh, consumerism and the consumer research tend to see that in many different fields you have hybrid market, market in which the logic of the market, the logic of exchange based on the market is often mixed with different aspects, reciprocity, sharing, uh, the gift giving and so on. So also in this uh, sector of uh, research you find that there is uh, an important uh, underlying, uh, underlining, uh, it, it is underlined the mixed uh, uh, combinatorial aspect of the process of uh, regulation. The second question is about variability. Don't you see any variability in what you have been describing in your chapters? Uh, because, of course, uh, I think that uh, what has been emerging uh, in the last years, especially during the economic crisis, is that uh, some countries have done better than others. For example, if I think of the Europe, uh, it is evident that some countries have been able to conjugate economic growth with, uh, to a certain extent, social cohesion, or at least uh, a, 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 the capacity to keep uh, under control the increase of uh, inequality. The third question is about uh, technological change. I have not uh, seen any one of you mentioning the importance of uh, technological change. Instead, uh, we have uh, many studies and many research that uh, are underlining also on a comparative basis uh, that uh, the technological dy dynamic is uh, creating most of, m many of effects in terms of social inequality. Of course, uh, technology cannot be taken into consideration by itself, but there is uh, to a certain extent, an acceleration of a technological change that is increasing the problem of social inequality. The last question is about the downgrading of the manufacturing. Also, in this case, my question is, is for Saskia Sassen, don't you see any tendency in the advanced countries to rethink the, the, the role of the mark of the manufacturing sectors uh, in development. Because, for example, in Europe, there is a sort of a rediscovery, also in terms of policies, of a strategic role played by manufacturing sectors uh, in supporting long-lasting development. And I would say also in the United States, for example, in the work done by MIT Research Group on the role between, on the relationship between manufacturing and innovation, there is a sort of a reassessment of the cruciality of reshoring the pro productive process because this not only permit to master the commercialization aspect of the process of innovation, but also to foster innovation, to create the basis for improving the innovation process. Many thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Francesco, for your uh, very, I think, I th think very useful comments. And now, Serafino Negrelli, uh, after, after your um, comments, uh, I'll give the floor again to the, our former Thank you. Uh, it's not so easy uh, to discuss, to make some comments uh, about uh, uh, the Saskia question because uh, she posed many questions uh, today here in, uh, in uh, her relevant book on expulsion in the chapter uh, in the book for Enzo. So as a, a sociologist of work, uh, I've chosen a, a question that is crucial for me uh, and you posed uh, uh, 
you said uh, to what extent are employment based uh, economic insecurity and poverty intrinsic to advanced uh, economy, economies rather than a deviation? This is a crucial question because behind uh, this question there is uh, the analytical uh, uh, work produced by Saskia about the idea of restructuring, um, restructuring of economies and firms, restructuring of society and consumers, restructuring of political and works. So the, the process of downgrading of many manufacturing sectors and expanding informalization in many economic activities together with the consolidation of produce uh, services and corporate headquarters sector recall to many ways um, the complex, the relevant and complex analysis in their important book on expulsion. The Saskia's main hypothesis is that not only low wage uh, jobs uh, can be in function of economic growth, but also that informalization can be better understood in the context of uh, the process of economic restructuring from uh, old manufacturing to new service dominated economies complex. As also Gorz uh, uh, pointed out, uh, she underlines the notion of, and the need of the serving class in contemporary high-income household. And as Moretti uh, and others indicate, one high-tech job can produce one or two high-skilled jobs and uh, other free low-wage low -wage jobs, maybe eliminating some other jobs, expulsions, and then can produce a polarization and informalization of work. In this sense, there is a rising demand for more research to define what is informal economy and what is informal work in our advanced society and how and for what and where. But to give more complexity to the question, I would like to make some comments uh, about some points, less investigating the Saskia chapter and asking for more details. When you say that a vast, a vast supply, supply of jobs, often low paid, is an integral part of advanced economies rather than a function of the existence of a large supplies of workers with inadequate human capital and inadequate work ethic. Don't you think that uh, these two interpretations could be not so alternative? Um, just in our advanced society, it's more relevant to invest in human capital uh, anyway. And this can be related to a second point. Uh, maybe that this interpretation can be more complementary. And you underline the fact that in our advanced societies, there is a surplus of workers with a good education but no jobs. And it's true that on the basis of many data, workers actually bring to jobs more knowledge, more creativity, responsibility, and the social capital, more than recognized by formal labor contracts. But I think that it is also important to stress the fact on the basis of other many data that more educated people have more opportunities to be less unemployed and better paid in general anyway. About uh, Getzi, in the Getzi analysis, uh, we can appreciate the idea to see the transformation of small business uh, economy through the lens of, uh, uh, or the key approach of the double movement between embeddedness and disembeddedness. The characteristics of our industrial districts and the career paths of old entrepreneurs from young workers to skilled employers are, well, are very well described. Um, but in some points, I think that the rigidity of this theoretical framework can pose the, a problem. For example, only two, two examples. For example, it could be difficult to accept the extension of uh, the temporary layoffs indemnity in the small firms as a process of disembeddedness. On the contrary, 
for me, uh, why cannot we see it as a form of re-embeddedness? Um, could you explain better this uh, uh, different interpretation? A second related problem is about the meaning of the transformation of this difference between uh, the uh, the door uh, of the old family values of the first generation of small entrepreneurs and the deregulated new small firms. Um, again, um, paternalism was really better than uh, the uh, today's situation. Uh, I, I quoted uh, your, your uh, proposition, deciding in a unilaterally way to dismiss before married women women and younger people or someone who had exasperated the employer was or is really better. Uh, difficult to call this reciprocity, reciprocity or informal rule and not all the paternalistic way. In this sense, I think, is a, a form of paternalistic human resource management. Um, and this may be that uh, not so much has changed in, in this situation. Last, Mingione. Uh, Mingione starts from uh, the Polani idea that commodification opens a deficit of social protection and obliges individuals to reconstruct social bonds. Um, that is some, the same crucial sociological uh, question posed by Durkheim or by Coleman more recently about uh, how uh, uh, the function and the importance of, um, of legacy. But Mingioni makes his analysis uh, of tensions in contemporary dynamic cap capitalism, applying in a convincing uh, way the Polanyi concept of the double movement. In this way, he explained the individual vulnerability, increasing social inequalities, more dramatic with the financialization of economy, the standardization of jobs, employment instability, and the complex situation of women and immigrants, welfare entrenchment, and so on. His thesis is that in a global commodification, there are great difficulties in finding the means and resources to face the disembedding impact or great difficulties faced by the advanced welfare systems in preserving universal levels of protection. It is not clear to me, uh, and this is the first question for Enzo, for Enzo the, his position, the position of Enzo about the trends of capitalist development, because it is, is in struggle between, on the one side, the definite unsustainability of this development because uh, the re-embedded process is unable to protect uh, large and increasing groups of individuals. And on the other side, the possible last chance for re-embedded institutions and organized agencies to oppose oppression and discrimination. If the first way, there is something very near to the strike uh, solution position of coming back to nation state protection. If the second way is near to the idea of a possible social regulation beyond the boundaries of national states, that is the Habermas position. And in this latter way, in this latter way, a social regulation beyond the states, EU, but not so much, uh, could not be interpreted as a form of Polani re-embeddedness. And the second question, but at the end of his chapter, uh, we find another not less important part about local welfare. That uh, seems to me to recall the idea of the social division of welfare by Richard Tidmus, between social, fiscal, and occupational welfare, or between state, the first state, and the second welfare. Enzo says that some solidarity and protection initiatives 
may become the last resort for defending particular groups of citizens in competition, in competition with other groups. Is this a different idea, this is the question, of possible competitive forms of re-embeddedness? Thank you. I think there, there are a lot of uh, stuff here. <laughs> I, I don't think you, you will be able to answer to all these questions anyway, I, I, because I think that you, you have uh, nine minutes each. Well, right, nine, nine minutes. <laughs> nine minutes. <laughs> We're losing ground. It used to be ten minutes yes, was the typical. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so at well, the, at the yeah, 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 there yeah. will be ten. I, I, I understand. Yeah. Be 10. Yes. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much to both commentators. Really, molte grazie for such a detailed analysis. So, I just am going to pick up on a few points because otherwise I cannot do it. So. Um, the question, both of you raised a question that has to do in a way with a higher level of complexity in many jobs and the fact that our societies are generating larger strata of highly educated people. And yes, I agree with that. The problem is that we do have, and maybe the United States is exhibit number one in its brutality. We, louder? Oh, I'm sorry. See, it's so closer. Right. So, so in the United States, we have battalions of educated people, including with doctorates from good universities, who are basically doing jobs, either teaching in 15 different classes in different universities or schools, or are simply unemployed, or are doing jobs that are way below. Now, you raised, I think both of you signaled, isn't it better to have a lot of highly educated people than not having, you know, people, or not highly educated, but people with good educations. Of course that is better. But we cannot overlook the fact of the amount of wasted talent. And when you look at a country like the United States, again, exhibit number one, we now have about 3,000 universities that are for profit. They're interested in educating people because it's money. Of course, some of them are fictions. So there is some romantic notion about education and the worth of it and highly intelligent people, blah, blah, that we need to deal with because something is not going well. Now, the second point is that when it comes to highly complex jobs, there are also, and, and uh, rather than the less complex jobs which are often being outshored, but even if you look at highly complex settings, let's say, we have two types of workers very often. One are brilliant techies, and the other ones are people who know a very limited technology, like in, in, in warehouses, etc. So I have been, since that then looks, okay, both are doing okay. Are there any negatives attached to being the lower level worker? That was my question. I went to law cases, courts, where an accident happens in both places. So now again, I'm talking about the United States, but these are real, real facts, real data. So that's why I invoke them. Uh, when you're a high-level techie, the system wakes up, invents new this laws, etc. You are protected. Mostly, you will win the case, partly because the judges don't even get it. When you're a low-wage wage worker, guess what? You're automatically guilty. So an accident happens on the workplace. You're guilty. Now, that's the U.S. The U.S. is absolutely brutal. It is absolutely brutal when it comes, you know, to half of the population, basically, sort of lower. So there you have a, a situation where high technology might be a great thing to have, but it has not precluded, and that's all I'm saying, it has not precluded an absolute downgrading of the quality of life of those workers and the options that they have to make their case. They don't even get that option. You know, so, so, and the knowledge factor hangs in there. That is one issue that I quickly wanted to say. The issue of literatures, that was especially your case. All these literatures about this and that. I must tell you, I don't mean to be brutal. I'm Dutch and I am a bit brutal, inevitably, because the Dutch, you know, are not intermediated cultures. Uh, a lot of that stuff belongs to an older era. Oh, you know, there is a lot of literature that, in my view, simply is not getting 
what is happening. And one of the reasons, it's not that they don't know the little details about this work situation and that work situation. No, it's that there are other, now this is now me the theorist, you know, so you can really disagree with that and I may be 100% wrong or 70% wrong or whatever. I agree with that too, with that possibility. But I see these new vectors organizing our economies. The Polanyi economy version and all of that, it's, it's uh, added a lot of complexity to the notion of what is an economy and we all are great admirers of that. But it seems to me that today, when we speak about the economy, we really need to ask, what are we speaking about? Part of that economy does function the way it has been described. I think there is another element in that economy that simply has not been incorporated. Those logics have not been incorporated into a lot of the analyses of the economy. And frankly, one way of thinking about it is that there are multiple economies. And some of these economies are reasonable, some are not. Now, I want to find, sort of end with, uh, with um, uh, with a kind of juxtaposition, Germany and the US. Germany is amazing. Germany has enabled all kinds of very small, you know, long lasting businesses who do maybe the ultimate pencil, the ultimate kind of paper for whatever, and they export to the world. I think that is a great economy, right? In the United States, pencils, hey, we ship them up to there or whatever. We know what I'm talking about. So it could be done, but there are very few countries that have somehow enabled that. And enablement is, of course, a major challenge here. So uh, uh, if we could do that, you know, I would say that that, and that comes back to the highly educated workers, you know, and, and the desirability of having highly educated populations. That is a foundational element. But the problem is that the other links are missing. Now, again, Italy has far more still of the craft working and, and you know, than, than say a country like the United States has. So now I want to make one little final observation, and that is a phenomenon of franchising that was not mentioned by you, nor does, I think, Pogliani have a notion of franchising. What is franchising? So if I need a computer, I need a franchise. Otherwise, I have to go to the factory, right? But do I need franchising for everything else? So two little examples that I, I really think capture something. The, the old-fashioned flower shop, you probably still have that. Very modest, selling flowers, right? Very modest operation, but those people had to know about accounting, they had to know about law, they had to know what flowers when, what do people want. There was knowledge. It was a knowledge operation. When it's a franchise, they just get it, they have zero knowledge, and they sell it on. With part of the profit leaving the locality, that's a second issue, and going to headquarters. So there are two issues. One is the loss of knowledge spaces that are local. Now, Italy is still amazing in that sense because you have a lot of that, right? But in many parts of the world, it's lot, and say Barcelona is now stop all franchises, right? Because it's a disaster. It sort of is avoiding. So one notion that I have been working on is the relocalizing at the neighborhood level, whatever the quartier, whatever the notions, of forms of economic activity that are necessary but can be handled at that level. And again, it's not necessarily the computer, but it's so much of the rest. Franchising has become an extractive logic. It keeps extracting, extracting. We need to go back to the little local bank. We need to go back to all kinds of, because that is one way of recapturing types of economies that then could become in an idealized and a better world, more like the Polanyi notion, you know, with their own contradictions. Yes, I stop. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. I know. Grazie. Please, Io please switch, off, switch off your... Ah, yeah. No. Okay, now... Uh, yes, I will, yes. yes yeah, we'll start uh, out with uh, uh, with uh, Stefano Grali's uh, question regarding the uh, the rigidity of the model. Um, oh, okay, sorry. Well, I think 
Mm, what is interesting in the concept of, of embeddedness and disembeddedness is that, at least in my case, is the paradox of disembeddedness. So what I'm trying to show is that there's a disembedding phenomena that may have an embedded-like effect. One of that is the uh, the example I make is the uh, the redundancy. You know, when when the when the entrepreneur start uh, take the decision of uh, of firing or making someone redundant. Um, now, as I said in the uh, in the chapter, there's uh, this kind of paternalistic uh, way of uh, of ranking people who will uh, lose their job temporarily. Job. Uh, and this kind of ranking is basically uh, the result of uh, an embedding. Um, it's effect on embeddedness. When uh, people start using their own values, the uh, values of the, uh, of the community, the culture in which they are embedded, um, the decision they come up with you know, is uh, not so much an economic one, but becomes a cultural one. In, in the example I made was, uh, in, was uh, uh, the case of two firms, one, the firms that had to deal with the crisis in 1996 and uh, in 2008, 2009. And what happened in the two cases? Uh, in the first one, you see how embeddedness uh, works. Uh, in those cases, you see people starting losing those who lost their job first was the young, were the youngest, those without families, those, and then without children. Okay, there's a sort of ranking system that is basically uh, uh, that comes out of the uh, the notion of family, the value of, of having a family, and the, the notion of paternalism. But paternalism is uh, a component of the embeddedness, okay? Uh, which means that you, you, you privilege the social aspect well, rather than the economic aspect in this case. Now, what happened 20, in 20 years later? Uh, well, the, the entrepreneurs don't have to uh, resume this uh, ranking uh, system, culturally uh, determined, because now they have uh, a tool uh, uh, that comes from uh, the regulation, the, the, the formal regulation, which is uh, this, uh, uh, we call the temporary, government temporary layoffs indemnity. You know? And in that case, they don't have to rely on of those kind of decision based on uh, on the values they 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 are they they, uh, they bears the decision is based no longer in formal regulations on on the fam those family arrangement but they are based basically on uh, on very formal uh, decisions so we have a tool and this tool could be used without taking into consideration uh, those uh, values that I mentioned earlier. So, um, and that's, I think, it's a paradox. It's, it's a way to, you are relieved, you are freed from uh, those kind of decisions that were uh, bound you. And uh, so, and, and I think this is a paradox. It's an, an effect of the, the disembeddedness, but it's not a negative effect to a certain extent. Uh, the, uh, the other aspect, the other um, uh, uh, area where you could see this paradox is in the uh, hiring procedures, uh, in the employment. Uh, deployment in the in the 19, early 1990s, the employment was still based on uh, social on the sociality on the fixed sociality on uh, on personal uh, uh, knowledges, uh, personal relations, and um, and there was no oh, there were no intermediate institution that would uh, regulate the uh, uh, the hiring system. Now you have uh, many tamping agencies. You have uh, 
uh, um, a lot of uh, self-employed, or semi-self employed uh, uh, artisans, which are former workers, who are uh, available and, uh, and are being hired for a short-term period. And this is done through a very formal system of hiring, of employment. And uh, again, this is another way of, of seeing how this embeddedness turn, turns into a disembedding uh, phenomenon because you are not longer uh, bounded by this uh, strong uh, and thick uh, society with the community when it comes to higher people. You have to, you, you deal, you demand, uh, you, you decentralize, you externalize this kind of, uh, uh, of relationship. And, uh, and so therefore, when, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, fire people or or um, lay of people, you you don't have to, you know, it, it's it's a much, it's a decision that is no longer seen as a struggle, uh, as a very engaging because you have a direct relationship with the person that is uh, that, uh, that that you have been hired and that you have a strong connection. In this case, all those components have are disappearing. And um, the other, yeah, this, uh, then coming back to to uh, uh, to Francesco's uh, questions, one that was very, I found very interesting to my um, to, to my research is the embedding uh, processes because I my, I focused on those uh, disembedding processes and they not necessarily have a negative connotation in my uh, in, in my field however I see some embedding processes uh, in taking place uh, but we don't know to what extent this will turn into something major and something more, uh, you know, uh, uh, like uh, it could go into an institutionalized behavior. For example, dealing with uh, uh, one, uh, one example I could give you is that now entrepreneurs are uh, entrepreneurs are uh, uh, establishing relationship with other business partners without engaging in any um, uh, any uh, contract that uh, in, includes a monetary exchange. Now they have these networks where they exchange favors. Okay, they exchange uh, uh, services. Mm, through a, a system of credit, so you 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 accrue credits and you spend credits with other entrepreneurs. So and that's without use, the use of money at all. So and this is another very interesting uh, uh, phenomenon that is happening. And I think it, it helps to understand how you know, this is another uh, you know in in, um, in Nuce you see a, an embedding phenomenon that is taking place. Now to what extent this is gonna spread and become institutionalized, we don't know. But what I could say is that this is certainly something highly innovative that is coming from the crisis. And the crisis is teaching us this, that through after the crisis, we could start seeing innovative uh, initiatives, uh, socially granted, that are actually uh, a consequence of that period. So that this crisis is actually Quite, should be you know, quite interesting for us as a, a social analyst because you see here how the, although the crisis has perhaps passed, but the scars and this and the and the marks of the crisis are still uh, uh, functioning and uh, and that could be you know, very interesting for us to develop. So, okay, thanks. Well, thank you, uh, Getzi. Now the final yes. So. The final words. The final. <laughs> 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 no, 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 no,
I, I'm trying to be very, uh, again, very provocative, uh, and uh, as it is the final of the morning, you will not have time to react <laughs> to what I say. <laughs> I know. Uh, so I, uh, uh, I certainly agree with Francesco that uh, the original uh, work of Polanyi uh, was rigid and uh, certainly non-attentive to social agencies. But, uh, and, and this was particularly true in uh, the Great Transformation that was very, a very important, is still now a very important contribution, but it is a very important contribution with uh, some sort of uh, limits due to its uh, emotion. Uh, and the idea that, uh, look, uh, how uh, capitalism, uh, how the market societies are producing some sort of uh, a, a, a social disaster and uh, the response to this social disaster may be fascism and Nazism. And that, that, that is some sort of a, the, the, the short background of it. In a way, uh, the, some sort of the theoretical apparatus is much more flexible and very much oriented in explaining the social uh, construction of the market and of the market societies, as we, we call it, through some sort of the response the always re-embedding responses of uh, uh, redistrib redistribution, uh, reciprocity, institution, and the market as an organization. So in, there is an idea in, uh, implicit uh, in the Polani approach, in my Polani approach, that the market is double, is competition, destroying society, and it is uh, some sort of a social construction rebuilding some sort of social, a social network. And the factory is a social network built by the market, built by the market uh, sort. Of, and uh, in a way, it is in tension with uh, the market uh, as uh, a competitive institution. And so you always, uh, you, you would, uh, the, any firm will tell, well, we want to keep the workers, even if, uh, or we don't want to keep the workers, even if they are less productive, because this gives us stability, and this is what we work. And the, our enterprise works as a family, and we make publicity that uh, our good may be more, uh, more expensive, but uh, they are good for the people. And all these kind of things like that, which means how social the social economy is built. So, in a way, if you want, uh, the Matsukato as an example is a, a very good example of uh, how uh, some sort of the interaction between the state and uh, the economy is going. I, I take it a lot. I like it a lot. It is also an under-socialized way of looking at it. And I agree with you, the variability is very high because the, the re-embedding is variable. And uh, the uh, human agency uh, uh, struggling against oppression is variable. And it is delayed in time, organized in different ways, and so on. So this is a, a point on which we are, and, and it is very interesting to work on that. I, I skip technology. I, I have mostly considered not the productive technology, but uh, the communication technology, because I think they are some sort of an interesting part uh, of our action. So we are activated also through this technology, which doesn't mean that uh, the, 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 the advanced communication technology are building some sort of intermediate bodies. So they are not. So we are more and more without good intermediate bodies that organize our agency life. So one thing which was, has always been impressing me is the debate on uh, disembeddedness. And the fact that disembeddedness an from an analytic point of view doesn't exist. And 
whatever you think it's a, it's a very chaotic society, somehow the Victorian labor market in, in, in the UK. Uh, uh, it, was, uh, it, it was very poorly embedded. People had to beg in the street, uh, to recourse to uh, some sort of uh, 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 charitable able, but it was, this is a way of re-embedding. Not, it is not what you, you cannot make a research on disem, disembedded uh, sort of things. Um, briefly, to conclude, uh, not enough resources. Uh, in, a, in a very heterogeneous and unstable society, we, and which is uh, a global society where the, the rate of growth is much higher in the emerging countries than in our countries, and where all the money is uh, going, uh, all, no, not the money, you are right, Saskia, all the resources are going to the financial control, there is very little possibility to protect uh, the, the population, a large part of the population, both in the emerging countries and in different ways, and in the highly industrialized countries, Co including the great uh, success example of Germany, where Germany had an enormous increase of poor workers and an enormous increase of uh, uh, people that don't have a house, for instance, in, in the last, after the labor market reforms. It's doing very well. They are very competitive. They are exploiting their, their uh, neighbor, uh, Eastern European neighbor, uh, labor market. And at the same time, they are producing a lot of inequalities, more inequalities. So it is, it is, this is why uh, Wolfgang Streck is pessimist, because he lives in Germany. He looks at the very good model, and he, he is pessimist. So at this point, uh, what is the lo local welfare? It is a problem of rescaling. We have to discuss, well, I don't want to discuss it here, but we have to discuss the fact that uh, some sort of uh, the Western modernity has been built uh, by an institution, the nation state, that was invented even before uh, uh, industrialization and that became, as Weber said, became crucial to build uh, our society but not uh, the, the state uh, everywhere and not the state forever. Huh? So we, we are now closing a, 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 a period in which in some context uh, the nation state has been very useful to govern the commodification process. Now it is not, no longer. And in that sense, uh, the, the, uh, the new welfare is uh, perhaps built on different, some sort of solidarity group that are more local and so on. And, and that to say that uh, this, it is an open question. This may mean that uh, uh, the commodification process and the double movement stops or is more limited than in the past and that the new order, the interregnum, as uh, uh, some of my friends call us say, is built outside the commodification process. This is a possibility, but most of the social innovation are also part of the commodification process in order to say something. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're a danger. <laughs> <laughs> You're a danger is a good conclusion. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, now here, thank you very much for your participation. And uh, now there is a lunch break, and then uh, uh, work will start again. I don't know at what time, but I don't, I don't say hear. two o'clock. At two o'clock. There will be the second session. One hour. One hour. One hour lunch. Yes. Decent. Yes.
Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, welcome to the second uh, panel of our meeting. Uh, I'm Mario Diani from the University of Trento. And uh, we have a, quite a dense schedule, especially because we are running a little bit late, to put it mildly. So I, I, let me just, uh, we have four speakers, Sophie Bodijandro, Lydia Morris, Marisol Garcia, and Enrico Pugliese. And we, uh, as uh, the, with the previous format, we'll have about five to seven minutes uh, in the average for the speakers, and then we'll be slightly more time for the commentators, and then a reply from the speakers. And all that in, in well, in one, one hour and a half. So we have to keep tight. Uh, let me start by keeping my introductory role to the, to the very uh, minimum. The, the title of the session is Citizenship and, and Welfare, and... Uh, if we look at the paper, uh, they are quite uh, unsurprisingly diverse. Uh, they, they, they actually publish in different sections of the book. Uh, but still, I think the, 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 the merge, putting them together in this particular session makes eminently sense. And uh, I, don't, I don't pretend that, uh, um, that there, is a, there is not a single line when, you, when you're facing uh, reading interesting work. There are always very different takes you can, you can take. My, my own take of this paper the, the, in the attempt to, to, to identify at least some common themes uh, has unsurprisingly, given my uh, professional focus, to do with uh, the theme of uh, the conditions and forms of collective action and the changing conditions on, on, on collect, of collective action in urban, in urban areas. And uh, if you think... Uh, yeah, really, I think if, if, you put, if you start with a very basic distinction that uh, Charles Tilly, borrowing from, borrowing from Harrison, why did when he, when, he, when he claimed that the collective action is fundamentally the result of the intersection of categorical traits of the actors, properties of the actors, and uh, networks, and the interactions, and the, the mechanism to bring uh, in, uh, actors to social actors together in meaningful cutting, meaningful social groups, well, I mean, if you think of, if you take of those two basic uh, mechanisms, uh, um, you can easily find a lot of interesting material in the in the four papers we're going to discuss. Uh, I'm sure that discussion will uh, will identify uh, still more themes, but certainly, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, these papers speak to at least uh, on this ground to some kind of some kind of common element. In particular, with, with different uh, accents, uh, both uh, Morris uh, and, and Pugliese look uh, from very different angles to the role that to the impact of uh, migration dynamics. Uh, Pugliese more specifically focused on that. Uh, Morris in the context of, uh, of discussion of, of the various factors that have altered the conditions of, of citizenship in the UK, which are notoriously migration has, has been a big player. But nevertheless, there is an element uh, there is a recognition of, of, the, of the changing conditions that have brought about the, the, the crisis of the idea of citizenship, in particular universal citizenship, and the basis that it provided for effective collective action in, in industrial society. And this, this is certainly a theme which, uh, which is, is worth uh, uh, investigating. Um, on the other hand, uh, Bodijandro and, and Garcia, are perhaps in relative terms, uh, give more attention to the issue of explicit uh, radical critical collective action, perhaps if I, if I read them right, uh, they will correct me in case, with different emphasis in terms of, of optimism. Uh, uh, what is very explicitly in, in pointing out the fact that uh, grassroots, grassroots initiatives and new forms of protest, uh, urban protest per se, will not be enough as sources of, as actor agents of change uh, in, unless there is a deep uh, effort to tackle the institutional structure of contemporary capitalism, and uh, Garcia gives more, uh, perhaps, again, she may be, uh, she may correct me, is slightly more, it takes a, a more southern European perspective, and uh, uh, perhaps is more optimistic in the role that uh, uh, the actions that developed since the 2011 on might, uh, the role that those actions might, might play in altering the political landscape, but in any case, this is something we are going to hear from them. I won't uh, dwell any longer, and I won't exceed my role any longer. I'm trying, I will have to keep the time 
very tight um, because there is nobody who's better than the Swiss to take time. I will, I will use some kind of advanced Swiss technology, which is from a conference in Zurich. I got five minutes, one minute, and stop. So, so how okay. long do we go? I mean, seven, uh, if, if possible, uh, five to seven minutes each. Five to seven minutes. They have, they have ten we minutes. Can, it's negotiable. We can bargain. They have ten minutes. We can stretch. Okay. We are guaranteed ten minutes. Okay. Ten minutes. I wish I knew. Help from the... Yeah, it works. Mm. No? No. Doesn't he? That's you. Okay. Well... Hello? Any local who is familiar with the local system? Thank you very much. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks for the effort. Saskia Sassen doesn't look. Can you hear me this way? Anyway, no, but <laughs> I can't. Anyway, um, you heard a lot this morning, and uh, you will find some echoes in what I say this afternoon. Um, so I will start, since my talk is about public disorder in an era of globalization, I start with cities, uh, uh, large cities being where uh, multiple global processes assume concrete and localized forms, but the multiplicity of presences in the urban landscape make cities a contested terrain in which disorder happens. And these, such cities experience continuous mutations generated by global forces in a global context of uncertainty, unpredictability, and fears. So if you take two instances that are well known, the corporate players and uh, the migrant workforce, those are instances of trans transnationalized actors, all claiming their right to the city, but in an asymmetric way. They challenge the city and its weakened democratic capacity, and we may wonder, like Ray Powell, whose city is it? Uh, what is the background of, of protests? Well, the global context makes people insecure, even outraged. And there are numerous reasons that we heard this morning from Saskia, the systematic uh, logics of expulsion at work, the abuse from financial and political forces, leaving people without property. This gives way, way to moral panics, anxiety, a disenchantment towards the democratic paradigm. And we think that protest and urban disorder refer to an inability to think urban change in the long term. New phenomena happen, but we are unable to interpret correctly their meaning or even to perceive them. Our methods and paradigms are not appropriate at this moment. Silent dissent may then appear as a healthy form of post-political empowerment by opposition to social alienation. Post meaning that protesters do not need words for expression, since they do not negotiate with power holders from whom they expect nothing. We may wonder what part the city's spaces play in this uh, protest. That's 
tell me a picture. What is new in my research is that I look at how globalization amplifies local disorder in the occupant movements, the riots, condenses time and space, gives local events a world echo via social networks. Networks interpret local disturbances, they globalize them. Smartphones, websites, social media link dispersed people, create visibility for local mobilizations, and local space is reinterpreted, a global drama organized in contentious territories. Yet I claim that clean, clicking unlike is very different from participation in a specific space. Now, I deal a lot in my work with disorder and order, this, the dialectics, because both are linked. Disorder can only be understood by reference to order. Some forms of disorder are harmful, this we know. Order is needed for society, societies to function. Yet, some disorder, like civic uh, disobedience, for instance, is a necessary step in the adjustment of change. The future order is inside the disorder, the transitory disorder, which acts at its envelope. The notion of intricacy actually would be more appropriate. So my research explores such differences. Now, the police are an essential piece in the dramaturgy of protest. According to Bittner, the, the police are the public institution that better do something now when disorder erupts, or even before. And despite the legitimacy of mobilization, order wins, sadly. Order wins via multiple um, public tools like emergency laws, specialized and well-trained anti-riot uh, police, justice acting in real time, preventative arrest. And in mobilizing such tools, cities reveal their know-how in halting disorder, they benefit from a historical experience. They are not under siege. <clears throat> Protest movements are modes of dissent, giving visibility to what is usually ignored on the political agenda, injustice, emotions, inequalities. As Anna Arendt said, protesters have the courage to start something without knowing the end. Remember, November 2011, 900 cities were occupied. The political power of space is too frequently ignored. Yet, I claim that their capacity for change is very limited. After mass protests marked the 60s in American and European cities, the cor corporate world and its established <laughs> allies kept pushing the disadvantage who were losing their right to the city, to the margins. Neo-capitalism did not become destabilized by the denunciations of the dispossessed, unable to ally with the discontented. That's us, May 68. We occupied the space, and we were rather powerful then. Powerlessness today comes from the fact that multifaceted wicked issues like inequality, racism, defy simple solutions. There is neither agreement on their nature nor on solutions. By essence, as Saskia said, the city is a frontier space between worlds ignoring each other. Take the migrants, the thought of migrants settling in neighborhoods where they are not welcome or landing on beaches where middle classes families take their back vacations in Greece, Italy, uh, or France comes to mind. And to quote Enzo, these mobile migrants with complex transnational identities are now facing political and cultural contexts in which social rights are weak and discriminatory and xenophobic practices are widespread. The capacity of not seeing them is illimited. And remember those two words, hospitality, it has the same roots as hostility. 
In the past 50 years, neoliberalism has reinforced itself. It has become anarchic with no one at the helm under strong winds. Yet it is in critical condition. The decline of economic growth, the rise of public indebtedness, the ascent of inequality of income and of wealth, feed rage and disenchantment. <clears throat> States are accused of being in the grip of money-making industries with an increasing stake in runaway financialization. In France, and I don't know about Italy, 60% of people think that political parties in no way contribute to the solution to, of their problems. So the political sphere needs to be reframed or even reinvented so that democratic societies based on citizens' rage, energy, and debates on the institutions that they want becomes possible. All institutions are indeed instruments which have transformed people into citizens. And to conclude, I would say that we need to rely as much on cities as on indignators and shouldn't wait for the current financial system to perish to act. If cities are more resilient than other systems, it is due as much to their capacity for adaptation and innovation as to their incomplete features. The more they are comfortable with uncertainty, allowing options to emerge, the less they feel threatened by it. Currently, they take the lead on global warming issues, early education, and on the migration crisis. So there are still numerous unknowns to be deciphered, however, and we need to understand emerging situations where they are still in flux and subject to influence. New patterns arise, and so do pictures of acute uncertainty, but, but with new concepts, categories, tools, methods, embryos of change that are already visible, may be tracked and questioned. Thank you very much. Um, well, I've shared with Enzo over a number of years an interest in the fields of welfare and migration, and intriguingly, these are two fields that have traditionally been treated separately in the intellectual division of labour. But there's a reason now for thinking of them more as occupying the same field. And this has become a pressing issue in Britain. Um, welfare and migration have been brought closer together by the comments of notably David Cameron, who's described them as two sides of the same coin. And uh, associated with this is the claim that we can't control welfare dependency without a reduction of migration. And this is what was launched as part of the famous austerity drive, where we've seen increased conditions and sanctions placed on welfare recipients um, with cuts and freezes used to promote labor market change with the aim of reducing demand for low-skilled labor um, and along with that, reducing the uh, recruitment of, of migrant workers and most particularly from Europe. Now, the political message in both of these fields has been quite explicitly a moral message of earned entitlement and there's been a moral mission of change associated with both fields which raises the question of how to build a unified frame of analysis. Um, and in fact, with the rise of increasing conditions and contractarian model of social rights, echoed by a drive for enhanced control over migration, it's no longer adequate to assess migrants' rights against citizens' rights with citizenship acting as the notional yardstick of full inclusion, 
without now turning corresponding attention to how far citizenship falls short of that promise of full inclusion. And this moves us onto the terrain of rights, not simply understood as formal legal entitlement, but rather as a social and political construction in a field of contestation. So that's been the impetus of my own work. Um, and in fact, the relationship between citizenship, migration and rights is by no means settled. Academic understanding of these relationships has shifted over time. So from Hannah Arendt, we had the conception of the right to have rights, which was an argument that only those with full membership of the polity actually had a means of claiming their inalienable human rights. This argument was reversed by post-national positions that felt national membership was seen to coexist with the presence of non-citizens who had a significant array of rights. And this was taken to herald a new and more universal conception of citizenship. But we've now seen a further reversal and we must now turn our attention to the erosion of citizenship rights, which can no longer be thought to function as a source of guaranteed inclusion. And even Marshall in his day observed that a stratified status was creeping into citizenship. Uh, and this observation actually foreshadowed a situation whereby rights function less as guaranteed inclusion than as a tool of governance. So in contemporary Britain, this governance has operated through increased conditionality and constraint as attached to a whole array of rights. And the promise of guaranteed inclusion for citizens has been all but eliminated, eliminated to the extent that there are now over one million people in Britain dependent on charitable food banks. So sociology has seen two challenges to Marshall's model. One from the inside with cuts, conditionality and surveillance attached to welfare for citizens. And one from the outside with arguments about the development of cosmopolitan or post-national society. But in fact, Neither of those ideals have, has ever approximated fulfillment, and they are both now simultaneously under challenge. So how do we approach this conceptually? My own work for some time has used the concept of civic stratification taken from David Lockwood. This refers to a system of inequality by virtue of rights granted or denied by the state has a formal dimension of inclusion or exclusion and has an informal dimension linked to what I think of in terms of moral standing in society. And in fact, this idea of moral standing or moral resources is very significant in Lockwood's model. He argues that moral resources indicate the ability to achieve one's aims through shared moral sentiment. What that means is there's a kind of dynamic of expansion built into his conception of rights. And claims to rights are then driven by the accrual of moral standing in society. But this model actually neglects to consider corresponding contraction. So how does the erosion of moral standing act as a prelude to the denial of rights. And that's what seems to me to have been happening in Britain. We've seen the operation of a declared moral mission uh, to replace welfare dependency um, with increased conditionality, tighter control of migration, to the extent that these two groups, welfare dependents and migrants, are set against each other all under the banner of a morality as fairness to the hardworking taxpayer. This is the recurrent slogan that we see. 
So we've seen contractions of rights for welfare recipients through cuts, freezes and conditionality linked to attacks on migrants as the cause of welfare dependency and also further paired with allegations of the abuse of free movement in Europe and the claim that the British benefit system has acted as a magnet for migration. And there is the core of the explanation for the Brexit result in the uh, referendum on EU membership, I would say. Can go a bit further in thinking about this with the notion of a moral economy. And this is, in this sense, not contestation from below, as in the original conception of a moral economy, but rather an imposition from above. And it rests on the idea that all economies rely upon some kind of underpinning moral frame. And in Britain, that moral frame has been driven by shrinking repertoires of desert that set migrants and lower class citizens in opposition to each other. Both groups have been deprived of moral leverage by a government discourse of abuse. And so we can see how civic stratification starts to offer the basis of a framework that can integrate analysis of both domestic welfare and transnational migration. We can see how a regime of rights is open to manipulation by the state in pursuit of policy goals, how the deterioration of moral standing leaves both migrants and welfare dependents vulnerable to the erosion of their rights. So an integrated analysis requires some documentation of formal entitlement, but also its relation to moral standing and the role of political discourse in the erosion of the moral standing of both groups. Thank you. Thank you so much. We now move to Marisol Garcia. <laughs> okay, good afternoon. Um, let me start by thanking very much the, the organizers uh, and editors of, uh, of the book for having done this <clears throat> wonderful work. And, uh, and of course to Enso for inspiring us through the years. And um, since I met Enso in 1988, I think, I was um, very struck by his um, emphasis on uh, social fragmentation. And so as, as a bit of a tribute to him, I, my, my contribution to, to, to the book uh, was about uh, one of the questions he put them and he continues to, to discuss about um, the social and political consequences of uh, social fragmentation. He already told us the, this morning about the, the main problem of, um, of this embeddedness and the, uh, and the market uh, logic and consequences of commodification. Um, I, I want to uh, emphasize very, very shortly about the political consequences, basically in Southern European countries and, and cities uh, in the context of austerity policies austerity in the European um, Union and European uh, continent had not been um, distributed equally, uh, partly because the previous uh, economic trajectories of every country. Uh, but Southern European countries have suffered uh, considerably. And one of the consequences of this austerity uh, policies uh, had been uh, the uh, flexibility or flexibilization of the job market and increasing job um, precarity uh, and unemployment basically affecting a, a whole set of uh, social groups, but uh, as, as I say, as a, as, as a concentrated group, um, sort of a young population which are better educated um, they have um, expectations as well as educational resources and social networks resources. 
So here we have this generation who, by the standards of what it would be uh, societies with some, as, as Lydia was saying, moral ground and citizenship understanding, will be participating in society. However, with the Great Recession and with the austerity programs following the, uh, the Great Recession, we, we find a tremendous frustration of opportunities for, for this uh, generation. So here I argue that this can be framed, going back to T.H. Marshall, in his uh, distinction between um, quantitative and qualitative inequalities. Quantitative inequalities is a matter of degree, but he said, well, qualitative inequalities is more drastic, it's a drastic differentiation um, that leaves some members of society feeling more at, at, at the borders, and somehow it touches their status. So my argument is that um, this new context for these uh, very frustrated, uh, let's say, opportunities uh, to, to, to their expectations had felt qualitatively uh, damage in terms of social inequality uh, for their prospects, their careers, the possibility to bring up families, etc. So they have actually, instead of uh, acting for or uh, for, bo for sorry for exit or loyalty, they have acted in terms of voice, and they have organized, and they had organized first of all in cities. So this is around 2011 when the whole Indignados movement appeared in the cities of Spain, Portugal, uh, Greece, also in northern cities, but a sort of a stronger uh, base in the southern European cities. And their claims were claims for uh, respecting social rights, uh, bringing back true democracy. I mean, one of, the, one of the calls were they don't represent us, you know. Uh, therefore, they were not only questioning uh, a social citizenship uh, damaging situation, they were also questioning democracy and political citizenship. And my argument is that these groups had managed to steer and to bring back the question of uh, the citizenship as participation. And they had not only brought up in cities, they have organized politically, and they had managed to occupy city councils, I mean, occupy, no, to get into local elections, occupy positions in city councils, regional councils, and in some cases, arrive to national parliaments. And that's the case in Portugal, it's a case in, uh, in Greece, it's a case in, uh, in, in Spain and Italy, but somehow, uh, it is an unequal, outcome of this political struggle that was born in city and scale up to other levels of government, in which in some instance, like the Portuguese case, uh, there is a capacity, has been a capacity to actually quite light with trade unions, and I think this is basic uh, difference, or in uh, the cases of Spain and Italy, there has been more a radicalization and in fact, politics against the social democratic parties, and well, in the case of Syriza, it's been an internal transformation. And my main argument is that uh, even in these movements, reaching politics and bringing back the, the question of citizenship are actually pushing for some alternative policies only by re-trying to enact the social contracts or trying to work something more comprehensive that can bring some real social change. No, um, no by acting, let's say, politically fragmenting. Thank you. It's going to be an amazing session. Never seen three speakers in a row that end before their time limit. It's fantastic. Now, Enrico Pugliese. Thank you. Okay. Um, the title of my presentation is uh, International Migrations and the Mediterranean. The first part of the title is uh, clear, uh, under clearly understandable. The second part is a little bit more complicated. 
what is the Mediterranean? Uh, why is it important to talk of the Mediterranean? Of course, we know the Mediterranean is uh, a sea uh, uh, which is divided in other smaller seas, Tirreno, uh, Ionian, but uh, according to the French school of the Annal, the Mediterranean is an historical actor, is a subject, is something more complex than just a space. It's more complex than just a space, and uh, a spa a sp a space is very difficult to, to be defined because it does not have a square point which is the same forever. Of course, Italy is in the midst of it, but Italy has, never, has not always been central does not have clear boundaries. Where is the Mediterranean? Sometimes the Mediterranean shrinks and it's just, you know, the coasts around the sea. Sometimes it goes east. And then you have, for example, the rule of the Ottomans on the Mediterranean. And they are pretty far away, you know, from the center of the Mediterranean. And um, so this fact that uh, it is never exactly the same thing. It is influenced by what's happening outside, but influences very much what's happening outside, even at a long distance. And this changes from time to time. And it's also a subject which can be very divided. First of all, uh, also the Mediterranean, you think, as a space goes left, was right to, was east to west and south to north. Uh, we, we see better, we see it north to south. If you see the Middle Age uh, uh, geographic cards, it goes from south to north. The south is on the top and the north is on the bottom. But another difference is we as Italians, for example, we think the Mediterranean is something that was only north-south, not east-west. Just the refugee crisis of two years ago made us think that the Mediterranean was something that... Uh, that could go also from east to west. Now, what's happening in, this, uh, in the most important and today's important uh, um, direction, south-north, is that while we are discussing about uh, Trump's wall against Mexico, we have a wall of water, which is the Mediterranean. That is, in the Mediterranean areas, which is much, much larger than the than the Mediterranean itself, we had the limes uh, up to the 50s, up to the, you know, Trans Glorious, that uh, crossed Italy. Eh? I mean, you had, uh, on the one hand, southern Italy, and then Spain, and then Greece, and then Portugal, and people migrate from, from southern Europe to northern Europe, central and northern Europe. Now the limes shift uh, south, and now we have the people moving from everywhere, but particularly today from Africa eh, through the Mediterranean route, the south-north Mediterranean route, uh, uh, and, uh, and the limits is the Mediterranean. Uh, this gives reason to the idea of, uh, the, uh, of the opportunity to apply to the migration studies the, the, I, the the schema, the, the theory of the long, long durée. You see it absolute, in a perfect way in terms of, uh, of uh, international migration. Uh, of course, some centuries of separation and of different relations between the North Shore and the South Shore have, uh, have enlarged the distance between the South and the North. Now the the distance has been shortened. Eh? Physically, the distance is the same. But uh, since 40 years you could go with 2000, it's in the last decades you could go from Tunis to Palermo with 20,000 lire, the equivalent of 10 euros, and now you can go with 50 euros. On the other end, you cannot go anymore because the frontiers are closed and the wall is crossed very often, but is crossed through uh, implying tragedies. What is the point of the relevance of the Brodelian view for migration? Is the fact that uh, 
all the Mediterranean countries of the southern shore, have, of the northern shore, they have the same migration model. That is, uh, I cannot, I have no time enough. The, the one minute there is wrong. It's, uh, it's no, no, five. No, 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 come. Uh, don't cheat, that. please. No, 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 I'm just getting ready. This is for me. Okay. Now. Uh, you have five minutes more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, the, I mean, a model has some, some features which are steady and consistent through time eh? and that are similar at all the parts in the case of some countries and all the, uh, in the case of the Mediterranean in all the countries that are part of the Mediterranean. So, consistent features, which are these features? Why there is something specific in this uh, uh, um, in this Mediterranean migration model, there are some features which in part are effect of historical contingency, like for example, migration today happens through closed frontiers. So you have to enter these countries illegally, practically. You know? In Italy, the majority of people that you find in Italy now as foreign people who, are, who were not born here enter the countries in an illegal way. And this is the same in Spain, is the same in Portugal, is the same in Greece. Some enter it also uh, legally, but it's uh, are a minority. This is the effect of a contingency. But there are some aspects that are really the effect of a tradition which have to do with la longue durée. Eh? Like, for example, family patterns. Family patterns which, by the way, are pretty similar also between the north and the southern shores. I am from Calabria and I know this very well. I discovered some, okay. Uh, and, uh, but particularly the, simi the, the similarities you find among the different southern Europeans, European, um, European countries. We have in Italy uh, the name for uh, a special name for the women immigrants uh, who are caregivers. Huh? Uh, we have not exported the model because the model existed also in the other Mediterranean countries. All Mediterranean countries are familist. I mean, it's part of the cultural uh, pattern of the Mediterranean. And uh, when, when it is the case to take care of the elderly, since the process of modernization, even women emancipation, has caused a loss of availability of labor, for, of, of labor, a loss of labor force available for uncommodified care within the family, then you have to buy with state money because you get the pension and then you buy the care on the international labor market and you have the care drain. The care drain, it's a phenomenon typical of the Mediterranean. And it's typical of the Mediterranean because the Mediterranean family, because of the long durée, eh, has this idea that you cannot put your aunt, your mother, your father in a, in a care house. You have to take care of them. Since you are not available, then you buy the service, which is commodified, but in a very peculiar way. This is one. The other aspect... The other, there are many other aspects I cannot enter into the details that show that how the similarities are not only effect of historical contingencies, but are effect of history. Apart, there is also nature. I mean, we have a, a, we have a, we have a Californian model of employment uh, of foreigners, but in the post fordist in, in the Fordist migration, practically there was not a employment in agriculture in Europe. They were industrial workers, so they worked in public work. Now they work in agriculture. We have a Californian model. And this has to do also with nature, but we also do also with the, with, the, with the agrarian regimes and things. To conclude, there is nothing to conclude because the story is very long. My idea is that uh, uh, these aspects have to be taken into account also to explain what's happening now. Italy has been able, in a way or in another, to manage international migration when it was strictly labor migration. Even refugees in Italy did not apply because it was too difficult to get the refugee status. So they waited for an amnesty, 
which we had each second year, with each fourth year in Italy. Now, uh, the situation is changed. I mean, uh, people came from everywhere in the world and they were all absorbed within this Mediterranean way of uh, managing immigration. But then the situation exploded with the so-called refugee crisis. With so-called refugee crisis, people, a new type of people arrives that uh, the Mediterranean countries of the northern shore are not able to deal with. Uh, you may have a spontaneous uh, grassroots type of solidarity which is expressed in a good way. We have solidarity even within the armed forces. The Italian, the Italian corp, uh, uh, mercantile uh, maritime, uh, Marina Mercantile, would you? Merchant, Merchant Navy. And, uh, and also military navy, eh? military have expressed the highest degree of solidarity with the immigrants. On the other hand, in the country, a kind of syndrome of invasion eh? is happening because these people who are arriving are people we, the Italians, and we, the Italian institution, and we, the Italian, um, the, the Italian public opinion, which is really need absolutely under attack from the political entrepreneurs of, uh, entrepreneurs of racism, eh, are not ready to manage with. And this is one of the most uh, focal points, not only in our nation, but also in the all other Mediterranean nations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I got a colleague in Trento when, when he is given 10 minutes, he usually speaks for 50, so it's wonderful to be here and see all the speakers that take the chair seriously. Thanks to everybody. Now, to the discussion, Fabio Passoli. I'm sorry. Why should I apologize? No. Uh, first of all, let me say that I'm truly honored to be, have been invited to this conference uh, where we are discussing a tribute to the scientific work of uh, Enzo Mingione. Um, I have been working with Enzo for more than 20 years. I learned a lot from him, both as a researcher and as a teacher. Uh, I could also appreciate his generosity in many occasions, and uh, finally, I firstly met most of the people who have been invited in this conference, thanks to Enzo, so thanks. <laughs> but coming to my role, I will try to provide a transversal interpretation of your chapter presentation, ma mainly chapters, uh, um, highlighting some common assumptions, issues, and conclusions. I will also refer to some specific arguments you have focused on in your chapters, and finally, I will add some issue, an issue mainly, about which I will be glad to listen to your replies. Um, a common starting point of your presentation that is, again, totally consistent with what is discussed in Enzo Mingione chapters in the book, concerns the disruptive power of contemporary capitalism, uh, driven by the accelerating pace of technological innovation, the growing financialization of the world economy, by a complex, omnipresent, and digitalized global communica communication network, that allows for a growing deterritorialization of societal processes and borrowing from Bauman an essential fluidification of any kind of human relations. At the same time, all of you pointed out the role played by, <clears throat> uh, toward the recent welfare crisis uh, by the predominance in both North America and Europe uh, of a neoliberal political ideology that has been promoting over the last decades, on one hand, a cost and weakening of regulatory measure implemented by the state to control the action of the market and to redistribute the wealth generated through capital, basically capitalistic labor relations. And on the other hand, the reconfiguration of the system of protections provided by the variety of welfare regimes that were built during the Tronco Glorieuse. Another relevant issue that is very much present in your analysis concerns the transformation of citizenship, uh, that you investigated at different scales, transnational, national, local, and urban, local urban, mainly, and from, different, uh, from five different perspectives. Uh, a juridical one that has to do with uh, the former rights granted to those who are recognized uh, by some government body as full citizens, full citizens uh, of uh, a state, uh, or not, uh, the denizen, for instance. Uh, I'm thinking here, uh, especially to the chapter uh, by Lydia Morris, a political perspective concerning those who are socially defined and perceived 
to all intents and purposes uh, as part of the national or local political community. And those who are put outside any politic, of course, a perspective that is present in Lydia Morris, uh, Marisol Garcia, and Enrico Puglia's chapters. A bureaucratic perspective, uh, Lydia Morris again, uh, regarding the role played by the implementation of social policies in effectively granting social rights. So not only formal, but uh, what happened when uh, measure and rights are uh, granted to people and the policies are implemented. A conflictual perspective where the main actors uh, are social movements promoting political, mostly urban mobilization, aimed at redefining what citizenship should be. Uh, I'm referring particularly to Sophie Bodijandro and Marisol Garcia chapter now. And last but not least, there's something that has to do with the urban spatial dimension when a symbolic redefinition and reappropriation or maybe a production of new urban, new urban spaces are at stake as it is stressed again in your two chapters uh, by Sophie Bergendra and Marcel Garcia. Uh, talking about citizenship uh, put almost automatically in the foreground the issue of international immigration, an issue that is central in both Lydia Morris and Enrico Puglia's chapters. Uh, since most of the challenges that have been posed to what we can call traditional definition of citizenship comes from the way both national and transnational governmental bodies define the path for the incorporation, inclusion, insertion, integration, of the newcomers into existing political communities. I use on purpose four categories as I was asked to uh, discuss even a, fi a, a fifth chapter by um, uh, Jean-Claude Barbier, who is not here, but I refer also to his chapter, uh, in order to hint to the relevance uh, of a critical analysis of the conceptual toolbox we use to address such complex and delicate social processes. I'm following here Jean-Claude Barbier chapter, who Drawing again from the seminal work done by Enzo Mingione on concepts such as underclass, new urban poverty, and social exclusion, uh, say that our main categories should be handled very carefully since they bear a heavy political and ideological burden that can lock up sociological interpretation into the national, cultural, and political context in which social scientists live and, works, live and work, strongly limiting their, the sharpness of their analysis. If I have time, I will come back to this point in the final part of my discussion. The link between immigration and the reconfiguration of citizenship rights bring us back to the change, changes that are affecting welfare policy in Western <laughs> countries. As Lydia Morris clearly highlighted, addressing the British case, immigration and welfare transformations, contraction or contractualization, contractization, sorry, uh, contract, yeah. Uh, should be analyzed through a common analytical frame because uh, the redefinition of social rights for the domestic population has been taken place together with stronger control of Im on immigration and asylum seeker mobility. Moreover, the restriction over the condition of entry and residence for international migrants and the former reconfiguration of citizenship rights has been accompanied by discourses on the moral standing of particular groups, uh, migrants above all, that rely upon the same repertoire of moral categories deserving and undeserving that have been used to address, classify, and treat, and evaluate uh, uh, welfare recipients. To keep on my attempt to summarize what your chapter have in common, I would like to introduce another issue that is implicitly, uh, explicitly sorry, stressed by both Sophie Bodigendro and Enrico Pugliese, and that could be relevant for many of your arguments, in my opinion, and that, by the way, is, my, my, is uh, one of my current field of research. It concerns security policies and discourse, and more broadly, a process that can operate at different scales, and that we can define borrowing from the Copenhagen School as sec securitization. Uh, let's start with the urban level, recalling, recalling that uh, despite the fact that public discourse uh, on governing urban security traces back to the development of modern city, the recent growing urbanization of security has generated both new specific problems, risks, and new kinds of people behavior that need to be governed. As far as Italy is concerned, for instance, uh, over the last two decades, many crucial issues regarding the governance of the governor, governance of metropolitan areas, uh, traffic, immigration, work, pollution, criminality, of course, uh, peripheries, and even freedom of religious expression have been reframed thanks to the partially new semantic uh, umbrella of urban security. In many official discourse, the complex issues of urban coexistence and city government have been dealt with identifying a, spe a specific threat 
against security, sorry, against which urgent and exceptional measure have been solicited, thus underpinning a process of securitization. Besides, insofar as issues concerning urban security, disorder, and crime came into view and made a fast career in public debate, in public discourse on city governance, the securitization of broader sector, sectors of urban life has been accomplished through a shift from a conception of, of urban policies center or on social problems that calls from social policy to a different one that sooner or later ends up being centered on situational prevention and criminalization of urban problems, uh, conflicts, and groups. Drawing from the work by Robert Castell, we can state that the balance between civil and social security shifted dramatically to the benefit of the former, at least in the last few decades. As far as the relationship between neoliberal governance and security policy is concerned, a useful insight has been provided by David Garland, who has highlighted the spread of a culture of control defined by a shift in criminal justice from penal welfareism to an orientation center on crime control, which implies a decline of the rehabilitated, rehabilitative ideal and the renewal of punitive segregation. In the same framework, attention to the interest of the victims increases proportionately. And where an individual victim cannot be, identi cannot be identified, the existence of a sort of collective victim, that is the local community with its standard of life, quality of life, is often invoked. Thus, the new culture of control relies upon a conception of a community whose identity is defined in purely negative terms. Because social bonds are supposedly created through collective victimization, and whose borders are defined by referring to the threats raised by constant waves of incivilities and deviant criminal behaviors. However, insofar as a sense of community does not rely on a process of social and cultural integration, but on a collective shock, those who commit crimes or behave improperly perform the crucial function of reconnecting people and places <clears throat> through the defense of a territory, usually uh, public urban spaces. If we change scale and consider migration control policies at the European Union level, we can say that over the last three decades, migration has been mostly linked in official documents, normative provision, political statements at the European Union level, of course, to representation of societal dangers. According to Jeff Huisman, as a technocratic, a politically manufactured spillover of an economic project of the European Union internal market, immigration and asylums have been integrated into a policy framework that defines and regulates security issues arising from the abolition of internal border control. The fear that the free circulation of people and goods inside the Schengen area would not only improve the free movement of law-abiding agents, but would also facilitate illegal and criminal activities by terrorists, international crime organizations, as well as by asylum seekers and migrants. It was in one of the pillars of the Schengen Treaty, explicitly stated. Since the early 80s, discourses that were already circulating at national level, mostly among the political and technocratic elites, and that represented migration and asylum as a security question, had penetrated the Europeanization of migration policies and found a sounding board in the European meetings and documents, thus reinforcing and legitimizing national debates. Uh, very quickly, those discourses promoted a rather scary and disturbing representation of the European Union that was acutely synthesized by Saskia Sassen through the metaphor of Fortress Europe. As I already mentioned, security policy is a specific policy of mediating belonging. Indeed, the political and social identification of a community and its way of life develop in response to an existential threat. Such a process excludes, by definition, migrants from the normal fabric of society, not just as aliens, but as aliens who are dangerous to the reproduction, the reproduction of the same social fabric. The discourse frames the key question about the future of the political community as one of a choice for or against immigration. But, of course, it is not a free choice because a choice for immigration is represented as a choice against the survival of the political community. In the last issue of, the, of Ethnic and Racial Studies, Catherine Vittol de Venden uh, wrote a, that controlling the European Union borders, uh, the external European Union borders, in particular through the externalization of, of border control to migrants' country of origin and transit, uh, allows us to circumvent the liberal paradox. As far as migrants are preventing to cross the European Union borders, we do not have to cope with the paradox between effort adhering to human rights on the one hand, and those controlling the migrant population on the other hand. 
Together with this first, first paradox, she points out a second one, a welfare paradox, which holds that there is a tension between social rights for all <clears throat> on the one hand and the deregulation of social and labor rights and standards as part of a liberalizing global economy on the other. The hypothesis here is that uh, a decrease in immigration lead to fewer forced migrants competing with established non-migrants for public services and jobs, uh, and welfare provision, of course. However, as many research states, <clears throat> sorry, as many research have demonstrated, the representation of forced migrants as exploiting generous welfare states and competing in labor market does not necessarily comes out from high or and or increasing numbers of mobile border crossers. Restrictive policies in themselves harden the image of migrants as potential economic competitors. Besides, following an argument, an argument by Lydia Morris in her chapter, we can add that citizenship rights restrictions for migrants today points out an ongoing change that tomorrow will concern everybody, foreign as well as domestic uh, <coughs> citizens. A problem that was addressed long ago by Abdel Malek Sayyad when uh, he talked about the mirror effect of migration. A final observation concerned the need to critically appraise the vocabulary. Uh, yeah. How many? Stop. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, I can stop here. <laughs> I'll skip my last point, uh, but we can discuss it later. No, okay. <laughs> I didn't mean, I didn't mean I so abruptly. Order. Sorry? I didn't mean so abruptly. Ah, so abruptly. Want... So, well, okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> if you give me two time. more minutes, I can, okay. Mauro <laughs> Magatti. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me to this seminar. Well, I met Enzo 30 years ago. At that time, I had a degree in economics and I wanted to become a sociologist. So Enzo suggested me to, to read and study Carpolani, <laughs> which in fact is still nowadays one of my favorite authors. In an age uh, of instability, I appreciate the fact that Enzo is still loyal to his original inspiration. And in this book we are discussing today, is still going back to the double movement, uh, disembedding and reembedding, as the central analytical tool to interpret contemporary capitalism and its transformation. In fact, neoliberalism may be interpreted as a doctrine disconnected economy from society, synthetically expressed by the so-called trickle-down effect. And in fact, the neoliberal form of capitalism has been extremely effective in fragmenting social life, establishing its own hegemonic view over the entire society. Through individualistic consumerism, neoliberalism succeeded in establishing its own disorder, even among groups which supported the negative effects of its own disorder. As a matter of fact, fragmentation, a different word to say disembedding, is an analytical and not simply a descriptive word. In this framework, I would like to make two general points which come to my mind reading the five chapters we are commenting in this session. The chapters show that during neoliberalism, the re-embedding process has been rather weak for at least two main reasons. The first is that re-embedding has mainly to do in this period with marginality and informalization, as for example in the migrant communities or in the urban peripheries and slums. Generally speaking, uh, the re-embedding processes have impacted in the local communities and in the informal economy uh, as a surviving strategy unable to change the social equilibrium. Above all, re-embedding has been detached from any idea of change or of social transformation. 
The second reasons come from the uncertain relationship between disembedding and social conflict. On one hand, the disembedding has been so deep to block even social conflict. After 2008, we saw a few examples of citizen upsurge in a few cities, but this was a limited process and we saw protest rather than conflict. That is, protest means no view about change in the long run, uh, as, as we listened before. On the other hand, re-embedding has been a strategy to build defensive strategies used by some social groups against others. For instance, in the gated communities or in the uh, reaction against migrants communities uh, manifested in the last years in many cities. Uh, this observation uh, led me to a general consideration. I agreed with Enz and Polanyi that the disembedding process tends to create its own the reaction. And cities will be the place, are the places where changes tend to occur. But we should consider that the two, that is the disembedding and reembedding, as a polarity which establishes a field of tensions rather than a, uh, a two-step process. Uh, and uh, in this polar field, we see uh, dynamic and unstable uh, equilibria, which may be catched by the notion of Simon Don of metastability. That is, I suggest to use differently the relationship between disembedding and reembedding. When there is disembedding, certainly a reembedding process is stimulated, but in a sense, this is to say nothing. In fact, what this perspective suggests is the problem that is the concrete nature of this process, which may take very different forms. The second point I would like to make here concern the analytical level the re-embedding process has to be applied. In Polani approach, re-embedding has to do mainly with social ties and reciprocity. But in fact, re-embedding may take place at a higher level, that is, at a political level. And this is a crucial aspect to be considered. In the last 10 years, that is after the 2008 crisis, something started happening. After the crisis, the basic movement in social life has changed direction. What is going on is an attempt to reestablish a more stable relationship between economy and society, as Trump demonstrated. This shows that re-embedding may involve very different directions. At stake nowadays, in this post-2008 phase, there is now social bond. But this may be regressive rather than progressive. That is, I am saying that re-embedding is not positive in se. May be, on the other side, very problematic. From this point of view, I think that we should have a more complex theory of re-embedding dynamic, uh, much more complicated than uh, Polanyi's ones. And these two points I made, that is, what is the analytical level of this re-embedding, this embedding process, and uh, uh, the, the first question about what is the relation between the two. They create a polar field uh, or, 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 what, or whatever. Thank you very much. Now we have time for a round of responses from the speakers. Let's try to keep it to four or five minutes at the most. Who was first? Uh, Sophie? Um, well, I think I, I take what uh, Fabio was uh, reminding us about the reappropriation of a space, an urban space. Um, I think one of these phenomena is perhaps comes across not only what I refer to, the political organization, especially of the young population in southern European cities, but I think also relates to migrants 
and also to other also social conflicts. So perhaps we can talk more about this reappropriation of urban spaces. Um, there has been this argument um, among many people about how under the right to the city has been like a sort of a slogan in which many organizations had come uh, back, claiming back uh, the, the city and claiming urban citizenship. And I think urban citizenship has been instrumental at least in, we know from Canadian cities, also for migrants, because there are some social and, and civic rights that it gets more difficult to get at the national level. They can start operating at the local level. So perhaps it is worthwhile to remember that a way back, as, as Enzo was commenting today, in actually reenacting the state, is, uh, is a different kind of state, is a more collaborative state with civil society and solidarity groups and social reciprocity, and that takes place in, in cities. So this um, creation of urban spaces may or may not lead to political uh, spaces, which goes back to, 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 to my argument. Um, the question is that I will put again in, on, the, on the table how fragmented that politics still is, uh, because the alliances between all the from, the, from the radical left to the left, to the social democratic solutions, to the conservatives, I think, uh, is still very, very problematic. So is it perhaps a way to create uh, a new enactment of citizenship, sort of bottom up? And I think it's happening very much at the organization and innovative practices. And in that sense, these new um, youth organizations and these social movements have been very effective. My, my, my contention is about when they trying to do national politics without, without the cooperation with traditional workers' unions. So perhaps, you know, it's going back to to the question that you, you, you were putting now, this sort of re-embeddedness, but what happens with traditional organizations would have been diminishing their power? And with that diminishing power, how can we force regulations on the, the state? Because the, uh, the state is still there and it has a function. Whether there is a for redistribution or pre-redistribution, uh, still I think it has a function. Uh, I'll just pick up on the point about embedding, disembedding. I've puzzled over this myself. Um, and I'm inclined to agree with you that there's, there's an assumption that the re-embedding only happens in a particular way, whereas if I look at my own argument and the sort of material that I've been researching and particularly in relation to political discourse I'm kind of inclined to say there's a re-embedding from above and this is partly what's intended by this reformulation of the notion of moral economy um, whereby there's a morality implicit in a political position and this is the, the, the political task is then to embed that in the, the general populace. Um, and, and so, yeah, I'd be interested in trying to develop that further conceptually. Um, so I think you were suggesting that, that re-embedding can happen at a higher level than local interactions, reciprocity, social networks. I, th I think that's an interesting idea and the, the, the scope to take it further. Um, but then the question arises, I suppose, and this is, I think, what Marisol was gesturing to when she talks about fragmentation. Um, is there an alternative way? Where, where would the alternative values come from in that scenario? Um, some people have looked to universals, um, although that certainly with respect to social rights, the purchase of universal standards has been very slight. So you're looking to ways to build, build bonds across groups which have been 
systematically <coughs> divided, and it's what Enrico's talking about, I think, as well. Um, but it did strike me when preparing my own work, um, you know, it begs the question, could this be put together in a different way? So, you know, I gave you the, the moral message of the Cameron government. Is there another message? Well, I mean, the first thing of interest is that actually the, the position that has been adopted in Britain has no foundation in official empirical data. There's no support for it. The economy is desperate for migrants. Migrants do not claim disproportionately from the welfare system. And indeed, British citizens do not disproportionately abuse the welfare system. So all of this actually can be empirically challenged. Furthermore, the groups have a number of things in common. So deteriorating standards of employment affect all groups. The erosion of welfare standards affect all groups. The increased level of surveillance and control affect all groups. Massive deterioration in local authority spending affect all groups. So here is possibly an alternative moral economy for a re-embedding of, of values, but um, you know it needs the it it needs the mechanism. For, to bring those things together. Um, I try to express in a more clear way what I intended to <clears throat> tell in the last part of my presentation uh, with the uh, a premise. When uh, uh, I was writing this uh, uh, contribution, Enzo Mingione was uh, writing uh, his uh, uh, essay on uh, the double movement. He did not know that uh, this would have been used for his celebration. But uh, what I remember that uh, uh, I like this idea of work on the dual movement. Uh, the Polanyi's dual movement, and uh, I understood, I assumed, uh, on the basis of my, well, on the basis of the reading of the, basically, of the Great Transformation, but particularly of what uh, Enzo was uh, writing at the time, that uh, put it in a very trivial way, this embeddedness was bad, was when, you know, the penetration of the market destroyed the society and the uh, blah, blah, and the re-embedment was well, a good thing. Uh, even, and so, in a way, Lydia, as it uh, very often happens uh, for me in uh, uh, studying her work, is able to add something new in the analysis and not foreseen before. Today, she introduces the concept of uh, the embeddedness from above. The embeddedness from above is a bad thing. It's not a good thing. It's the, the dark side of re, uh, of re embedding. And uh, uh, she has done the same, uh, the same um, operation on another concept today. We were talking of this when we were coming in the taxi here. That is the moral economy. For me, the concept of moral economy was uh, something that concerned the good, solidaristic values of the peasantry. The moral economy of the peasantry was an economy which assumed that you, that there was not only the law of the supply and demand, that you had some moral responsibilities in dealing economic affairs. This was the traditional understanding of the anthropologist of the moral economy of the peasantry, the only moral economy that I knew. Now, Lydia presents to us another understanding of the moral economy, which maybe would have been better defined moralistic, uh, moralistic economy. That is that from above, you, have, you, have, you are given a frame 
whereby, according to traditional mainstream neoliberal values, you have to act economically. This is the new moral economy. That is quite exactly the opposite of the moral economy of the patient in the way we had learned. And, uh, but uh, since everybody has uh, uh, worked on the double, uh, uh, on the double movement uh, and Denso's understanding of the double movement, uh, I want to do the same thing that is reading uh, two sentences, a short sentence, sentence of, Marie, of Maurice Aymar and a, and a sentence by Enzo showing how for the understanding of Mediterranean migration within a Brodelian, that is, frame of the long durée, it is, you may understand, uh, I mean, the, you may see how the double movement is fruitful for uh, uh, describing these processes. Aymar writes, the past of the Mediterranean, the past, is, bet, is here to remind us that everything is possible, war as well as peace, the refusal as well the acceptance of the other and the search for dialogue, the crusade as well the coexistence, the closure of the borders as well as the valorization of the role played, played by the various networks helping the various colonies and minorities, which is exactly what's happening in the Mediterranean now with the refugee crisis. And this is quite exactly the coexistence of a movement of disembeddedness and disembeddedness. In fact, our mentor Minjon writes, <laughs> this is, uh, the tendency toward disembeddedness is dominating now. Reembeddedness, uh, on the contrary, is creating a new social bond. bond. Since, uh, as Minjone writes, these people on the move, the migrants, hmm? I lost it. Huh? No. <laughs> The refusal of the other and the acceptance of the other and the search for dialogue is a clear expression of a double movement constituted simultaneously. The point here is not that there is the age of embeddedness and the age of disembeddedness, or better, the age of disembeddedness and then the age of embeddedness as in the Great Transformation. Is that the two movements are simultaneous, as Minjone writes, and that, because there is two parts, this embedding motion activated by the competitive market and the re-embedding motion activated by the necessity to create new social bonds and social protections in order to keep societies alive. If this is, this, this, and this is, if this is re-embeddedness, this is contradictory to the process of re-embeddedness from above. No, Lydia, no. Uh, is is Mijone's point? Uh, is this? <laughs> allora, Mijone writes: a double movement constituted simultaneously by two parts. This abandoning motion activated by the competitive market forces and the re-embedding motion activated by the necessity to create new social bonds and social protections in order to keep society alive. Can this be consistent with the re-embeddedness from above? With the re-embeddedness from above. Re-embeddedness. Ah, sorry. Um, it's... It's a conflict, isn't it? Well, it's, it's a battle. But, but the battle, well, who fights the battle from below? Um, I mean, this is Mary Sol's point, I think, about the, um, the decline of traditional political organizations. Um, I mean, insofar as I'm exploring this myself, I'd be looking to third sector organizations and 
um, looking to their interventions, both the content and the mode of intervention. Um, uh, whether that can translate into uh, an alternative moral economy, if you like, uh, you know, is an empirical question. Um, shall I carry on talking? <laughs> um, we would... Uh, no, no, it, it's a different topic. Um, well, yeah, okay, I'll just finish the point. So, I mean, we began to talk about this earlier as, as well. You know, I would look at what is the mode of contestation and what's the scope for contestation and what are the potential audiences that could be engaged. And so do you then have a reversal of conceptions of moral standing? Do you, do you, do you um, re moralize, if you like, or revalorize the groups that have been devalorized. I mean, they are the dynamics that I would look towards. So I don't think Enzo's comment is in contradiction, but it does point to an inevitable conflict. Yes, so finally, um, I would like to come back to how uh, this morning Enzo pointed at uh, causes for pessimism, of course. We are intellectuals, supposedly, and we are pessimistic by nature, uh, but also optimism. And I completely share this, this uh, view. And if I uh, go back to what you said, Fabio, and I completely agree with you, it's true that now we are under a regime of um, securitization and uh, uh, we, we uh, witness a, an urbanization of, of security with a distribution of statuses and a lot of uh, liberties being jeopardized in the name of, uh, of uh, security, mediating, belonging, uh, and, uh, and so on. So, um, and the future of the city is, is often thought from above. But however, I also find causes for optimism because um, as Robert Sampson said a long time ago, and even before him, uh, uh, Cloward and Piven, uh, lower stratum, uh, people are not without capacity and uh, the powers that be better uh, listen and react. Uh, they have uh, presence and they have numbers and they can be heard. And uh, being a French, I can testify for that. After the terrible terrorist attacks we France experienced uh, two years ago, four million people uh, walked through the streets to defend their values and they were extremely heterogeneous, but they shared conviction that they would not let this uh, uh, jeopardize what they believed in. And there are many, many, especially at the moment also in France, with a lot of challenges, we could have yielded to pessimism, but a lot of grassroots is, uh, uh, movements are going on, and uh, they, they, for the young generation, uh, they give us hope, because as we said uh, previously, the future is not written yet. We live in an instantaneous um, perception due to the media and the social media, and we react to now, now, and then, and here. But in fact, we should really think in the long term, in the 30 or 40 years to come, and we have a lot of things that we are not with, uh, forcing uh, at this moment that may happen. And this uh, may necessar not necessarily be a cause for pessimism. Thank you. Okay. There is. <laughs> I, mean, I think uh, I, I would like to close by thanking all the speakers and uh, also thanks to the organizer for inviting me to chair this session. It's been a privilege, uh, a great pleasure to have the opportunity to celebrate Enzo Mignone's work and also to chair what has been quite uh, an extraordinary session. We, it's finished, we finished on time and there was even some serious discussion between the panelists, which we very rarely happens in this event. So thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for being with us.
take a seat. We are going to begin. After the four presentation, there will be also uh, a short time for question. So we will have uh, a microphone going through the audience for the uh, uh, possibility of having question to our speakers. So get your question ready. Good afternoon. It's really a pleasure to welcome you back to the last section of the day. Uh, I will try to be short and efficient. Uh, we have four uh, contribution, and this is a session that is supposed to be focused more on city, on speciality and materiality. We have four presentation and four very distinguished speakers. Uh, we'll start with uh, Richard Sennett. Um, actually, I'm very curious about Richard Sennett presentation because I read the chapter and I think I didn't understand properly the, all that he said. Um, I think it's a very interesting uh, chapter and, and, uh, in which he draws an original parallel between playing a, 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 a music instrument and making sense of the city, making the effort of um, giving meaning and, uh, and uh, um, having a sense of, of the space in the city. Uh, so it, it will uh, hopefully clarify some passages that for, for my, in, my own ignorance about playing an instrument, I may have not gotten so clearly. Um, he also maintained that uh, the engagement uh, of playing a musical instrument can tell us a lot about our engagement with the physical space and the physical space of the city, the way we make sense of the space we live in, the constraint and, and the opportunity that this space offers for making sense of uh, uh, life. <coughs> Second, we, were, we will uh, uh, listen to Patrick Legales presenting a chapter about the current dynamics of large city in Europe. Um, it takes an original stance in, uh, in this analysis because it showed the robust resilience of European city vis-a-vis -vis the impact of globalization. Uh, Patrick confronts some common ideas such as the death of the European city model or the Americanization of our city, and uh, it charts in, in, an original interpretation, more nuanced interpretation of what is going on in our city. Uh, also, the variation that is in the title reflect to his interpretation and discussion about the exception to the trends that he has uh, singled out. And uh, so he discussed the city, which shows um, as exemplary, uh, as example of the trends he identified, and also the one that di differentiate from this common trend. Then we have a contribution from uh, Marco Berti and, and Mon Presay. Uh, and uh, in uh, this contribution, they will look at the changes in the social structure of European cities, uh, showing that the notion of social class, which at the moment is not very popular, but um, they show how, how useful is still to engage in social class analysis in the interpretation of what are uh, the transformation of the social structure and the segregation patterns that reflect the new uh, social structure. I think it's particularly interesting in, a, in uh, their chapter, the analysis of segregation of privileged group, because we tend to look at segregation as the way pe uh, poor people are confined in specific deprived area. 
uh, looking at segregation of uh, privileged groups also gives you gives us an entrance on uh, um, the impact of that particular kind of segregation in the city. Finally, Enrica Morlicchio uh, will use the city of Naples, which is uh, a quite uh, interesting uh, city in, il in Italy, as an example of the innovative and spontaneous uh, form of solidarity and community alliances that are, pro are in, in the process of being produced in our city. And so we will end with a more op optimistic um, view of what is going on and, and uh, uh, remarks about the future of the city that open up new hopes for the city themselves. Thank you very much, and I give you the floor to Richard Sennett. No, Richard is uh, postponing because... It's ah, okay. I, it disappeared. It oh. Okay, okay. So I give the floor to Patrick. Yeah. Let me. Yep. Good evening, and um, apologies for arriving late. Uh, in this chapter, I want to pay tribute to the great political economy of cities and territories that has been developed in Italy, with different traditions, different current, but clearly the work of Enzo together with some of his colleagues like Bagnasco and Trigilia and many other ones, remain as a very important intellectual tradition to understand what is going on in territory based upon some old-fashioned discipline called political science and sociology and economic sociology. In many ways, I think this is important to remind that because nowadays in urban studies, the dominant group, our friend from critical urban studies, they are rather inspired by French philosophers, often dead, uh, in order to think about, you know, gentrification, changing the world, massive urbanization, Henri Lefebvre and urbanization explaining everything, cities play no role whatsoever. I think what we have in this tradition of research, which may be more relevant in Europe than elsewhere, is trying to articulate transformation of capitalism and urbanization on the one hand, but also the deep social transformation of European societies, often based on some territory. So I think this is the core of what I want to argue, that we keep, we have to articulate those two and to keep this uh, tradition, which implies that you have to do a lot of empirical work in depth and using all sorts of methodology. And again, I'm a little bit upset sometimes to look at all these papers on the transformation of cities in Europe of elsewhere, where you are explained that it's a matter of assemblage, post-politics, uh, neoliberalism, of course, always neoliberalism, and this explains everything without specifying the mechanism and with very weak empirical evidence. So let me pay tribute to this, to this Italian um, tradition. Second point is we all argue that something is going on with the transformation of capitalism and both with the transformation of finance, of the scale of globalization, of technologies, of changing societies of migration, a lot of pressure are exerted on, on various cities and on the urban world altogether. So what is going on is a big issue and a big question. Plus, we have had in Europe more than in some other parts of the world, more than in Latin America or Asia, a very deep economic crisis since 2008. That has been an opportunity for a lot of restructuring of various elements of European societies. So my question is, what happens to European cities? Um, some years ago, 15 years ago or something, I uh, was part of a group that tried to identify a particular model of European cities based upon very strong policy, lots of politics, public-private partnerships, strong legitimacy, a lot of robust welfare state, uh, middle class and lower middle class of the public sector, a particular kind of collective actor and agency that made huge transformation and that led to very strong dynamism of those European cities, mainly mostly regional capitals from 300,000 to two or three million inhabitants. And this, as we know, this model is a long-term model that has characterized European societies. The book was finished by saying there's two scenarios now. What happens? Scenario one is a scenario put forward by new economic geography and trade economists. And they have told us 
that when you create a space for a big market, you have a relocation of economic activity. So therefore, over 30 or 40 years, the making of the EU and the rise of you know, more economic relations in Europe should lead to a transformation of European space a bit like the US, with two big metropolis like, I don't know, Istanbul and London, and a carnage of middle-sized city. So the European model was seen as obsolete in the world of Castells, completely marginalized, not competitive with Shanghai or Los Angeles. The alternative scenario was to argue that maybe uh, mid-sized cities with a strong social dynamics and political capacity, there will be some capacity for this European model to adapt and to transform over time. So in many ways, the, European, the crisis of 2008 and the 10 years since, eight years since, was a great opportunity to see what is going on in European cities because of the strength of the economic crisis. So what do we know? What happened over the last uh, 10 years or so with, when you look at European cities? And again, we have a, a quite a literature uh, arguing that the mix of crisis, neoliberalism and everything explain that this model is going down the tube uh, with massive cuts and, and everything. The problem is it's not what is going on. So I'm using um, some of the figures from the, uh, the EU as on the state of European cities, which for the first time is using new statistics and a lot of very, very good group of researchers. So it's, I recommend this document. I rarely recommend EU literature, but you, know, you should do that. So what do we know about what has happened in Europe? Point one, um, European cities are doing very well on average. On average, okay, average. Uh, the robustness of the model has been quite remarkable. When you look at these mid-sized cities, these regional capitals, the bulk of European cities, on average, you have a remarkable growth in economic terms, in demographic terms mostly, and more importantly, the gap between those cities and the rest of the country is increasing. So um, life expectancy is growing in cities. Poverty is less important in cities than in the rest of Europe. The productivity is increasing dramatically in the bulk of European cities by contrast to the national model. So there's an effect of metropolization which is benefiting a lot from European cities. So basically, despite the crisis, the model is remaining remarkably robust by many, many accounts, including politically, where all the indicators of local autonomy except in the UK, are showing increased capacity for local actors to develop some policies. But there are three strong nuances or even counterfactuals to this general story. The first one is that it's not true everywhere. The model itself is less encompassing. What we see in Oriental Europe is that outside the national capital, most of regional cities and capitals are in decline and shrinking cities are also taking place in eastern Germany. So it's one part of Europe where beyond the national capital, the rest of the territory is rather declining in urban terms. The second, of course, is the south of Europe and the story of the south of Italy, of Spain and Greece most dramatically, where all the austerity measures have led to much more difficult situations. And the third one is the continuous decline of old industrial city particularly small one, and mid-sized, like 50,000 industrial cities are in sharp decline all over Europe, and in particular in the old industrial cities. So there's a story which remains pretty robust, but with those strong nuances, three important set of nuances and counterfactual that should be uh, taken in mind. However, keep that in mind. When we look at all this transformation, this model is remaining robust. Second empirical element to keep in mind is, you know, we have neoliberalism, we have welfare cuts, and God knows we, we think there's too many inequalities and we're interested to study that. But the story of Europe is not a story of massive inequalities increasing over the last 10 years. And Marco and Edmo will say something. I was this summer with Edmo at the AASA in Montreal, and when Edmo explained that social segregation was very problematic but relatively stable in France, American colleagues could not believe it. But Europe is not the US. Can I repeat? Europe is not the US. So when you look at the evolution of public expenditure and welfare expenditure in Europe, what you see is no massive cuts. It is small cuts in a few cases and a rather very strong stability or increase since 2008. 
So stop arguing that massive welfare cuts everywhere. No, it's stable with some pressure, small decrease in some cases. Surprisingly, because I'm an old-style Weberian, I think urban policy and public policy matter. Surprisingly, when you look at the Gini coefficient and the increase of inequality, both in cities and at the national level, surprise, surprise, what do we see? Well, both inequality increase massively in the Baltic state and in the two or three countries more hit by the crisis. But in the mass majority of European countries, income inequality is either stable or reducing in most European countries. Because of what? Because of a lot of public policy and welfare state and housing policy. So we are in Europe in a situation where we don't know which way we're going to move. Maybe in 10 years, the picture will be different. But so far, please stop arguing that we have massive welfare cut, neoliberalism is transforming the world, and everything is changing fast. This is not what is going on. Fourth, three, third type of evidence, when you look at figures related to homicides, violence, life expectancy, and those kinds of figures, you realize that the rate of homicide in cities, a very good indicator for violence and social relations, is going down dramatically in most European cities since 2002, except in the Baltic state. The rate is between one, it's four or five times more in US cities. By the way, the rate of incarceration of people, except in England, is relatively stable in Europe as well. So there is no turn of punitive state. Our friend Rick Wacon is completely right about the US. He's probably in part right about the UK. He's completely wrong about Europe. So we are a strange place where those elements. I'm not arguing that poverty has increased. We have 25% at risk of poverty. We have more discrimination and poverty problems with immigrants. We have lots of problems to solve. But the bulk of the European model still today has not collapsed. And that has very strong implication both on the type of cities we have, on the social composition, on the type of inequalities we have to deal with, and on the future of the model. To conclude um, on my little um, argument on these things, I want to argue uh, that, of course, there are a number of issues that are at stake. And one of the for me, most important issue is the fact that what we see in the U.S., like in Europe, like in the U.S., is reduction of social mobility and the stabilization of social mobility is a big problem in European cities, in, in European countries, like we see in the U.S., where it's completely stable now in many ways. And what we start seeing also is something similar, and for me, it's one of the most important issues, is that we see some element of metropolization. We see that those living in cities are enjoying much better life, they are now having better and better conditions, and the rate of social mobility is increasing. Even in Paris uh, or in France, a working class kid living somewhere in the countryside has very small chance to become a manager. If the same working class kid lives in Paris and Paris urban region, it increased by 40% its chance to become a manager. So social mobility becomes associated to spatial mobility. But if you have more and more housing difficulties, as we have in a number of cities, and if you reduce income tax and inheritance tax, so those inequality of ownership increase over time, you prepare over time massive cleavage and massive mechanism of inequality in the making. So my conclusion is we do not have neoliberal massively cuts whatever cities in Europe. The model remains robust, but we see small incremental process that over time especially associated to housing, I would argue, and the labor market, are likely to produce long-term massive inequalities. I think the two scenarios are still on, on the map, and we'll see what happens next. It will depend a lot of public policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. There is a lot to discuss about. Um, I am... Richard, are you up to, or you want to postpone? I'm sorry to leave you beforehand. I had a, a fall outside, and uh, but it's nothing serious. It, that uh, several whiskeys won't uh, uh, won't uh, uh, fix. Uh, that's the, the one thing every conference needs is a bottle of whiskey. I think. <laughs> Uh, I want to explain to you the rather strange paper 
uh, that I have contributed to this volume for my uh, 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 my friends and Enzo Mingione. And the bridge between this paper and your concerns here today is the translation of the terms embedding and disembedding into the domain in which I work, which is urban design, urban development, uh, uh, the physical world of the city. That translation is that for us, the word, word disembedded uh, means dematerialized. And the word embedding means a materialization of people's experience of the city. And the problem that for us in the world of urban design and planning, concrete planning, is how to re-embed people in a sense of place by uh, having a better sense uh, and a better way of designing uh, physical experience in the city, notably the experience, the tactile, the haptic experience of physical places. I put this abstractly, but this is a um, question that faced us planners and urban designers last year in creating uh, the, the program, our part of the program for Habitat 3, which is the United Nations uh, colloque, which happens every 20 years. Uh, in, uh, to assess the state of the built environment. And um, uh, part of the, dis I was one of the organizers of that. And uh, the problem for us was that many urban designers and architects today uh, don't have a very good sense of how to embed, that is how to create structures which materialize, which give people a material sense of the, um, uh, of the environment. And I'm going to show you what the problem looks like. This is a space in which, which has got good haptics. This is the Silicon Alley of Delhi. It's a space called Nehru Place, and it's, um, uh, it's, there is a parking garage below this. This is something we funded through United Nations Development Fund. I should say uh, I've, I work with the UN for 30 years now, and this is, this is a project I'm very proud of. Um, this is a parking garage below, uh, originally meant just to be empty above, with on the side where you see the I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, where you see the um, the buildings there are the maker spaces, are the places in which uh, high tech startups in Delhi are occupied. Uh, and what happened with this space is that it, be it was informally used. Uh, it became a market. You can buy uh, an illegal iPhone, like this one there, which just happened uh, to fall off the back of a truck. You can buy saris. It is, um, there's a movie house which shows uh, the same film dubbed into seven languages. It's also a place at night for many of the pavement dwellers in Delhi. It is a space in which people are physically very comfortable with being with each other, including the hotshots who are in these buildings on the side who are trying to do these, these tech startups. It's not true in uh, uh, India that only Bangalore is the center of tech culture. Delhi is as well. And this is a kind of place that has physically in which it, people's haptic experience their sense of physical presence, of touching, literally, 
touching people unlike themselves is very, very uh, strong. Whereas this project, and I come back to this too, this is this project in Beijing, another project we financed, uh, this one through uh, the IMF, and I'm not responsible in any way, shape, or form for this, is a space that uh, is lacking the qualities of sensual engagement, of physical engagement of people with each other. This is a wildly expensive um, uh, development. Uh, at first, very, very satisfying to, uh, to the people in Beijing because a there was a horrible housing crisis. It is now starting to develop all the social ills of big housing estates in, uh, in Western countries, uh, like, uh, I have to go the other way. I'm so, so bad at this stuff. Uh, like this, the Robert Taylor Homes in Chicago, uh, which was the American prototype for this. High degree of drug use. Uh, there's a great deal of, div uh, there's actually a great deal of alcoholism in this state. Very unusual for Chinese, uh, because it's a very deracinated environment, and people complain about the fact that there's no physical presence, there's no shared life on the ground plane uh, where people can congregate. It's an isolated environment. And so the question for us was how it is that um, we, we are in the process of protecting this space. It's about to be declared a UNESCO uh, 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 monument. Doesn't look like it, doesn't. Doesn't look like the Duomo here or uh, any part of Venice. But the idea about this is very threatened by, by gentrification. Google wants to actually buy the garage, which would be a, a way of beginning to clear all these people out. And we are trying to protect this and find another way to develop this. Um, and the question is how to do it. I thought that the only intersection I can see to the economic uh, arguments here is that the uh, that have been presented here today is that this is a space that was originally invested in because the investors saw a target of opportunity very specific to this place. They saw that making a garage here, it's three stories in the bottom, would be, and uh, with, these, with these buildings on the side, would be a way of creating an informal and porous environment in a part of um, Delhi, which was formerly very segregated. And this could open up uh, this environment. They were able to convince people in the UN to do this because they had a lot of local knowledge about what was possible and not possible here. Whereas this space was something in which local knowledge was irrelevant. This was, uh, it's a public-private assemblage uh, and it began with a set of specifications for its housing and then they, the investors looked at um, where in Beijing they could make this investment. And uh, thanks to the Communist Party, they were assigned this place. This was formerly a hutong, if any of you know what that, that is, which is a, a kind of cellular <coughs> Uh, development of courtyard houses. Erased, the word chai, which means destroy, was uh, put on the hutong, and uh, it's a huge hutong settlement, and two weeks later it was graded flat, and this began. The difference between these two is the difference between opportunity investing and what we call in the UN core investing. That is investing in specifications and then finding a place to realize 
those specifications. It is the difference between something which is not necessarily local knowledge in the sense that it's all about developing community, but it's about seeing opportunities by knowing the specific conditions of various places and city through versus something which is more globalized and in which the actual knowledge of the city is of secondary importance to the calculation of the specifications for these buildings. As it happens, the primary investor for this part of uh, Beijing was a group in Kuala Lumpur. Only one person in that group had ever visited Beijing before. So that it's a, if I think about the relationship to the discussion today, it's that for us, you are more likely by this globalized form of investment to produce this, whereas this takes something that is a completely different orientation where you see value in the city and then you assemble the, the finances to develop the, uh, that value. Um, I, don't, I could go on about this endlessly. I, I just want, but I do want to point out one thing. The model for this is not something that's part of the global economy. It comes from the Plan Voisin for Paris in 1924 of Le Cubusier. And uh, discussions about globalization, at least in our domain, are misleading in the sense that the, for us as designers, the prototype for producing Beijing was there and in the West, long, long before there was anything like globalization. This is a plan to grade flat the Marais, to scrawl chai uh, in French. I don't know what, what's the word in French for raise flat? His notion was you get rid of the Marais, you get rid of this complex fabric, uh, so, so wait a minute, I can't show you all this. I'm going the wrong direction, hold on here. Uh, the idea of this is, uh, is uh, this is Corbu's idea of modernity. That this is, it's a modernist vision. The each tower is extremely beautiful. I'm sorry I can't, because uh, I, I want to show the urbanistics of this. Uh, I can't take it to the detail of it. But the point about this is that for us, this is deeply ingrained in the way we are trained to see modern building, right? This looks modern, whereas something like this, which is another open space, a little in, this is in Dharavi, another part uh, this is Mumbai, which we're also trying to uh, protect. We actually want to make this a, a, um, a space that can't be developed. This looks old. So the problematic for us was how to recover a sense of designing this. And that's where this paper on touch comes in. It's not self-evident because it's so deeply ingrained in the, the, the nous of, of architects to, to make this Corbusian spaces, that how we go about recovering the tactile, touching qualities of, uh, uh, of, in urban design. And the work that we've done in Habitat 3, which is uh, published next Tuesday, uh, presents about 25 different case studies for how to do that. All of them are predicated on something which is why I sent you this paper, which is that recovering a sense of touch is nothing that's easy. You, learn, you have to learn how to have 
a, a sense of physical relationship with an environment, just as you have to learn how to have a sense of physical relation with a musical instrument. It's the same problem. Here, in Nehru Place, for instance, something that, that would be very striking to an anthropologist would be that people who are Muslims and Hindus who occupy different terrains here. I bought this illegal iPhone from uh, somebody who happened to be Hindu, but uh, there was uh, somebody at another, uh, on a, at another, uh, 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 another stand who was Muslim say, no, don't, don't, don't go to him. I, I give you a better price. Those people coexist, and they coexist physically. The same thing is true with the <coughs> night dwellers in this space. That is a huge uh, uh, crowd of people who have nowhere to sleep. They can't even uh, get spaces to sleep in uh, the ghettos of Delhi and sleep on this pavement after the market is over. Those are also sleeping Hindu and Muslim bodies next to each other. And that has taken them experience about, for instance, that the men can touch and men and women never touch. That's learned behavior. It's something built into them about uh, what should be resisted and what can be what we would call informal and spontaneous behavior. And what I've done in this paper is try and show you the ways in which we learn how to have that tactile, haptic sense with other people. My paper, unfortunately, is not aimed at you as political economists, but at uh, designers, urban, urbanists and urban designers for whom any contact is good, in which uh, the haptic senses, the senses of touch, are unmediated, in which the physical realm of the city is something that is in the body naturally. And that's the wrong way to think about it. That the physical realm is learned just the way any other aspect of the city is learned. And to make better urban design, urban designers, architects, planners, have got to learn again ways of being physical with other people in order to create spaces which are haptic and physical. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now the floor is uh, to Edmond and uh, Marco. Good afternoon. Uh, how fragmented are our fragmented societies in this uh, in these times of uh, dominant uh, financial accumulation and neoliberal policies? That's a question that we try to answer in the paper by looking at three interconnected themes. One is uh, a discussion of the relevance of social class analysis. A second is the importance of uh, uh, urban segregation and urban inequalities in the constitution of uh, living condition and different life chances for different social classes. And the third part is uh, how this is mediated, partly produced, transformed by uh, public policies and what we call welfare regimes in general. The paper is too long to be presented, so we decided to just show you bits of one particular argument, one uh, part of the social class structure, which is the issue of middle classes throughout those three parts. Uh, why choose the middle classes? We discuss the other classes in the paper, but we thought that uh, uh, this would be a little more exotic because they've been absent largely of the discussion up to now. Also because we think 
that uh, they should be part of the uh, picture when we discuss political issues, when we discuss urban issues. And also because, uh, in a sense, they, they are an understudied and controversial issues. There are discourses about the disappearing middle classes, where uh, most of the empirical data show expanding middle classes. So we have to look at it a little more carefully. Well, discussion about social classes first. Uh, to discuss the middle classes, we need a number of theoretical guidelines, but we also need a lot of uh, empirical work and uh, empirical tools to be able to understand how the transformations of the economies of our countries have, be, have been over the years, and increasingly in the recent period as well, uh, producing uh, different sorts of middle classes. Uh, and what are the changes in the conditions of these middle classes? So, expansion. Second, uh, definitely changing uh, positions of the middle classes uh, within uh, the general uh, relations of production of the capitalist system. It used to be the case that the majority of middle classes were people in an intermediary position between uh, the ruling class and the working class. Intermediary in terms of hierarchy, in terms of uh, power, etc. It's more and more the case that um, large parts of the middle classes are in fact today no longer people with uh, any hierarchical position of power over other workers, but uh, people who are themselves first direct producers of services, and secondly, they are also key elements in the definition of the productivity of uh, the businesses they work for, be they public or private uh, services. And therefore, they uh, progressively lose the relative advantages they had in terms of uh, labor contracts, labor conditions as compared to the working class, and are progressively more and more touched by greater control, greater, stronger forms of uh, evaluation of their productivity, greater productivity pressure, uh, greater precarization of the labor contracts, etc. Uh, this uh, is a general movement, unequal among the different parts of the middle classes, uh, which opens a series of questions about the relation, the changing relations of those middle classes with the working class, the different parts of the working class on one side and the upper class on the other side. Uh, how do we answer that question of the changing relations? Uh, it's, it cannot be a theoretical answer, it's only by observation, data, survey that we can really see how things are changing in the firms uh, and in the city. That's the last point I will present before giving the floor to, to Marco. Uh, the middle classes, particularly the middle middle classes and the lower middle classes, are very interesting in terms of their position in the city. Uh, they are the least segregated uh, social categories, which means they are the categories which are more mixed with all the others, which are less uh, living in separate conditions of their own. Uh, in a sense, uh, you could say that this might undermine uh, the progressive emergence of a class for itself in terms of living condition of the working class. But at the same time, it means that there are potentialities for different sorts of relations between the working classes, the middle classes, and the working class particularly. And uh, this is one of the, uh, let's say, more controversial issues because in a large part of the literature, 
uh, you have a discourse about the middle class in Singular being largely the main actor uh, leading segregation through gentrification, uh, gated communities, etc. Uh, the empirical data about middle classes in the city shows the opposite. So uh, we have to look more carefully about that. Uh, it's not only the prominence of the US model. Uh, I think it's a lack of uh, <coughs> detailed analysis by us sociologists that we have to improve. Marco. Hello. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Alberta, Yuri, and David, where I don't know where is Yuri, for, okay, for uh, editing the book and for organizing the conference. So it's really a great pleasure to be here and to celebrate Enzo Minjone's career or intellectual uh, trajectory. And uh, it's very important for me because uh, my first contact in Italy was Arnaldo Bagnasco, and I met Enzo in the uh, Dipartimento di Scienze Sociali di Torino. Uh, and I have to say that it was very complementary for me to have both Bagnasco view on the Italian society and Enzo Mingione view. And in particular, not only about uh, the difference between Mezzogiorno and the rest of Italy, but in the way of thinking about uh, and not thinking only on at one scale. And this is for me, uh, being a, a French scholar, uh, the main lesson from the Italian sociology. So the, the, to be very sensitive to the territorial approach and to, to, to be able to uh, connect different levels of analysis in terms of uh, space and uh, uh, social differentiation. So uh, this is, uh, so thank you Enzo for uh, giving me the possibility of having both Bagnasco and Migione to understand a very complex and complica complicated society. <laughs> well, uh, just to complete uh, Edmond's presentation, I would like to take the example of education. Um, education is a, a good example of, uh, uh, to reflect on the complexity of the interweaving between urban inequalities segregation and welfare state regime, and to reflect and to try to give answer on middle class issues. In fact, uh, many comparative analyses on education based, are based on uh, very often national level, using, of course, national survey, national data, and using very often a national definition, definition of the welfare state. And uh, I think that this is, uh, we have to uh, be uh, aware about the limit of using this data on reflecting on, co on a comparative perspective on education. And very often this, uh, the research based on that uh, data are not very sensitive to local arrangements, which participate in producing significant differentiation among space in one national or metropolitan configuration. This is the case, for example, for uh, the, the well-known PISA survey. I don't know if you know the, this survey, which is, a, of course, a very useful survey, but not well elaborated to capture regional, metropolitan, or local differentiation, and contributes to consolidate homogeneous national view of each educational system. This is particularly true for the French educational system, which is very often perceived very homogeneous with weak territorial inequalities and differentiation. But when we look carefully, having in mind what Patrick said before about the fact that French and many European societies concerning segregation are not the US, but when we look very carefully at the local level, we see strong differentiations in terms of social and ethnic compositions of, of different level of school, in terms of school offer, diversity and attractiveness of specific curriculum, seniority and qualification and skills of teachers, school trips, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And, and, and of course, in terms of school performance. In Paris suburbs, for example, it's very common to find in a quite limited area 
one public middle school with more than 60% of, pu of pupils from upper middle class background, and uh, very close, another public middle school with only 8% of pupils from uh, that category. Same thing from, for, uh, for school performance. One school, for example, having more than half of pupils, succeeding with, at the final exam with the best owners, and the second one with only 9%, so from 60 to 9, which is, you know, a huge difference. And the global result, uh, map, mapping both social composition and school performance, give a very complex picture of the situation with big contrast at the local level. And uh, if I will have uh, the time, I will show you the map uh, showing exactly the complexity of the situation. But, and, but of course, uh, and just before uh, 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 presenting the second point, two weeks ago, I was uh, called by the city of Mantova, very close to Milan, to present my work on school segregation in Paris suburbs. And I have to say that I was quite surprised why a little town, city like Mantova, asks a French sociologist to present their research on school segregation. But it, why? Because in Mantova, there is a very high segregated neighborhood with a lot of uh, immigrants from uh, Africa, and they are uh, reflecting on the impact of this situation of a high level of ethnic segregation at school or uh, for the, the, local, the community, the local community. And it was exactly the same thing for over Middleton in Europe. So, uh, you know, just uh, again, having in mind that Europe is not the US, but speaking about school segregation, there is a, an increase of uh, the preoccupation concerning this issue. Going back to my argument and the, the French situation, uh, of course, what I'm saying about social and ethnic composition and school performance deal with segregation. And uh, the, the, the specificity maybe of uh, some European context is the gap between residential segregation and school segregation. So why, if, for example, in a society like France, where there is a quite rigid school catchment area policy, you have not exactly the reflection of the local social structure at school. It, it's, it's, it's because there are mechanisms, processes, what are very important to understand, in particularly for middle class. And uh, education is exactly a good example to show how important it is to make a distinction between upper class upper middle class and lower middle class. In fact, the analysis of school strategies and residential choice show that there is a significant difference and a crucial qualitative impact on social relations and political issues. Again, according with local environment, the way that upper middle class are dealing with school and social and ethnic mix participate in uh, understanding inequalities and the, the, the kind of inequalities you, you find at the local level. And we have now a lot of field works in London, Chicago, Amsterdam, Brussels, Berlin, Bogota, Mantova, showing this local social gain and its impact on school inequalities. This is why your main argument in the chapter written with Edmond is that the understanding of these complex local arrangements is a big issue for social scientists and politicians interested in inequalities. In inequalities. Okay, so uh, I'm, I will stop here. I, I would like to say uh, other things on Enzo contribution and the impact of ESOPO experience because uh, just few, few words, because there are a lot of people uh, participating in this uh, big European comparative research. And it was exactly uh, the same way of reflecting on local arrangement. Uh, the chapter I wrote with Enzo about the local welfare system, comparing uh, minimum <coughs> income support policy in 10 or 12 European cities. I don't remember exactly the, the name. Okay, so a significant number 
of European cities. So thank you again for your contribution on uh, thinking about comparison. Thank you very much. Um, we have two uh, discussants, uh, Professor. Oh, oh sorry, yes. sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke of Naples before and then I forgot. Enrica, yes, uh, Enrica, the floor yes. is yours. And we are at the end of this long day, so everything has already been said about Enzo Mingione. Uh, but uh, I just want to add a few words uh, on uh, Yuri, Alberta, and David, uh, because um, I knew them uh, since they were uh, many decades ago, since they were brilliant uh, PhD students, and now uh, I, they are becoming uh, international influential academics. And, um, uh, and so I think that... Uh, once at the end of uh, the academic life, um, one uh, stop teaching, but uh, of course you no, do not stop uh, writing books, lecturing, and doing uh, a lot of, of these things. But uh, uh, most of all, I think that um, one do not stop uh, being a mentor. You are a mentor for all the life. And uh, I think that you have been, as all of us have recognized, a generous mentor, not only for Yuri and David and Alberta, but for uh, um, an entire generation of uh, Italian sociologists. So thank you very much. And um, um, my contribution in the book is based on the Napolitan case. And it is very difficult to summarize all the contributions. So I just want to point uh, uh, out the fact that um, the, uh, the Naples is interesting because it has a very complex uh, uh, social spatial structure uh, in which we can identify almost three different uh, uh, areas uh, with the following uh, uh, paper uh, that I, I wrote with Enrico Pugliese. We call the, the Wilson City, that is the northeast of uh, part of uh, uh, the, the city where we can uh, find some uh, um, aspect of the syndrome of deprivation uh, uh, described by Wilson, uh, by Wilson in terms of the effect of concentration. And so we can find some of the characteristic of the hyperghetto. And there is another uh, area that we call the uh, Alum City, which is the historical center of the city, where they, we can still uh, find the traces of the uh, alley uh, economy, and that is an uh, um, uh, urban uh, uh, economy of uh, subsistence based on informal exchange of services and uh, goods. And uh, there is a third city that we call the fourth city, uh, that is uh, the eastern and um, western part of the city, uh, eat by the industrialization and uh, where the process that is very similar to, to other areas in uh, the North uh, Europe uh, um, where the process of revitalization has not yet started. That is perhaps the, 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 the most important difference with the similar areas in uh, uh, other North European cities. And there is also a fourth area that I do not mention in the book because it's very difficult to explain to non-Italian people, that is the residential area of uh, neighborhood like Posilipo of Omero, where the upper class families live, and we call the, uh, the city of Postal Sole, that is a very popular soap opera in Italy. Uh, and the, uh, even in this uh, um, residential area, the interaction between uh, uh, upper class families and uh, families from uh, a different background are very, very um, intense, very frequent. So uh, this complex uh, social uh, spatial structure of the city prevents form of severe segregation and social isolation, although, as already known, the level of unemployment and of poverty uh, in the city are still very high, and the quality of the welfare system and of the transport infrastructure uh, is uh, very, very uh, low. And uh, this creates a sort of uh, 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 unbalance in the precarity that uh, um, I think uh, um, 
it is the reason why the case of Naples is uh, uh, very interesting, because it is uh, able to achieve a high level of social cohesion, even in presence of uh, a low uh, level of economic development. And um, uh, Serena told that I was quite optimistic, because I stress this in my contribution, the fact that the structure of the, the, the social spatial structure of the city um, foster a sort of uh, daily interaction that is very similar to which uh, you mentioned for the case of narrow place there, you know, that uh, where people coexist physically and they create what also Ashamin and Igor Street called the togetherness. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the capacity to live together, to share the same work uh, place that is uh, the pavement, for example. Is the, um, when I arrived very early in the morning uh, to my university, that is the historical center of Naples, you can see immigrants, workers, and uh, Italian workers, and Neapolitan workers, they are street vendors. Uh, that start the, the day, long daily day together and they go uh, to take a coffee together, or they talk to uh, each other, uh, uh, and they, for example, talking on uh, 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 football uh, team, and so there is, they have a very street daily interaction. But I am not so optimistic as Serena uh, thought, because I think that these forms of togetherness is not enough, uh, because we need also to a, a, a politics of redistribution and of recognition that is based on a common system of, uh, of uh, uh, duties and uh, obligation and rights and social rights. And uh, that is what is now lacking in the, in the, in the city. And um, so although my contribution was mostly descriptive, I think that it has two uh, theoretical implication that is very strictly related to Enzo work. Uh, the first one is uh, the variety of forms of embeddedness, and uh, we have seen that there are a lot of forms of embeddedness, this embeddedness, and also the ambivalence of this process. I find very interesting uh, the notion of uh, uh, moral economy from above, from uh, Lydia Morris, because the moral economy is uh, very ambivalent. We wish it was a form of a protection uh, from the community, but it was also discretional, paternalistic, and it was part of a system of a feudal uh, obligation, uh, and that excluded some uh, people uh, as uh, underserving uh, poor. For example, do you remember the Scarlet Letter? No? So the protection was guaranteed to uh, to uh, marry the women or widow, mean, uh, women, but not, for example, for low mothers, mostly servants uh, make pregnant by the landlord. And so I think that we should not, uh, um, we should uh, be very careful when we, we, we are looking for a new form of uh, uh, moral economy. And um, the, second, um, uh, the second theoretical question is, uh, uh, on the representation on the unrepresented people, because what the Napolitan case teaches us is that uh, uh, this the type of um, social structure uh, uh, um, uh, prevents the forms of political organization. And the only forms of protest is, uh, the, 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 is, is very similar to the riots that Thompson studied in the, during the moral economy. And uh, so it is very important to think on how we can find new forms of uh, representation of uh, people that at the moment are very difficult to be represented. And the, the only form of uh, um, voice that they, they have is uh, the, 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 the form that they can um, uh, uh, explicitly uh, during their uh, daily interaction. Okay. Thank you very much, Enrica. Um, 
since we have some time before giving the floor to our two discussants, Professor Nuvolati and Professor Balducci, I would like to give the microphone to the floor and see if there are questions that can be answered after the discussion. There is a microphone going around. Okay, Simone has it. And uh, you just, uh, okay, Alona? Yeah, maybe. Sorry. Uh, maybe I also misunderstood the presentation um, of Richard, but I have sort of a feeling that you, without any critiques, value the local knowledge as something good. But if the local knowledge is about like sexism, if local knowledge is about discrimination, if local knowledge is about like inequality of some and especially if we're talking about India and caste system. Like, so the question is, um, how do you evaluate this local knowledge you were mentioning in one of the projects? Yeah. Thank you. I think it's worth collecting a few questions and then giving possibility to answer to our speakers. No more question? Well, maybe, maybe I should give you the opportunity after the discuss, this discussion. Okay, so you, you want to start? You want to start? Okay. Well, this is a really good question you ask, and a very difficult one, because um, um, the local is something we make a, sh a shrine of uh, in, in some forms of urban design when it shouldn't be. Um, what, what I am explaining to you about the economics of this is that there is a very different set of attitudes towards the city between these two forms of investing. Uh, in some way, the opportunity investing is more, is better since it's more oriented to a particular place. But that's a limited good. Uh, I certainly don't, uh, in my uh, my own work, this is a big divide with Jane Jacobs, who uh, was a friend and a teacher, but whom I think made a shrine, a kind of a totem, out of local knowledge. And uh, local knowledge can be, as you point out, can be extremely uh, hurtful, uh, and so on. So the problem for design, for our work, is how to engage the local rather than impose on it, but still be critical of it uh, when it does things that the designer thinks uh, violate larger norms. And there's no recipe for that. Um, and when I worked, I worked in, in Beirut uh, after the Civil War, briefly, and the local knowledge there is of mutual hatred. And the designer, uh, you know, trying to re recover a, a devastated city, uh, had to not say, well, this is wrong that you hate each other, that would be infantile but to withdraw from taking that knowledge seriously and saying instead, well, you know, there's no electricity here, and, uh, and this was in the so-called green line where we worked. And you have to cooperate with each other if you want to be able to turn the lights on. So there are various ways of dealing with this. There is no universalistic, any planner who says, I know the way to plan whatever the local conditions are, which is morally correct, is somebody who will be out of work. You know? So the question is how to mediate uh, 
and respond to that when local knowledge is destructive knowledge. It's, if I can just say one more thing about it, in the United States, it's the same problem with Trump. Trump has, invokes a kind of local knowledge. It's one of his, he's a cursed genius, but he's very good at invoking the sense of we locally. To say to him, oh, you're a sexist, racist pig, which is true, uh, does nothing to deal with the situation that he's provoked. <coughs> and what I think we need to do in politics, just as we need to do in urban practice, is find a way to engage the local, uh, but not over-identify with it, uh, nor uh, cause local people to feel, oh, they don't get it. They have no shame. And that's, that's, it's a diplomatic problem, it's a moral problem, but it's very nuanced. So I, I, this is a wonderful question you put, the answer to which is there is no single answer for that. You know, it has to be dealt with in a range of ways. In my book, my new book, I deal with this in terms of dialogics rather than dialectics, you know, dialogic projects process of working with the other rather than convincing the other. But it is very important that you raise, raise this. Thank you, Richard. And thank you to Alona for the question. Um, so we have Professor Balducci. is one of the few non-sociologists here. Oh, so uh, we value very much your contribution. This works. Yes. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I am not a sociologist. Uh, I'm an urban planner, so I'm looking to the so sociological uh, studies uh, for getting uh, analysis and uh, uh, inspiration to act and uh, and to try try to change things. And, uh, and of course, so you have to give, forgive me if I'm not uh, technically uh, precise uh, discussing uh, these uh, uh, very interesting papers that I've been able to, to read before. And of course, uh, much of this inspiration has been also by Enzo in his work, uh, which has been, uh, and, and I thank uh, him for, for the work that he has done. Okay, so uh, first of all, I'm very close and very admired by the, the paper of uh, Richard Sennett, uh, and uh, it was this fantastic uh, metaphor of, uh, of music and how music can inspire us in, in understanding uh, uh, the concept of embeddedness and uh, disembeddedness. And, uh, and I think that the interesting thing in this paper is that uh, there is a discussion of a number of issues that uh, in the circles of uh, planners and architects have been already raised, but uh, shedding a, a lot of lights on some aspects which have not been discussed. First of all, for example, the separation of traffic, but also the idea that uh, separation of traffic is not just the issue of uh, having cars and, uh, and people in, uh, in the same place, but that the, the uh, cars are boxes in which people are, yeah. are, are, are put inside in order to avoid and impair uh, this kind of exchange and personal exchange. The separation of functions uh, as a way of uh, making the city more efficient and more uh, capable of working, but also killing the social uh, uh, dimension that comes from interaction. The architectural machines which are uh, looking mainly at the form that can be used only in one way, it says in this paper, and uh, become rigid, uh, inadaptable, incapable of hosting uh, the change of society, and in particular all what we have been producing in the 70s uh, or end of the 60s and early 70s uh, uh, has been something that uh, has been designed to be the best uh, efficient and they are the least efficient now because uh, now we have to rebuild hospitals, uh, to rebuild schools uh, and a lot of things that have been built in that period because uh, they are not uh, able to be adapted. And also the idea of user friendly which has been also uh, interesting, there is a book of Laura Balba which was very mm -hmm. important in a certain <laughs> phase uh, and, and he says that uh, this idea of user-friendly, user so to, to uh, 
produce something with the idea of making it easy is also a way of uh, constraining uh, a kind of views uh, that cannot be uh, cannot be uh, cannot engage people, which is one of the of the <coughs> most important uh, issues. Uh, the, uh, this. And also the idea of predictable and unpredictable uh, in the in the in the city, which is uh, also a very important point. So um, I would add also something else, uh, like uh, lower density. In the, I've been deputy mayor for urban planning for a short period of time here in Milan. And one of the mantra here is uh, to lower the density because uh, we wanted to avoid the speculation. But when you lower the density, you also produce uh, some kind of uh, 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 neighborhoods uh, which, in, in which nothing happens because of the density is too low and, and, and the examples were. So the, the, uh, my question is uh, to, sh to say something more about in, in the final part of the paper, there is a the, just a, a short mention of the fact that there are young architects and uh, young mm. artists uh, which are doing something uh, for going in the, in the other direction. And so I would like you to, to say something more about that because I think it is very interesting. About the paper of uh, Patrick Legales, which is a very brilliant uh, uh, paper, and, and he, he attacks a, a number of, uh, of uh, taking for granted uh, uh, ideas about, uh, about uh, cities. And, uh, and so I have a number of questions because uh, he is very provocative in a way. So he says that cities are not more divided but less divided in a way. Uh, uh, he says that between 2015 and 2014, no increase in income inequalities in city. And for example, I remember that a, a research that's been done by a colleague, uh, uh, Daniele Kecki, here at the end of the 90s. He said that Milan in the 70s early 70s was uh, the, less, uh, the least uh, unequal city in Lombardy, which was uh, the least unequal city in, uh, uh, region in, in Italy. And then uh, at the end of the 90s, uh, Milan was uh, the most unequal city in, uh, in Lombardy, which became uh, the most uh, unequal region in uh, Italy. And so my point is that maybe everything happened before this period that you have been mentioning in the, in the paper. Uh, then uh, uh, there is uh, this observation, which is also pro uh, provocative, uh, the fact that the financial cuts have not been so severe. Public spend expenditure is uh, higher in percentage of the GDP compared with uh, 2007. And so since we are discussing and we are seeing that there are continuous uh, uh, decrease in the, in the availability of uh, money in the uh, municipalities for, for providing services, uh, I think that probably the, the, the kind of money which has been spent uh, has been uh, displaced in different places. And you are discussing, you, you haven't uh, taken this point uh, uh, in, in your short presentation, but you are saying something about housing poverty, which I think is uh, maybe something which is very evident uh, in a way in producing a certain type of inequality which is not represented by, by the percentage of GDP, but it is something which is menacing, menacing the, the, the cohesion in our city. And, uh, and of course, uh, the, the, you also recognize that there is an increase in segregation, which is also leading to, uh, to the paper of uh, Oberti and Pretzel. Um, the, the problem of the increase in segregation is also something which is not represented by the, the, the amount of expenses, but it's something which is uh, also uh, uh, producing something very uh, important in terms of uh, um, impairing uh, uh, social cohesion. Um, then I have a last point about the fact that uh, uh, about the, the type of city you are discussing, because uh, in this period, bef between your book, uh, your first important book, and, uh, and nowadays, uh, a process of enlarging of the city, of creating this kind of uh, city regions have, has become more and more important, and so I'm wondering if this does any uh, difference in, in, in your reflection. And uh, for, the, for the paper of uh, Oberti and Pretzel, uh, I, I found also very interesting this idea, so this description of something which has not been uh, very much discussed, at, at least in my environment. So the fact that the, the, the uh, most segregated uh, uh, classes are the upper class, uh, which is a self-segregation, 
And then the second uh, most segregated uh, class is uh, the, the working class, uh, which is not uh, self-segregation, but is something which is happening. And this is very important, I think, at the level of the urban region, not only at the level of the city, because they are going also outside. Uh, and, and then uh, this idea of middle class, uh, which is a uh, split in different uh, uh, parts, uh, which, are, which are the less uh, segregated, but uh, despite the myth of uh, gentrification, but at the same time, uh, they belong in a way to other types of segregation. So my, my point is, uh, is segregation increasing? And if it is increasing, isn't it uh, really a, a, a problem which is not uh, due to planning and so the detachment between the different uh, uh, groups of people uh, which is going to the to the point of uh, uh, Richard Sennett is something which is uh, not due to to policies but but it is something which is uh, happening and and uh, menacing the the uh, social cohesion and finally uh, the the paper of, uh, uh, of uh, Erika uh, Morlicchio is, is a wonderful case in Naples for this, also for discussing the, the point of uh, Richard Senna, because really it is uh, the, the, the city in which you really see this kind of uh, uh, mixture of uh, physical uh, closeness between, uh, between people, this, this uh, touching, of, uh, and, and at the same time, it's very poor and it's uh, a, a very high rate of unemployment, uh, uh, really with great difficulties in coming out from this uh, la very uh, uh, lasting uh, crisis. So this is not enough, as you said. And so I'm, I'm wondering if this is producing some kind of re resilience to the crisis. Probably yes. So this is my question. Uh, be, because of what Richard Sennett said, but at the same time it's not enough, and so we have to think to other kind of uh, uh, policies. These are my observations. Thank you. Yes, it works now. Um, well, uh, first of all, I have to apologize with the auto because I am not really an expert on these topics. Um, but in order to discuss the paper, I will use some categories that are completely or more or less um, quite completely exogenous from your theoretical approach. So we'll try to use other categories. For discussing the paper, of uh, Richard Senior, that we, I will use the concept of the flaneur. To discuss the uh, paper of Legales, I will use the theory of rock and the old European city belt. I will, I will start from the Middle Age. To discuss the other from Oberti and Brexel, I will use the concept of urban system. You see, they are completely exogenous no? to your framework. And then for the last, I will use the concept of the non-resident population. So let's start with Richard Sennett. In your paper, you, you present quite clear dichotomies concerning city. We have planned and unplanned city, controlled and a struggling city, user-friendly and engaging city, with fixed meaning and interpretable city. And we also include, we can include also the concept of the serendipity. And if I quote you know, what you say, you say in, on page 195, all buildings have programs which define the particular use of spaces. Modern buildings tend to have <coughs> particularly defined programs. And then you say again, these easy to use but rigidly fixed structures ask for submission in use rather than engagement. And then the last sentence is, is that um, user-friendly turns out to be socially unfriendly. So the idea that you give us is that these are quite difficult city to live in, no? just as you described. But then you introduce a very interesting concept. It is the concept of the risk. Oh. Risk. Risk. That we, risk. That we can risk in some way in order to touch the city, in order to capture the genius touch of the city. But what does it mean to risk a little bit? In my opinion, and here I, I, I can quote a concept that is the concept of the half-suicide. We have to kill a little bit ourselves 
not completely, but it's a kind of half suicide, not mm -hmm. completely suicide. This is a classical metaphor from the psychoanalytic approach. What does it mean? It means these things that uh, in order to avoid any personal prejudice, no, in order to be completely free from other kind of prejudice, I have to keep myself, of course, is a kind of metaphor, no? in order to, to capture the genius logic, in order to really touch the city. To, dis uh, to destroy myself in order to touch this. This is a classical psychoanalytic concept. And of course, it is not a complete suicide because you always find an emergency exit. At the end, you touch the city, but not completely. You stop to have this kind of relationship, deeper relationship with the city. You stop to be a classical flaneur and you come back to be an intellectual, to write the book, to take the picture. So this is something that I remember me very closely Benjamin, as a matter of fact, he used also the concept of porosity, for example. No? Yeah. So in my question, now I arrive directly, and I just I can quote Pierpaolo Pasolini, the flaneur of the Roman periphery, and he was uh, used to say, each night I explore the city. I am not sure to return home. I am risking a lot. I am not sure that it will be possible for me to back. But if I am back at home, I will be richer than before thanks to the new experience. So this is the idea of the risk, you know, the two risk you have in some way to stop to be yourself. <laughs> so um, my way, I, I, I come to the question. Um, it is difficult to risk, of course. Mm -hmm. We avoid many times to risk. So my question is, uh, do you think that uh, flaneur and flaneuses, because you have also feminine <laughs> flaneurs and flaneurs, are still existing? Are they able to constitute an alternative to tourists in exploring the city and in capturing the genius launch of the city? Are they able to use all the five senses in touching the city? Are still existing this kind? Because you know they are kind of poor Senex. No, they are in the middle between having the desire of having experience, but at the same time they are Senex. They know when they have to stop. So you present this picture. It's nice to match with this population, but completely or not completely? So when you stop to match with this population, so this is another thing that it could be interesting to analyze. Uh, we know that it's very difficult to be flaneur in our society. As Benjamin told us, um, um, the flaneur many times became part of the market. At the end, in the theory of Benjamin, he's the sandwich man. He's part of the market. He's not able to constitute an alternative to this situation. So if you can say something about this. Then I go to the paper of Patrick Legales, a very nice paper. But what, in my opinion, what is missing, but I, I, as I already told before, I'm not expert. I have the feeling that uh, what is missing in the paper is the analysis of the external variables that makes possible the evolution of the European cities. In the history, sometimes something happens. Uh, in a few minutes, I will tell you what happens, for example, in the Middle Age. In the Middle Age, what uh, Rockan told us, that we have the develop of the city that were located in the central part of Europe, starting from the North, Europe, from North Italy, going to Switzerland, and then um, the Netherlands and Germany. This was the old European city belt. And it was characterized by middle-sized city, and uh, the, um, it was possible for the city to, to develop very fastly because also for the climatic condition, but everything was due to the fact that uh, the Mediterranean area, the Mare Nostrum, was not the best place to develop trade and commercial activity because of the Ottoman invasion. So there was an external variables that make possible that the route of the commercial activity was extremely changed the direction. So if you can say something concerning the external variable, and in, in our case, the globalization process, the immigration process, that can change maybe in an unpredictable way the development of the corridor, of the European corridor. Maybe something can happen. No, in the past, was, it was interesting, uh, the, the, the lecture before that we have uh, concerning the Mediterranean uh, Sea. You know that uh, because of the invasion of the Ottoman 
uh, uh, now it was th that generates this shift of the, the development of the European corridor. No, it was just for change. So it was unpredictable. It, uh, so do we have to consider also these unpredictable variables in describing the future of the European city? It's an hard job. But then <laughs> we have <laughs> Operti and Pretzel. Uh, you say something about uh, differences between large city and middle-sized city. But reading the paper, reading the chapter, I have the idea that you describe a general evolution without making a lot of distinction between different models, between Italy, between French. And so it was, I didn't understand if it was possible to define different patterns. Why I use the concept of urban system? Because urban system is very important. For example, you can make a distinction between a monocephalic urban system, a big city, and uh, the desert, more or less, and the polycephalic system, like Italian. So a system made by middle-sized city. This changed a lot, probably, all the um, evolution of the dynamics that you described. No? And the middle-sized city, you can find also it was a little bit quoted, maybe, from uh, Legale. Legale says something about this kind of network of middle-sized cities. So to consider a polycephalic system is, much, is very different from considering a monocephalic system. Uh, a network of middle-sized cities generates different types of problems, different types of local welfare. So can you say something about maybe distinction between different types of patterns? And then the last uh, of uh, uh, Morlicchio. Of course, all the paper and all the chapter are very nice, including this, the last one of, uh, um, of Enrica. Uh, what I will say, in my opinion, uh, I think that is the time now to make a step forward in the analysis of our neighborhood. As I told before, I use the concept of resident and non-resident population. You describe the local population, I mean, you say, uh, if you have uh, social polarization, what, ha what happens during the day? We have a lot of computers, we have a lot of tourists. They change completely the profile of the city. And the problem is that we know this, but this is very difficult to measure. It's very difficult to analyze what is going on in the city according to the classical statistical sources. We have data concerning census data, so people are sleeping in the city, having an house in the city, but not people moving in the city and visiting the city every day. So I think that the future in this sector will be the one that, uh, in which you can merge new information concerning not only local population, but also uh, non-resident. Um, by non-resident, I don't mean immigrants. Eh? I mean commuter, a city user. And this also because I come back, the last consideration was about also Benjamin. He was comparing Moscow and Naples and saying that they have a typical thing, a porosity. They both have a kind of porosity. But this kind of porosity was ex an, an example um, concerning the fact that the city was used by different types of population, moving, for example, from the public space to the private space. No, and when you move from the public space to the private space, you have to consider different kind of population performing this kind of activity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope the speaker will be up to the task. <laughs> so who is going to start? Erika, change your Erika, would you yeah. like to start? Yeah, very, very brief. And, uh, Thank you very much for your comments. And uh, I can answer to Professor Balducci with an example that is based on a, a research that I made with Elena De Filippo using an in-depth interview. Uh, we interview um, immigrants uh, that um, uh, uh, choose uh, Naples as uh, areas of first arrivals in the 18th and 19th uh, of the last century. And uh, uh, after obtaining their uh, permission to stay, they move to the north of Italy, in the northeast, but also in uh, Lombardia, for example. And uh, after the crisis, they uh, lost their job. And they decided to come back to Naples, that was the area of first arrivals. And in the interview, they say that they come back to Naples because of 
uh, the togetherness because because they uh, knew that uh, in, in Naples they can relay on the informal networks of mutual support. But as I said before, that was not enough because a lot of these people, af after some months, became homeless. So we interviewed them in the uh, Center for uh, Homeless. And so um, uh, I think that uh, um, you never get used to poverty. So when the crisis hits a, a, a poor area where you can rely only on uh, informal network of, of solidarity, uh, the effects are uh, stronger, not uh, uh, less strong. And for example, it, it also, um, in the case of the families, uh, uh, one of the effects of the crisis is that the overband then uh, on the families increases a lot uh, compared with the reduction of uh, economic resources. And some families were not able anymore to uh, act uh, the, the forms of uh, uh, internal solidarity, uh, which is very often a forced solidarity. And um, uh, it is very uh, impossible for me to, to, to answer to, to your question. Uh, I think that's very interesting, your uh, comments on the resident and resident population. I am a commuter, so I, I know that there is a, a important differences. But uh, I need the, the help of an urban sociologist. And I am not an urban sociologist to take in consideration this aspect. I have not the tools to do that uh, now. But I think that uh, uh, the city during the day is very different from the city in the evening. I agree with you totally. I hold you. <laughs> if you order me, then what can I say? Thank you, you know, to the falls to do these comments you've done, both of you. Um, first one, Sandro, of, of course you're right on a number of things you've mentioned, but my argument is really let's be precise and qualify those mechanisms about inequality and stop having this general explanation that are just wrong empirically. There's an important argument in uh, Fernand Brodel in his method, and I'm thinking about has been said about Middle Ages. And Brodel says, well, when you don't know exactly what's going on, try to frame the issue. He calls it la pesée. Try to get some element you know under which parameters you can understand some of those things. That's exactly what I'm arguing in the paper. In fact, instead of saying, you know, more inequalities, cities are more divided on everything, it's everything, the same thing going on, let's try at least to be precise on some of the parameters under which we can work much more precisely on inequalities like my friends have been doing at the local level. So that's really the, the sake of, of your argument in many ways. So you may have, on average, some limited inequalities, but that doesn't tell you that you may have huge amount of differences at very, very different level. And as we know, when we work on urban inequalities, we do several things. We, number one, know that when you look at differences of inequalities of income, may be very different from the inequalities in terms of access to services, but might be themselves very different from inequalities in terms of patrimonio, what people have, but might be also very different from some of the social segregation elements. So the way we combine may take very different way. It doesn't mean that they're not more divided on a number of issues, but my point is also we should not, I mean, I'm a comparatist. I want us to be more precise on under which parameters we can control and we can see some element. And it's also a plea uh, in, in, in the urban studies literature nowadays, which tend to marginalize social, social sciences, to really take seriously the, um, the politics and the policies of a city. I mean, European cities and city regions are organized historically with very strong political and policies element. As you know, we have literature emphasizing philosophical ideas and, and emphasizing post-politics and all these things, but that's not what we see. And, and I want to emphasize that in some cases, in some cases, those policies make a huge difference. And in social science, in urban studies, we tend to sort of disconnect them. So I want to give indicators that you see some very different results at the end. There is less poverty in Finland than in France, and there are reasons for that. Yes, the UK is an exception in Europe, and yes, we have seen severe cuts in welfare, making a huge difference when in some other countries, when you work on income tax or inheritance tax, you make a difference over time. So my point was not to do the more precise thing, as you argue, and you're absolutely right. It's just that 
let's try to be precise in our comparative framework in, on the settings under which we operate. Same thing what you say about municipalities. Of course, you're right. There is some austerity in a number of cases. But the point is that, the, you know, on average, again, you still have a huge amount of policies going on. That does not mean that many municipalities are now lacking resources to do more. But still, when you compare that with other parts of the world, I mean, Europe is a complete exception with the amount of social policy we're doing. And, you know, I'm very much in, two, in favor of trying to understand those small incremental process that will have long-term consequence in terms of inequality. But that should not be mixed with radical cuts and very strong process going on in some other parts of the world. I'm always worried that if we put all that in the same bag, we lose the relevance of very strong policies in some, in some cases. That's more the spirit, but I, I agree with you on, on a number of issues. And, and of course, you're right also on arguing that, which I don't do in the paper because it's a small paper, um, um, those cities are not the same, and we have the cities and the city regions and some different organizations. But also remind us that even when you look at urban centers, I've been gaining populations in, in the majority of European cities. So at the same time, we have all this some sprawling, we have the making of city regions, and we have also the urban centers doing better. The question is, to what extent the making of those city regions is having an impact on inequality? And I don't know, but I think it's a, you're absolutely right to emphasize we should know more about that. Because what we know also is that looking at different scale, we may find very different results as Marco and Elmo have been saying, at the level of a neighborhood, we may have very different results if we aggregate at the level of a city and a different result at the level of a metropolitan or at the level of city regions. And unpacking those different dynamics and effect on inequalities and measuring them at different scale is absolutely central. And we don't always do a very good job. And that's what Marco and Elmo have been, have been arguing. So I think it would be a very interesting thing, really, to push on what does city region make as a difference in terms of segregation, in terms of competition for schools, in terms of access to services. We know something. We know that on average, it's the work being done by Kubler and Sellers, when you have very strong fragmentation at the level of city region, you tend to have less redistribution and less access to services. So you tend to increase inequality. But that's just one result. For the rest, we need to measure and, and to do this thing. So you're absolutely right, and I agree completely with, with all the points you have been uh, mentioning. Um, Yes, let's go back to Middle Ages. You're right. It's always interesting. Um, there's a little bit of contradiction in what you're telling me. You're telling me uh, predict the future, and then you have external influence that might be unpredictable. And, and I quite agree with you. Um, this paper is limited, so you're right. I do not do that. And, and you're right, it's missing. I, I agree. Um, my paper was very much on, on, on the crisis, because we have a big literature explaining the, the effect of the crisis. Surprisingly, the crisis has not led to the dismantling of the European city model. Okay? That's one thing. What happens next? Number one, I don't know. I don't predict the future. Second, we'll discuss that tomorrow a bit. But just like you, I, I think that there are some you know, clouds assembling in the sky. And we'll discuss tomorrow on capitalism. But when you think about some element of financialization, some of the big data that we find so difficult to measure and to understand the impact, uh, when you add to that the refugee crisis, the migrant, and the way some migrants are or not, when you emphasize the informalization of some of the process in many cities, and you bring in some climate change idea, I can see many reasons why some external influence may have some severe effect on the transformation of this model. So my point is only to argue that over the last 10 years, something we could have anticipated and I would have expected far more transformation of this model did not take place. That means that the national welfare state has still played a role to compensate to some extent what is happening. But we also know that you have this, as Oprah is emphasized, this slow incremental long-term process that are at stake. And I can see many of them able to lead to some profound restructuring of, of uh, our territory. I mean, you know, if we agree that there's some substantial change in terms of capitalism and uh, there are some people here who have been saying things like that, like Saskia. Um, you may expect some you know, pretty radical change over time. And if I follow, my last line is, uh, it might be the case that those European cities that have been so organized by politics and policies, maybe nowadays we see the shrinking role of politics in organizing those cities. And the, capacity, the collective capacity to play a role might be diminishing for some of these external influence.
Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Great. Thank you. Uh, who is going to respond, Edmond? Well, I'll answer part of the questions. Marco will continue. I'll answer mainly on the questions about segregation. Uh, first of all, I find interesting that two of you have commented your surprise at this result that we found that the most segregated categories are the upper class. And uh, uh, this surprise is surprising because this is a classic result uh, from the first uh, empirical work on uh, uh, urban segregation by Duncan and Duncan, 55, 54, I can't remember. And uh, it's interesting that it's a surprise because it's true that this classic result that we find in most cities of the capitalist world is always forgotten. And uh, I think that we sociologists uh, or academics more generally have uh, a responsibility in that, that we have accepted too much that the issue of urban segregation be limited to discussing the segregation of the poor, of the immigrants, uh, of the m marginalized categories. Uh, and uh, I think we don't understand the segregation of the poor if we don't understand it as part of a chain of processes which starts with the self-segregation of the rich. The segregation of the working class you have mentioned uh, uh, comes second, and it's an interesting result because this is a result, again, we find in major metropolises of the capitalist world when there is data to produce that kind of result. And uh, what's surprising there is that uh, we find that the uh, strongest element of con social spatial contrast in those cities is the opposition between upper class, as I mentioned, and industrial working class. And this result is surprising because this takes place in cities which are largely post-industrial cities that have been post-industrial cities for decades now. So how is it that this social contrast between upper class and industrial working class still uh, structures the social space of the city and the representations of, of the city? This again, I think, claims uh, for longer-term historical uh, debates about how the structure of the city and the representations of the city are produced. The middle classes, uh, or no, is segregation increasing? That was the, the question. Well, uh, Marco and I have written a, a book that's been translated uh, uh, in, in, it, in Italy uh, about trying to make out the different meanings and the methods uh, to analyze uh, segregation. Uh, it's a relatively complex uh, category if you want to oper operationalize in terms of methods. But to make sto the story short, if you, for example, calculate uh, dis dissimilarity indexes uh, between different social categories uh, in the Paris metropolitan area, which is the one we have been studying more carefully, uh, what we find is that most uh, of those indexes are stable, which means that the spatial distance between categories doesn't change very much over time, with one exception, which is that the difference between upper class and upper middle class of the private sector on one side and industrial working class or blue collar working class and uh, white collar workers, low skilled white collar workers, that's increasing slightly. So there is some intensification uh, of segregation, but to a limited degree between those extremes. But the majority of uh, distances between categories doesn't change. So there is a stability. And that stability is surprising because the social structure of the cities has changed rather dramatically over three decades. Paris was 
had a majority of blue collar workers in 62, let's say, and has now a majority of uh, upper class, upper middle class, and middle middle class. Uh, so this is a dramatic change. And segregation patterns have not changed in terms of uh, average. So uh, the only interpretation that one can give is that the relative distribution of, of those uh, social categories uh, has a relation with uh, uh, the s spatial structure uh, of the built environment, particularly the distribution of uh, different types of housing, and also with uh, the relative acceptability of different groups of living more or less close together. And that, again, I think, is something that is built through a relatively <laughs> long-term history and is never uh, the result of uh, short-term uh, policy effects. Although Patrick has, is right, uh, this whole thing is structured by public policies. But the moderate intensity of segregation and the relative stability of segregation in Paris is not, definitely not, the result of public policies of the last 10 years. It is the result of public policies of the last uh, century. Just a few words on why it's important to work on the school segregation. Um, I'm just finishing a, a research on the, the last 10 years school performance in all public middle school in big Paris metropolitan area. And I was fascinated by one result, which is uh, the control by gender, sex, and uh, social background, because we have no data on ethnic and racial background in France. Uh, there is a huge difference in the, the chance of having the final exam with the best owners according with the place we are going at school. So it's, and the, it's three times more chance for pupils uh, schooling in a middle school in Paris downtown compared to uh, the same person schooling in a, a working class middle school in the suburbs, for example. So control by social background, gender, etc., etc. So it means that uh, we are talking about huge inequalities linked to the uh, social composition of school and the local environment, school environment. And this is the second research I'm just finishing with other colleagues at Paris Dauphine is about uh, big selective universities having a national uh, recruitment, is correct? So we are trying to, uh, again, control by social background, income, uh, type of uh, high school degree, et cetera, et cetera. And there is a very interesting result uh, concerning inequalities and segregation. When uh, the, the, the part of uh, students coming for, from uh, other regions than uh, the big Paris metropolitan area, very often are, are more often from mid, lower middle class background or middle class background with very, very good test score at the uh, high school degree. Very good students but with a lower uh, social background. Compared to uh, Paris uh, students, we are more from uh, upper class background, but with lower test score. So it means that uh, some sort of a mechanism that if you want to balance the gap in terms of social background, we have to be a very good, excellent student to be admitted in the best, in the top elite higher education institution in Paris. So we see that when you look very carefully at what does it mean to be to come from that place compared to another place in terms of high school, middle school, it, you, you find a long-term effect in terms of uh, social uh, opportunity or school opportunities. And, and I, uh, again, I'm, I'm say, saying I'm controlling by social background, gender, and other characteristics. Look, so it, this kind of research shows that it's important to uh, be very to go deeper in interconnecting or interweaving all these characteristic uh, uh, studying inequalities and just and not just having uh, exactly the same discourse about yes 
inequalities are increasing a lot, etc., etc. So, uh, and, and the spatial dimension, territorial dimensions are playing a, a huge, uh, an important uh, role in uh, explaining uh, inequalities. Richard. There we are. Uh, well, it's very late, and I'm not. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. Um, you raised a question about how uh, young young people, and in particular young uh, architects, are recovering the sense of touch. That is a very concrete answer. In the 90s and the first, I would say, seven or eight years of the 2000s, uh, when we trained, as we did at Harvard, um, uh, students in urban design, we used uh, CAD which is a system of basically on-screen design, uh, computer-assisted design. And one of the effects of using CAD so dominantly was that people lost the sense of the materiality of the, of the designs that we're making. Uh, it's very hard to see the size of something when it's on a screen, what it feels like, its material qualities. So we are um, now using much more 3D printing, uh, which is still a very expensive technology, but produces an actual physical object for uh, young, uh, for anyone to, to do design on. And we're also, re uh, the re there's been a recovery of drawing with that thing called a pencil, you know, this is lead, thing inside wood. When you draw, you are thinking when you're physically moving the object. And it's um, the combination of using very high-tech ways of producing models through 3D printing and actually drawing is a way that this kind of sense of touch is being recovered in this generation of architects. You can see buildings that are 3D, uh, that are CAD designed. You can see them all over Milan. They have no texture. They have no qualities. They're an image because that's what the screen shows you. So this is a big change and I think a hopeful change. I, I want to say finally, although you raised such a huge question, I'm, I'm tempted to be here all night to discuss it. <laughs> I would say that the people that we are working with in the emerging cities are not flaneurs. The idea of the flaneur, this half-death that you talk about, of say someone like Baudelaire, was to, to suppress the self in order to take in, to drink in, to ingest um, passively uh, the life of someone else. And that was uh, the model also for Benjamin, who cites not only uh, Baudelaire, but um, the man of the crowd, you know, that uh, Poe, you know, this famous essay. I would say for the people that we're dealing with, it's not a question of suppressing, of having a half death, but of becoming more competent urbanites. That is to be able to manage a more complex reality then simply a single or dominant identity would allow them to manage. With, I, I didn't do this study, but one of my colleagues did a study of the pavement dwellers in Mumbai, not in uh, uh, Delhi, but it's a similar thing, and found that these were extremely skilled people, not only in knowing how to use the space, but how to deal with the police, um, how to appease the authorities, how to hide, how to steal. They were, ex they were people who had developed a kind of complex sense of self far beyond being victims, although they, they were that. And what I've taken from this personally, and maybe this is a good way to close my comments, is to say what we want to develop in modern urbanism is people who are more capable of dealing with complexity rather than urbanites who are only capable of dealing with what is familiar, 
what is like themselves or what is part of their own identity. Uh, that's certainly a challenge for urban design to provide the conditions in which people can learn to deal with things outside themselves. Uh, it's not, we can't completely solve that. But I think in general, if we, what we think of, when we think of a good city, is a city that people are empowered to deal with things that they don't know or that they discover or which are foreign or even hateful to them. And that's, to me, that's what a, a city should be about, to have that complexity and that capability. Thank you to Richard for the last uh, uh, discussion about urbanity. Uh, I think it's a good uh, point to, to end our uh, conference. Um, thank and you. Have to a the whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you to the speaker. Thank you to the discussant, and thank you to the organizer. And of course, thank you to Enzo and the audience who are part of our work today.